Hi, Russell. Greetings. Hi, how are you? Oh, fine. How's everything in Japan? Thank you very much for your uh, assistance. And okay, support. no problem. Uh, so everything a... is it in the morning? Is it Pardon? Sun, sun, or sunrise? Oh, no, that's just the background. It's actually 10 o'clock oh, okay. at night. So what time is it it's now? It's very dark here. That's why it's uh, artificial light. Okay, okay. So what that's time a, now? It's a sunset in Carmel, the background. But I'm not there now. Okay, thanks. How are you doing? Fine, fine, thanks. Everything fine. Organizing things as always. <laughs> doing a great job. Yeah, thanks so much. So today we have so many the uh, excellent Japanese neurosurgeon, the professor. So nice. you can uh, you can uh, uh, ex ex expect them. Yeah, I don't know if I'll be able to stay the whole time. I've got to get some sleep tonight. It's basically an all-night uh, webinar here in California, starting at 10 and I guess going to uh, almost till morning. Okay, well, of course, so time to time you, you can have some snap. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Endo sensei, thank you very much. Rosaki sensei, thank you very much. Hi, Raja. How are you? Hello, hello, ma'am. Hi, how are you? Good, good afternoon. I'm fine. Thank you. How are you? Hello, Professor yeah. Andrews. Welcome. Hi, you. Thank you very much for uh, organizing everything. Yeah. I really thank you very much, the, Dr. Liu, the, the very hard work, besides uh, Dr. Raja. Thanks so Dr. Liu is the cornerstone for our webinars. Yes, yes. <laughs> Liu, Hi, please. Ibrahim. How are you? Good morning. Hey, good morning, yeah, good morning. Professor Hi, Kato. How are you? Good morning, good everybody. Yes. Actually, good afternoon and good evening. Yes. Yes. Uh, the three o'clock in the afternoon in Japan. Yeah, here is seven a.m. in Sarajevo. Uh, uh, Early morning, Saturday. How are you doing, Professor Russell? How are you? Oh, good fine. With us. Well, uh, 10, 10 at night here, so I wish I were there. <laughs> 9, 9 p.m. So Thank you for waiting for us for this meeting. Well, I wish I were there in person. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, please introduce yourself, please. Yes. Uh, my name is Dr. Endo. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the invitation of this webinar. I really look forward to uh, participating in it. Thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, excellent. Thank you. Yes, we hear you. Endo sensei. Sensei means a doctor. So and Professor Endo is an excellent uh, uh, spinal neurosurgeon, especially I'm going to yeah discuss a little bit more about, about the spinal cord tumors today. If you, uh, I wish uh, you could have some uh, uh, you know input or questions throughout the webinars. And uh, yeah, it's a very good uh, opportunity for me to present uh, my talk uh, in you know in front of all of you, and I really look forward to it. Yes. Adi is here. Hello, Adi. Adi? Can you hear us, Adi? Adi must be asking in, in tubing now. He's here. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. So, Raja, just I want to ask uh, uh, you need some uh, COVID negative uh, proof. When uh, Dr. Sachin will go back tomorrow, so does he? Need yes, some... I think. Uh, yes. uh, I'm not sure about the current regulations, but I'll have to check. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, Ibrahim. Yeah. Oh, it, it's real. I'm problem. here. Yes. Three o'clock in the afternoon in Japan. So should we start? Of course, it's uh, a bit 
Or yes, we... we can start. It's 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 seven a.m. here, so it's it's right a real long time. Okay, so maybe the, you can have some uh, welcome speech. Yeah, dear, dear friends, dear colleagues, I'm happy to have you all here with us. It's uh, maybe a little bit, a little bit uh, uh, strange with the time, but we are trying to to uh, adopt the time of starting the webinar for uh, uh, you know acceptable for all of us, from the people from Asia, Asia, and especially Japan, also from Central European countries, Bosnia, Croatia, Slovenia, Germany, and around, and also from the people from our guests and colleagues and friends from United States. So uh, uh, it's uh, I'm really thankful for the effort, all of you, that you are doing to help us to support these webinars and to stay with us in this, uh, for some of you, not so uh, 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 well uh, chosen the, the time. However, we have the with us today very distinguished uh, uh, world uh, known neurosurgeons who will share their knowledge with us and we are happy that I hope even more the young colleagues will enjoy with us in this session today. That we have two sessions with the discussion after the each, and I hope we will learn each from others again and again. Today uh, we have uh, many distinguished guests with their lecture, especially from the microsurgery and uh, tumor surgery from Japan to Germany, from the United States to Croatia and Bosnia. So I hope that all the guests, but not only the guests and speakers, but also uh, we as the organizing committee will uh, enjoy. Uh, I would like to ask Professor Kato from uh, Japan to say a few words and to open this webinar today. Professor Kato, please. Thank you very much, Ibrahim. So the, it is our great pleasure to have a force ACNS and Bosnia as the governor webinar today. Uh, uh, many of the Japanese or some other countries guests, maybe they do not know the, what is happening in the, in the Balkan countries. So maybe uh, I think we can have some uh, exchange of knowledge. And please don't hesitate to ask uh, uh, experts so uh, all speakers as a worldwide expert, uh, I think uh, you will have a, a very nice lectures from all of them. Well, thank you very much. So we can start, I think. For sure. Thank you. So, Dr. Raja. Uh, maybe Dr. Adi. Maybe Adi is here. Yes, Adi is here. Adi. Adi. Do you have a program? Please unmute your mic, Adi. Uh, is it here? I can't uh, hear yeah, him. Adi is here, Adi? but his mic is uh, muted. Adi, please unmute your mic, please. Okay, then I, I will start. So please, you can accommodate. So the, the first speaker is uh, Toshiki Endo from uh, from Japan. Uh, now, the, currently, he is working at uh, Sendai Tohoku. Uh, the Sendai is one of the best uh, educational place in Japan. And Professor Endo is a specialist of the spinal, especially the tumor and the uh, vascular lesion. And uh, his father is also used to be the very famous uh, vascular neurosurgeon. So uh, we are very honored to have you. Uh, please start your lecture, please. Endo Sensei, dozo. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Kato, uh, and uh, thank you very much for to, to all uh, the, the invitation and opportunity for me uh, to, to present about uh, surgical, um, sorry. Um, can you see my slides okay? Not, Not yet. Not yet? Yes. Uh, so, I think I'm allowed uh, allowed to speak 20 minutes. Is that right? Yes, right. Um, no slides? Mm. Not yet. We can't see you. 
Please hold on a second. I think we get to hear what you're saying. I apologize that I have mixed the two slides in, uh, in my desktop. Uh, okay, let me see. How does it look like? Yes. Is okay. okay it's fine. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, this is uh, uh, my name is Toshi Kendo again uh, from Tokyo Medical and Pharmaceutical University, uh, Sendai Northern Part in Japan. Uh, this is actually the mountains, the uh, beautiful mountains in Japan. Um, I had uh, uh, just introducing myself a little bit in a, one slide. I had spent two years in Mayo Clinic Rochester with Professor P. Pras, which is actually uh, really surprised that it's already uh, 20 years uh, from that uh, time. And after that, uh, I have spent uh, two years uh, in uh, Karolinska Institute, Sweden, to do the uh, research fellowship about the spinal cord injury research uh, using the functional MRI uh, with Professor Lars Orson. And uh, I'm now in a member uh, of, uh, actually, this is me, a soccer team uh, of the Japanese uh, neurosurgical soccer team. Uh, you know, before the COVID-19, uh, in, in an annual meeting, we had a match, uh, you know, all the Japanese neurosurgeons who is a fan of the soccer uh, gathered in one place. And uh, we all enjoyed the World Cup, you know, the last uh, year, as you remember. Uh, in the meantime, after I come back to Japan, I had, uh, I would do, I, I do uh, lots of, uh, let's say, intracranial uh, vascular lesions and tumor lesions. And also I have more focus on the spinal cord lesions, especially spinal cord tumors, which I'm going to talk today, and also the spinal cord injury and the spinal cord vascular malformations. So today, uh, in 20 minutes, I would like to show uh, uh, these topics uh, Then I follow. Um, these, uh, I start from the multi center study of the 1,033 intermediate tumors in Japan. Um, this is actually the study that we did last year. Um, you know, Japanese Neurosurgical Spinal Society um, gathered, uh, collected the, the information, uh, retrospective, chart review, and we have actually collected the surgical uh, cases, 1,033 cases from the last uh, 12 years in 58 Japanese neurosurgical centers. <laughs> this is the uh, one slide showing that how much cases we experienced in Japan, meaning uh, one, 168 astrocytomas, and also the majority of the cases, as you uh, expect, uh, 361 cases of ependymoma, followed by hemangioblastoma and cavernoma, as you can see in the slides. So this is a lot of cases. Uh, we had a first time, had a chance to analyze these cases, then try to see how we do it in the treatment of the intramedullary tumors, which we publish in the details is in the paper, if you're interested in. So this is the 1,033 cases. Most of the cases has been done by the posterior approach. And the key thing is that, uh, you know, we are gathered uh, certified neurosurgeons from the Japanese board experienced surgeons. And uh, most of the surgeons has 10 years or more experience. And the degree of the tumor removals. Of course, we have to make sure that there's a lot of variety of tumors included in the study. However, the 67, uh, you know, more cases were to totally removed by the Japanese uh, neurosurgical, you know, skillful neurosurgeons. <laughs> so um, I would like to uh, go a little bit more detail on the case uh, descriptions of the representative cases, how we resect intramedullary tumors uh, from the spinal cord. Of course, as we know, there's a safe entry zone from the posterior, a dorsal root entry zone, and a posterior major lateral. Uh, Sarco entries on the rest of approach. One thing that I would like to show here is the 
uh, Epinimomo case. Uh, this is a 39 year old female uh, complaining of the neck pain, left arm and leg pain, and weakness. As you can see, heterogeneous uh, intramedial tumors located in the cervical spinal cord. And this is how we uh, go inside of the spinal cord. This is more likely to uh, find a, a posterior median sulcus where the vein emerges to the surface, which, uh, you know, you can see the posterior lateral sulcus. And this is a pinnimum case. We go from the midline, posterior medial sulcus, you can uh, see, uh, you know, by indicating by the arrows. So this is the surgery. Um, left side of the view here is the head side, and this is a quarter size. I try to dissect, uh, you know, sharply as much as we can using the needle and the other forceps and other materials. Of course, the, all the cases has been done uh, using the SSEP and MEP monitoring. And I also want to, you know, make uh, emphasize here that we use the uh, photodynamic diagnosis, uh, 5LA for the spinal cord tumors and also later on into signing green for the spinal cord tumors, uh, vascular lesions mostly. So, so this is a tricky point that we have to peel off the tumors from the surface of the spinal cord. The ventral tip here is a very uh, difficult part because the, the feeders comes from the uh, ventral spinal cord, which all, uh, as we know that the, it's connected to the anterospinal arteries. So we try to make sure the preserved anterospinal artery, but try to cut sharply by detecting uh, wherever the arteries enters the, the lesions. So by uh, continuing these uh, procedures, and we were uh, able to manage the cases uh, by the total resections. So this is the endocytic green. Uh, make sure that the vascular, you know, uh, circulation is preserved in the spinal cord and we finish the case. So this is actually a uh, little bit old paper which we published uh, 10 years ago, showing the margins between the tumors and the spinal cord is sometimes well uh, shown by the uh, five ALA as we experience all the intracranial uh, malignant tumors in Japan and all, all over the world. So this is actually, uh, you know, when we have a hard time finding the margins between the, uh, especially the edge of the tumors, which is uh, sometimes helpful. So I go on to the, another case, which is a spinal cord hemangioblastoma. And uh, this is a 20 year old female and the solacic lesion. And again, the left side of the image is the head and the right side of the coral. Um, you know, by doing the osteoplastic laminotomy, uh, we use the high speed drills, but we sometimes use this uh, um, ultrasonic uh, device, uh, which try to cut the uh, bone very sharply, but safely. And uh, we are not going to have, uh, you know, uh, much bone loss, which is very helpful to the patients. So by the bone work and open the dura, then we are going to see the tumors uh, at the back side of the uh, surface of the spinal cord, which is a uh, very uh, ugly looking uh, vascular tumors with the hemangioblastoma. And we cut, you know, we try to uh, find uh, feeders and try not to make mistakes during the surgery. Uh, Indocyanin green is again helpful here. And we try to secure the feeders and try to uh, see the drainers, uh, try to preserve the drainers as much as we can and try to see, uh, dissect between the lesion and the spinal cord sharply. Again, we do the MEP and SV monitoring of those cases, make sure that we have a safety margin and try to preserve the functional uh, of the patients. <laughs> So this is actually the surgical techniques uh, which can be applied to the intracranial lesion as well as the vascular lesions as uh, we experience in a daily practice. And again, try to make sure that we try to preserve the spinal cord parenchyma carefully, meticulous surgical dissections using the half-sharp scalpel here. 
and try to remove the old tumors out, digging out slowly by slowly. I just skip a little bit. Eventually I took it off and the uh, patient's symptoms uh, remarkably improved. Make sure the indocyanin in green again, there is no remnant. Make sure that the total re reduction of the tumors. So the final case is the anterior uh, case of the cavernous malformation of the uh, cervical spine. We rarely experience the ventral lesions. Uh, in fact, but sometimes we have to know how to deal with this uh, ventral case. So this is a C6, the cavernous malformations. The patient had a weakness on the right arm. Then the, I operated through the corpectomy of the C6. So again, this is a cranial side and quarter side. Oops, sorry. So after the uh, opening the corpectomy and open the dura, then the, we are going to able to see the ventral surface of the spinal cord. Actually, uh, this is a midline, the anterospinal artery and anterospinal vein. Uh, we have a radicular medullary artery here, which we preserve and try to cut a very sharp uh, linear uh, incisions on the ventral surface of the spinal cord. Again, making sure the MEP and SCP is preserved. I cut the vein to secure the margins of the lesions. So again, fine technique uh, to dissect and remove the tumors from the spinal cord. Uh, very, uh, actually the three millimeter uh, widest of the opening of the spinal cord, um, very minor, I mean, I would say small lesions, but very, uh, intensive uh, symptoms occurring by these small lesions. <laughs> so this is the bottom of the tumors. I was a lesion, cavernous malformation. <laughs> Make sure hemostasis and take it out. Actually the uh, ultrasonography uh, is very uh, useful to detect that such kind of small lesions. So we have closed the dura, make sure watertight and uh, fat graft to, uh, you know, prevent the CMS, uh, CSF leak and uh, anterior reconstructions. So the patient actually uh, got really better with the hand weakness, which uh, we uh, really enjoyed the outcomes with the patients. <laughs> So uh, going back to our study, this is uh, actually the whole series uh, of the 1,033 cases of the Japanese neurosurgical uh, surgical series of the intermediate tumors. The important message is, you know, we worried about, you know, we ha may harm the patients by the intermediate tumor surgeries. However, you know, before the operations, this is a McCormick grade. Uh, grade one and grade two is a normal or mild gate disturbance. So, uh, you know, less than 60% can walk independently. Then after the surgery, actually at discharge, 50% can walk independently, which means we may sometimes harm the patients. You know, the patient you know, may experience the neurological deficit after the intermediate tumor surgeries. But the strong message and uh, optimistic side is that we can, experience, we can expect that the patient get better, you know, six months time after the surgery, you know, less than, it's about 65% of the patients can walk independently and it's getting better and better. So 60 months, five years after the surgery, if they're alive, 71% of the patients can walk independently after the intermediate tumor surgeries. So even though we had a hard time after the surgery, you know, patient got worse after the surgery, you know, we can be uh, more, um, you know, supportive to the patients showing this data you know, you can expect a bit better neurosurgical, neurological recovery in the meantime. Uh, one last thing that I want to say is about the new treatment, uh, which I'm trying to establish in Japan. This is about the spinal cord glioblastoma. Um, we may experience the glioblastoma is a very bad prognosis. You mentioned, we mentioned five-year survival of ependymoma, for example, is a 96.5%, which is very good. 
So five years survival, 10 years survival. Grade four, glioblastoma, spinal cord, median survival is 11 months only. So we may lose the half of the patient in one year, which is a devastating. <laughs> so this is actually the new protocol that we are trying to establish in Japan by uh, organizing the clinical trials using the photodynamic therapy. And uh, this is actually uh, photodynamic therapy approved for already in Japan for the intracranial glioblastoma since 17, uh, sorry, since uh, 2013. So we have a photodynamic uh, therapy applied, you know, photosensitizer taken up in the tumor cells, you know, even in intracranial or interspinal and you know, intermedullary tumors take the photosensitizers. Then if you have a lasers, photochemical reactions occurs, then this would injure the tumors only. So selective apoptosis, necrosis can be expected in the tumor cells. So I'm now organizing the multi center clinical trials, which just started this year. Then I have uh, already uh, had, a, had a one patient last week treated with this uh, protocol. And we try to gather the patients uh, from all over the Japan. Uh, six centers is going to be uh, organized uh, throughout Hokkaido to Osaka. And we try to have a 20 patients treated with surgery, photodynamic therapy, and radiation and chemotherapy, trying to see if we can be do better with the overall survivals and one year over, over, over one year survival rates, progression free survivals, and so on. So we really looking forward to uh, do things uh, with the microsurgical surgical technique, which is very, very important. Also, the monitoring is important. And also, you know, even though with the special techniques, there is still uh, some patients who have a hard time and a bad prognosis. Then the, I'm now trying to secure, you know, those patients with the clinical trials of photodynamic therapy. This is my final slide. And thank you very much for your time. I reported it regarding current trends in the surgical management of the intermediate tumors in Japan by showing the recent uh, papers. And also, uh, I showed a multimodal surgical approach, especially using the uh, photodynamic diagnosis, uh, 5-ALA and uh, indocyanin green. Also trying to uh, utilize this photodynamic therapy for malignant astrocytoma, which is glioblastoma. We try to pursue maximum resections and functional preservations in all the neurosurgical tumors and the surgeries. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Professor Endo. It was excellent texture. So maybe I, I want to ask uh, the two uh, doctors to ask some uh, question to Professor Endo. The one is uh, Dr. Ibrahim, and the other one is uh, Dr. Albert, please. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Kato. Thank you, Dr. Endo. Great surgery, great, nice uh, technical. Uh, 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 also results. Uh, I would like to ask you one question concerning the the epidemomas grade two, for example, or also uh, grade one, for example, uh, mixopapillary ependidoma of the film terminale, which are which has, are usually grade one. Do you recommend after the radical surgery? Of course, we know that ependymomas are the surgical lesions. Uh, do you recommend the chemotherapy, especially for those uh, patients younger than 30 years, for example? Thank or you. Or you just uh, follow close follow of patients? Thank you very much for the great questions. Uh, of course, that uh, as we know that we have a separate uh, discussions between the regular uh, ependymoma and the mixed papillary ependymomas. I would say, uh, you know, mix of papillary epidermomas uh, uh, from the Japanese uh, neurosurgical standpoint, and we more likely to radiate uh, cases. You know, you, we worried about the disseminations for the mixed papillary epidermomas, which is a regular practice. And uh, grade two epidermomas, and uh, we try to first of all uh, take uh, remove the older tumors. 
However, if we were not able to do it, uh, my recommendation is uh, just to observe. If we have a grade three and uh, atypical uh, ependymomas, I would uh, prefer radiations. Actually, um, you know, I have uh, shown the paper analyzing 1,033 cases, but the, as I mentioned, there's 360 ependymoma cases operated in Japan. So we are now uh, going the separate analysis, a uh, follow-up analysis, uh, trying to answer your questions, you know, how we do it in ependymoma treatment. If you have a remnant, then if you have a recurrence, what will be the best treatment options? So please uh, wait a little bit more for the uh, further analysis, but thank you very much for the great questions. Okay, thank you. you, thank you very much. The, the situation is almost same here in Central Europe or European guidelines is say almost like that one, but we will, be, we will see with your phytotherapy also what will happen in the future. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks. Really looking forward. Oh. Professor yeah. Algels from Italy, please. Yes, thank you. Uh, well, first of all, uh, Professor Endo, congratulations, because I, I really appreciated how you match uh, great surgery with research, which I think uh, should be uh, in the modern uh, neurosurgery. Uh, my question is about uh, uh, hemangioblastomas, um, in, particularly, in particular for uh, uh, Fonipel endowed disease patients. Uh, uh, I am uh, uh, part of a national uh, multi-specialistic -special team dealing with this disease, and I see uh, many of these patients. And as you know, these patients uh, uh, can develop uh, uh, multiple hemangioblastomas, uh, uh, also in the spinal cord. And sometimes uh, they ask uh, for uh, advice about uh, uh, radio surgery for hemangioblastomas. Of course, if an hemangioblastoma is easy to take out, like in the dorsal part of the spinal cord, there is no doubt that uh, surgery is superior. But when a patient with this kind of history of multiple uh, uh, operations, uh, uh, for multiple uh, hemangioblastomas, asks uh, uh, an advice about, uh, for example, a ventral located hemangioblastoma in the spinal cord. Uh, I don't know, what, what's your advice? Do you advise radiosurgery or do you at least consider radiosurgery? What's uh, your experience about results of radiosurgery for these kind of tumors? I'm asking because I... I'm not so sure that radio surgery uh, can do actually something good for these tumors, but there are some patients uh, posing a, a problem about this. Okay, uh, thank you very much uh, for the great questions and the difficult questions actually. Then, the, well, from my experience and the hemangioblastoma somehow, I mostly see them on the backside, dorsal side of the spinal cord. So most of the cases I try to, you know, if this is a, if uh, it is a symptomatic case, then the, I wouldn't, uh, you know, if it is a phone keeper or Lindau disease, and if a tumor is, uh, is asymptomatic, I, first of all, I would like to observe. And uh, if it is a symptomatic, I try to remove it uh, as a first place. And uh, I personally haven't seen any ventral cases, actually. Th this might be, uh, you know, uh, new relations or how we, how we, you know, I'm not sure if it is uh, really the ventral lesion of the uh, hemangioblastomas. But if there is, you know, as I show the same technique, you know, ventral spinal cord for pectomy, if it is a thoracic spinal cord, you know, we can remove it. But I don't have any experience of the hemangioblastomas. Radio surgery, mm, I haven't, uh, you know, I have done uh, vascular lesions, intramedullary AVM. Then I have experience of the cyber knife radio surgery for those cases, which is safe and can be applied. But I wouldn't recommend uh, radio surgery for the hemangioblastoma because I'm worried about swelling of the spinal cord and I don't have any experience with the radio surgery. But maybe your folks have a, wide experience of the cervical, uh, sorry, the salivalar uh, hemangioblastomas, 
you know, you may have experience of the radio surgery for the cerebellum lesions, which I can refer, which I don't have any experience, but uh, I can refer to opinions from others about radio surgeries. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much. I agree with you uh, anyway. And uh, I ask this question because uh, it happened to me over the last 15 years to see a couple of uh, uh, ventrally located uh, spinal cord hemangioblastomas. And, you know, these patients uh, ask for advices uh, here and there. And there are some centers recommending uh, radio surgery for those lesions. I disagree with this uh, advice. So, I'm asking around uh, the opinions of experts about their experience. Of course, there are they are rare lesions, uh, the ventrally located ones. But I agree with you. Thank you very much. Yeah, again, I would like to uh, uh, focus more on the surgical treatment and removal of the lesions, even if it is, if it is a ventral lesions. Yeah, I agree with you. Thank you very much. So, Endo Sensei, so thank you very much for a great lecture. Just thank you. Uh, you, the, you uh, the no, head, no, no, not yet. One, one more question from me. So, yeah. the, in your lecture, that you mentioned about uh, you, sometimes you cannot clarify the, the border of the tumor and uh, the the normal tissues. So, what is the tip? So, how you can decide? And once uh, you uh, remain in some part of the tumor, so how would you like just for for some uh, other treatment, please? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, First of all, uh, if I'm not sure about the margins, you know, I'm not, uh, you know, I quit, uh, I try to stop removing the tumors rather than invading the normal spinal cord. Then the one hint is, uh, you know, I showed uh, one case with ependymomas, which is a photodynamic uh, diagnosis using a 5ALA. I have uh, uh, did a literature review. If it is a malignant astrocytomas, you know, they are more likely to take 5-ALA and have a red fluorescence, which can be helpful. So if I need to do the surgery for the five, uh, for the, especially um, astrocytoma, ependymoma, cavernoma, hemangiomasoma, which it's more likely to be relatively easy to see the, the margins between the spinal cord and the lesions. So if we need to go take astrocytomas, I would favor 5-ALA for the patients. Hopefully, this would uh, uh, show clear demarcations as we experience in brain surgery. Thank you very much, Professor Endo. So it's a time. So I wish you a very uh, successful the future career. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kato. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. So Dr. Adi, can you introduce uh, Dr. Russell, please? Yeah, good morning Russell, to everyone. For, wait for a long time. So it's 10 p.m. Please, yeah, good morning and good evening, which part of this world you are. I had some technical issues, but I'm finally here. So um, I will kindly ask for uh, all of the uh, lecturers to keep it their time of 20 minutes. We are already a little bit late. And um, I will introduce Professor uh, Russell Andrews from um, National Aeronautics and Space Administration, California, with the lecture Efficient Neurosurgery, Cutting Cuts and Cutting Time Without Cutting Corners. Please, Professor Russell, you can proceed with your lecture. Uh, we don't hear you, Professor Russell. You should just unmute yourself. Can you hear me now? Yes, we do hear you now very well. Yeah, Welcome. Sure. And can you see me okay? Okay. Yeah, we do. All right. Um, whoops. It's always a great pleasure to be able to return to uh, the Balkans. I uh, just wish it was in person. I am understood this was primarily for the uh, residents. So this will be a fairly basic talk, but I'll go very quickly and uh, just cut me off when it gets to be 20 minutes. So we're talking about a great need for neurosurgeons around the world. Uh, 23,000 additional neurosurgeons are needed in LMICs. But there was a study done years ago in the European Union 
And in one country, the average caseload per neurosurgeon was 56 cases a year. In another country, it was 300. So you can imagine if everybody was doing closer to 300 cases, we'd easily meet that need for additional neurosurgeons. It's probably easier to get people to be more efficient and uh, do more cases than it is to train a lot of new, new neurosurgeons. Uh, this is, again, very basic. Uh, I won't go through all this, but if for the residents, uh, you really need to uh, go through the operation, even if you're just the assistant, and anticipate the complications. Uh, you don't want to have people coming in and out uh, to increase the infection risk in the operating room. Um, you want a placement of the patient uh, with the pins for the, the Mayfield head holder. You want to make sure you don't go through a previous craniotomy or a shunt. Uh, very obvious things, but sometimes they are forgotten and can be a devastating outcome. And respect to your anesthesia colleagues who need to get after their equipment during the case. And I'll talk a bit about the surgical checklist. Uh, typical setup here, you can see they're using image guidance. When you bring your microscope in, you got to make sure all those things are going to work and you can actually do your case. Uh, again, various positions, and you want to avoid, as I said, um, previous craniotomies and not place uh, the pins in uh, where there's thick muscle, if at all possible. Why do we have checklists? Well, a B-17 in uh, World War II, the first B-17 actually crashed because the captain left the elevator lock on. Boeing company would have gone out of business, but they promised to make a checklist and not have something like that happen again. And we all know what happened when they let their guard down a bit and uh, their 737 MAX had a couple of accidents that uh, were devastating. Neurosurgery is like aviation. You only get one chance. You've got to do it right the first time. Uh, again, senior members here obviously know that, but uh, uh, something we always need to keep in mind. And uh, Shakespeare made that very clear. Uh, once you lose your reputation, what remains is bestial, and it's very hard to get a reputation back. So the, the surgical timeout, uh, again, you all know this, um, but it's worth reinforcing. One way of saving some time is, is a Foley catheter necessary for everybody under general anesthetic? If it's a case less than six hours, uh, most of the time not. You can in and out catheterize at the end of the case if necessary. Saves you the time putting in it at the beginning of the case. Uh, case. But more importantly, after the case, uh, the patient's much more likely to be out of bed and to have um, uh, more activity earlier on if they don't have a Foley that may stay in just because it's easier for the nurses to uh, leave it in than to worry about getting them out of bed for uh, urinating. Shaving, uh, please don't shave. I don't know why you see pictures these days of shaved heads for surgery, uh, except in trauma, uh, there's really no reason for that. And you can see here, this is a paper that's 25 years old, and infection rates were known even 50 years ago. That top uh, report there from 1971, the infection rate went from 5.6% down to 0.6% when uh, shaving was abandoned. The advantage of shaving or of not shaving are not only fewer infections, it saves you time. You don't have to shave at the beginning. You don't have to put a turban on at the end of the procedure. Um, you can put a little local dressing on, but you really don't need to. Um, but most importantly, the patients get out of bed faster. They don't seem to need as much pain medication. The nurses treat them like human beings rather than patients, and you get them out of the, out of the hospital facts, faster. Um, here's a U-shaped incision. Uh, you can part the hair. Um, we advocate now vertical incisions for most uh, elective cases. And that uh, is very simple. Just put in blue sutures and they're easy to find to take out. Scrubbing, prepping, draping. I'm only going to mention that chlorhexidine, there's evidence it's better than povidone iodine or uh, betadine. Uh, obviously, you have to avoid the mucosa or eyes and uh, uh, certainly wouldn't use it on transphenoidal, for example. Uh, planning your incision. Uh, obviously, you've got to be able to access it directly and not through uh, eloquent areas. But you also have to think about what's going to come later, radiation, uh, chemotherapy, uh, possible reoperations. Uh, you got to worry about wound healing. So therefore, uh, the vast majority of cases I've uh, done in the latter part of my career were vertical incisions as short as possible. And we'll go over the blood supply innervation very briefly. 
And you can see it here. If you have vertical incisions, you're much less likely to uh, run across uh, significant scalp bleeding. The innervation, the main uh, nerve to worry about is the frontalis branch of the uh, facial nerve, as we see here. You just stay very close to the uh, ear. Uh, don't go forward where you might catch that nerve and the patient will not be able to raise their eyebrow. Uh, and placing your incision, the smaller the better, and image guidance for those who have it can be very helpful. Not that it's necessary to get to the tumor, for example, but to make the incision as small as possible. It's a much shorter surgery, and it's a much quicker recovery for the patient. So it's usually worth the time if you have a good team to set that up uh, just because of the time it's saved both in the operating room and afterwards. Again, shaved uh, heads, which uh, really should be of historical interest. But the main point is uh, if you're doing a, an incision, you want to have uh, the base but wider than the uh, height of the flap. If more incisions, these really could be vertical incisions for the most part. And uh, again, base wider than uh, the height of the um, incision. A question mark, uh, trauma incision, that's probably the one time where shaving uh, is can be appropriate if there's scalp injury or uh, an open fracture, for example. Uh, this is one technique you can use, uh, multiple vertical incisions if necessary, and then that anterior posterior incision, make it as close to the midline as possible, again, to minimize bleed, uh, bleeding. Uh, another key to uh, saving a little bit of money, if not time, is using sutures to uh, replace the bone flap rather than uh, titanium plates. Uh, another benefit if you're doing uh, tumor surgery is there's no artifact on uh, follow-up CT or MRI. So uh, uh, this is just, again, reinforcing the point of not uh, shaving and using linear incisions. Um, another advantage is you don't need rainy clips. Again, it saves a few bucks and it saves a fair amount of time putting rainy clips on and taking them off. And just to find, finish this uh, linear incision, keel craniotomy, and respect the uh, branches of the facial nerve. I'm just going to make one comment here. Sometimes we have to think about maybe we can do an entirely different procedure uh, that's just as effective but much quicker. These are pediatric uh, epidural hematoma patients that this group in uh, Pakistan was treating with a burr hole rather than a formal craniotomy. You can do a burr hole in 10, 15, 20 minutes uh, rather than an hour or more for a craniotomy. So it's one way of saving time and doing just as good a job. I'm going to turn to a couple of disorders now um, that uh, I think are under, uh, maybe able to offer some clues on how to uh, do this a little more efficiently. Adult uh, hydrocephalus, uh, or what we'd call NPH, is very common, and we are really not treating many of these patients. You can see here that 1% to 2% of people over 65 uh, have the clinical findings and MRI findings of uh, NPH. And it's been shown to be cost-effective. It adds 2.2 life years and 1.7 quality of life years at low cost. Uh, lots of motivations for doing that. And just some data from the EU and the United States, if you look at the bottom, near the bottom there, 25,000 cases uh, in the U.S., 60,000 in the EU. Those are probably underestimates. And the cost that could be saved is uh, over a billion dollars in the U.S. and 1.7 billion euros in uh, Europe. NPH very quickly, wet, wobbly, wacky is the clinical appearance. Um, there's secondary NPH, uh, and that responds quite well to shunning as well, as you see in the bottom right. Differential diagnosis, uh, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. Parkinson's is quite simple, just do a Levodopa trial. Um, and Alzheimer's, there's a considerable overlap, pathologically speaking, and uh, you're not going to hurt a patient who has a, a, a Alzheimer's uh, by shunting them. It's uh, some evidence that that may be modestly beneficial. Salman Hakim is uh, really the uh, father of uh, NPH. And you can see here why the uh, pressure is not that elevated. You can have an elastic force increase, and then the pressure will reach a peak and then actually drop down as the volume gets bigger. In his uh, dissertation, it's interesting he put normal in parentheses. I think he knew the pressure is not really normal. It's just much lower than we expect in high-pressure hydrocephalus. Uh, some of you probably don't read The Economist, but uh, the glymphatic system is... Uh, at last being tapped with regard to Alzheimer's disease. And in a uh, US journal uh, a couple, a well, year and a half ago, 
Um, chronic sleeps is associated with uh, reduced lymphatic system function. And this has been attributed to uh, or contributing to the etiology of everything from Alzheimer's and Parkinson's to various neurosurgical, potentially neurosurgical disorders. You know, the glia plus lymph is a lymphatic system. You see this convection flow from artery to vein and that waste material being uh, extruded uh, through the lymphatic system uh, to some degree. There's MRI evidence that this uh, venous drainage times are uh, delayed in NPH patients, which uh, improves after a TAP test. Uh, another uh, report showing the same thing. And this is just, if you look at the, on the left, uh, on the left-hand side of the left four images, the two left ones show the vertex crowding and the dilated sylvian fissures in an NPH patient versus a control on the in C and D. Similarly, on the right side, you see the upward bowing and thinning of the corpus callosum versus uh, the right side as well. And this is what you can see after shunting. Um, that crowding is lessened and the vertex angle or closal angle was changed. You can actually quantify these changes in volume of uh, the vertex and the ventricles. If you look at the bottom uh, right there, uh, you can distinguish MPH from Alzheimer's and controls uh, Alzheimer's and NPH obviously have some overlap, so that's a very close difference. And it's important to shunt early, as you see in the bottom right there. If the symptoms are greater than four years, the recovery is uh, slower and not as complete, uh, gait being usually the first symptom to improve following shunting. Long-term follow-up, it really persists. These are elderly patients, so most of them uh, don't have more than 10 or 12 years to live, if that, since you're um, usually in your 70s or 80s when you're diagnosed. Uh, interesting, Tony Marmaru years ago uh, did a three-day lumbar drain trial for NPH, and he actually shunted 51 patients who failed that test, did not show improvement, and, and one-fifth of those showed clinical improvement following shunting. So we miss a few of the tests like that, but you really can't just go putting shunts in everybody you suspect uh, may have NPH. Um, treatment, it's a community hydrocephalus, so you can use a lumboperitoneal shunt, and I would argue that's a much more efficient way to do this. Uh, why? Uh, VP shunts have more perioperative and postoperative complications. They're more expensive. ETV hasn't been shown to be that effective in NPH. But most importantly, uh, many of the patients that I uh, have treated uh, wouldn't even think about a catheter in the brain for a non-emergent situation, but they will take a lumboperitoneal shunt. And... Uh, yeah, delayed intraventricular hemorrhages are rare, but they do occur. Uh, here's one example. And uh, this is a recent uh, review. And you can see they have several um, intracranial hemorrhages and uh, also a little box there, uh, distal catheter problems, the peritoneal catheter. That was the main source of problems in my series of lumboperitoneal shunts as well. <clears throat> so what we did is we took uh, the hospital um, physical therapy and neuropsychology group they do an hour's worth of testing when a patient comes in for outpatient evaluation. We do, a, or I do it personally, um, a lumbar puncture in the lateral position, get a good opening pressure and drain off 30 to 50 cc's. And then they go back and test them again later in the day. Uh, this patient was actually tested four times. They'll bring them back the next day if necessary. And I have them come back um, a week later when we have all the results and the patient's usually gone back to their uh, pre-CSF tap test uh, status because the pressure is built up again and we decide on surgery or not. A uh, series that I've worked on while I was in private practice and I could follow this closely, 67 patients, males a little uh, older than the females. And you can see there the post-operative events, uh, most frequent uh, were one revision of the peritoneal catheter and that was largely uh, reduced by putting a suture in the uh, anterectus sheath as well as the lumbar fascia. And that was uh, almost always due to either having a vomiting episode or a car accident, some trauma uh, that affected the abdomen. And uh, the other was lose, uh, removing the slit valve as a second procedure. If the opening pressure was greater than about 18 centimeters of water, I'd leave that sleep, slit valve on. Uh, if it was less, I would usually take it off at the time of initial surgery. Then they can come back later on and say, hey, I plateaued. Can you do anything for me? And we could go in. It's about a 20-minute procedure, open up the abdomen, take the slit valve off, close it up again, and they usually showed additional improvement. Um, 
the main point I want to make here is um, you can use a lumboperitoneal shunt with no valve, but if you expect the patient's headaches to go away uh, and go be able to go to the mall or go to a movie and sit up or stand up for six hours a day after surgery, it's not going to happen. If you take a week or two, however, um, and gradually get them up, they'll, the brain will adapt to that mild change in pressure that you've introduced by the shunt. What's important here is the so in my series, uh, about a six centimeter of water difference in the opening pressure between those who went on to be shunted, i.e. had NPH, and those that I was asked to test, even though I didn't think they had NPH, but we tested them and they didn't do better. They had a lower CSF pressure. And this is plotted out here. The light uh, blue is the ones who failed and the dark blue is the ones who opened as far as their op opening pressure. And here you see the one other study I've been able to find that also to, took good opening pressures. They actually had a better control group and these were volunteer elderly people who had no neurological problems. And again, you can see about a 13, uh, excuse me, about a six, um, uh, six centimeters of water difference in pressure they reported in kilopascals. So I had to convert that. Very similar findings to what we found. Um, so I think it's quite clear it's not normal pressure, it's mildly elevated pressure. Interestingly, in Japan, over the period from 2007 to 11, there was really a shift from VP to LP shunts, and I think that's increased even more since then. Um, and here in uh, the U.S., we're markedly under-treating this. There's probably, uh, twenty, as we saw before, 25, 26,000 patients, of which only about less than a quarter are treated each year. If every neurosurgeon in the U.S. was doing um, NPH treatments, there'd probably be six patients per each uh, neurosurgeon. This is what it looks like, the incision in the back with a dressing on and then the abdomen. Uh, there's the slit valve that's removed. And I have one patient we had to put in a lumbopleural shunt because of scarring in the abdomen. Uh, why are VP shunts done in the, certainly in the U.S.? Um, a lot of neurosurgeons are just not uh, familiar with lumboperitoneal shunts. Uh, they know of them, but they just don't feel comfortable with them. Um, in the U.S., they pay more for doing VP shunts. Uh, programmable valves are expensive, really not uh, an option in uh, developing countries. But in the U.S., you get paid every time you do programming. And so that's a little source of income as well. And um, here's an article. Uh, stating that, well, you may lose money in the United States by do a, putting in a shunt for NPH, but you'll get appreciation from the family. And then when somebody has a brain tumor or a stroke, they'll come to you because you've treated another relative of theirs. Um, not sure why they didn't mention LP or LP shunts or ETV. And in the U.S., you can uh, have a nice weekend, courtesy, of, in this case, of Codman, uh, and you'll feel some obligation to use a programmable valve after having them wine and dine you. So just to summarize, I won't read through this, but again, the, I think the most important point here is you don't need a valve. Uh, I had one patient out of 67 that had to have a valve put in for low pressure headaches, but you've got to wait uh, several weeks before you make that decision. And I think you'll find your virtually all your patients will get by with just an LP shunt. Uh, and again, I think we owe uh, Hakeem uh, a debt of gratitude for this. Another area, if I got a few minutes, I'll just go and cut me off when it's 20 minutes. Uh, cervical spine is an area I uh, had an interest in, and I think there are ways we can uh, make that more efficient as well. Uh, this data is um, my consecutive series, and I consider myself like Tetsuo Kano, a humble gentleman who I think is really did more than anybody else for uh, neurosurgical education, not just in Asia, probably throughout the world. He always called himself an average neurosurgeon. And I think in a field where everybody seems to be a prima donna, there's a few of us who recognize we're probably just average. Uh, these are my cases from uh, that period. Um, it was probably 100 and close to 150 at four level and probably 250 to 300, three level over my entire career. And during the period of those 600 anterior cases for degenerative spine, mostly a few trauma patients, only four patients were treated posteriorly. I think the disease is anterior and you do a more effective job that way. I won't go into the preoperative or diagnostic considerations, um, except to mention the value of EMG because I run across some people who don't believe in those. I think it's because they don't understand what those can, an EMG can tell you. And uh, sometimes that can be very helpful. Uh, incision, you want to go above 
the elmohyoid sternocleidomastoid junction. So the incision tends to be a little higher than some people would make, uh, just so you don't have to go through a muscle group. Uh, if you look at the upper right there, uh, would put out a quiz, what's wrong with that? Uh, I think the problem is that retraction is way more than you need. You just need to see the middle two to three centimeters of the spinal canal or, or uh, bone and then the spinal canal. Once you get to the back, you don't need a wide exposure. And uh, the other point I would like to make is I think uh, cutting burrs are not a safe instrument in anybody's hands uh, for spine work uh, where you're around the dura. Uh, I've been asked to adjudicate several uh, legal cases from very famous institutions um, that cut up nerve roots because they had a cutting burr and said, oh, we can control this. And turns out they can't always control it. Diamond burrs are very forgiving and they can cut through bone just about as quick as a cutting burr if you know what you're doing. Pre-op considerations, um, I won't go through all that, but you gotta make sure they're medically okay, make sure the carotids are okay, don't shave, and um, let the patient know what you're gonna do post-op. Uh, positioning, neutral position, you don't need traction or um, uh, extension. Put a tube in the esophagus uh, to give it some bulk so it doesn't slip under your attractor. Uh, uh, monitoring, most of the cases I were doing either myelopathic or radiculopathic, so we did monitoring pretty routinely. Um, and an LMA is an interesting option um, for healthy patients that uh, can save some time and save on dysphagia or problems uh, with voice postoperatively. Uh, I'll go over the equipment. It's pretty straightforward. And again, I can't stress too much that I think a diamond burr is markedly underrated as a safety issue. These are cervical curettes that are very helpful and the distractors that you're all familiar with. This is basically the instruments you need. And in the upper right there is a wire brush that scrub nurse can clean your diamond burr, have two burrs so you can swap them out and so it doesn't slow down your case. Um, other considerations won't get into plates, but uh, graft, um, I haven't put an auto graft in um, 20 years. Patients just don't want an incision. The allograft, the best uh, I found was patella. We had uh, the Red Cross funded some research we did on uh, optimal bone for that. Uh, artificial discs. I never was a believer in these. Um, and I think as we follow those for 10 years or more, we find that at least half of them are no longer fusing. I think it's because the body doesn't know there's an artificial disc in there when there's degeneration. There's a tendency to fuse. I've seen a number of patients in their 70s and 80s who said, oh, I went through 10 years of severe neck pain, but gee, it's not so bad now. And you get an x-ray and they've auto-fused. Adjacent segment disease, most of the studies I've seen, uh, they should have done one more level or two more levels, uh, but there was that belief that, oh, you only do two levels anteriorly, so the third level didn't get treated initially. Certainly, it's going to be a problem very shortly afterwards. Time, uh, okay. please. Are we out of time? Uh, it's already, we are past. Yeah, okay. Minutes, well, so. let's let's cut it there. I thought I'd just throw this out and see how long it goes. And if anybody's got any questions, uh, we'll probably need to go on to the next uh Next speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Russell. Uh, our, we can leave a questions for the discussion part, which is on the end of this uh, session. Uh, so uh, Ali, Ali? Uh, sorry, yes, because yes. it's very late in California. So maybe we can take one question from someone who wants to ask. No, one. let's. Sure, sure. Yeah. Anyone wants uh, to have Ibrahim? a question? Please. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you, Professor Russell. Very nice. Uh, tips and tricks from young neurosurgeons, but also for older, let me say. Uh, yes, uh, you, you mentioned Professor Sanders words, uh, average neurosurgeons, but we all know that you are great, both famous neurosurgeons, and we still can, and we like to learn from you. Uh, I would like to, uh, to ask you just uh, 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 one question. I saw on your slide that you mentioned that you had even five uh, level ACDF uh, and, and some almost 70 cases with the uh, ACDF four levels and so. Do you think it's still uh, approachable? Uh, uh, I, uh, we know that many, many neurosurgeons do not recommend the anterior approach for more than three levels. Actually, I do it four levels also sometimes, but uh, five levels never. So. So it's very interesting for, to hear from you how you find so large way and uh, have enough space to, to 
accommodate spine from the anterior for five levels, four levels, and so well, something think, about the section. Where is the trick? Well, if I just go back, the important thing in the spine, movement wise, is rotation, which is skull C1, C1, C2, the vast majority. People who have, I found, three and four level do lose a little bit of flexion extension, but that's not that clinically relevant. They're really, if their pain or their neurological deficits are improved, they're very happy with, a, you know, not being able to flex and extend quite as much as they might otherwise. I didn't get to the slide showing there's a report, so, you know, making two transverse incisions um, for, say, a three or four level uh, you don't need to do that. One incision, that skin is so mobile. I've never made more than one small transverse incision. You can slide the retractors, just loosen them. And so, you know, clamp them down, slide it up and down. And when you put in the plate, you don't need to see the whole plate. You can look at the top one. You're going to put in screws. You'll get an x-ray. You're going to look at the bottom ones, get an x-ray. You don't need to see the whole thing at once. You just need to know that the top and the bottom are in the right place and the rest are going to be in the right place. You put in the rest of your screws. It's, you know, we can make simple things difficult if we want to. But, uh, you know, and the disease is anterior the vast majority of the time. I mean, I didn't start this out with any bias towards the anterior. I just found it works better and um, patients are happier. Thank you. Thank you. I understand that that's good advice. You are all uh, or a honorary member of Southeast Europe. Neurosurgical Society, and I'm glad and I hope to see you again in the Balkan region. Thank you. Yeah, once I'd again. like to get to Bosnia and Herzegovina. Yeah, it's very soon. We will invite you. Thank Keep you. Me in mind. Yes. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Professor Andrews. We can uh, maybe if we don't have uh, other questions from audience, we should move uh, further. Uh, I would kindly ask Professor Otani. Uh, from the Depart um, department director and associate professor, Division of Neurological Surgery, Department of Nihon, University School of Medicine, Japan, with the occipital interhemispheric approach with gravity retraction for mid sagittal tumors. So okay. please, Professor Otani, we are welcoming yeah, thank you. you. Uh, thank you, Professor Adi. So uh, I will share the, my uh, slide. Just a moment, please. please. Can, can, can you see my slide? Yes, we, we can. Okay, thank you. Oh, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, we, we hear you. Just uh, take care about 20 minutes lecture, please. Okay. I will yeah. I will tell you on time. Thank you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, Professor uh, Yoko Kato, so, uh, for invitation to uh, this webinar, for giving my opportunity to present my work. So today I would like to talk about the occipital interhemisphere approach with gravity retraction for mid sagittal tumors, including uh, uh, especially the meningioma and, and the pineal tumors. So mainly focus on the uh, operative. Uh, yeah. So the, this approach, uh, you see the fa uh, firstly described at 1994, as shown in this slide, these figure were cited from the Japanese textbooks, the patient is positioned as lateral semi prone positioned with the side of pathology facing the floor. So the head should be rotated about 30 degrees. Uh, reversed U shaped skin incision was done. After that, parieto occipital craniotomy is done. So dual incision should be done like this to fully expose the straight sinus and transverse sinus. After retracting the occipital lobe, you can see the uh, straight sinus and the tentorial cutting should be one centimeter uh, behind and 15 degrees from the straight sinus. So this approach, uh, as I said, so can be useful for the mid sagittal regions, as you see the in this slide, including the pineal region, quadridimensional plate, splenial region, posterior thalamus, and the tentorial surface of the cerebellum. So I will show you a few cases. So this case was 42 years old female. She suffered a headache 
due to obstructive hydrocephalus. So endoscopic biopsy showed the pineal cytoma. As you can see, the tumor was located behind the splenium and tentorium. And then we planned the surgical strategies to cut the tentorium to get the wide surgical view. So we performed the direct uh, tumor removal uh, via the official interhemispheric approach with gravity ret retraction. The positioning is like this. So you see the, after the posterior craniotomy, you see, uh, so it's important to adequate open to get the wide view of the occipital image line. So you see the galenic system and you see the placental cerebral vein and tentorial cut. And uh, the, so you see the, uh, the tumor came into view. And the final, oh, so the, this, uh, the final view of the, after the tumor removal, so we, we can spare the vessel vein like this. So post-operative uh, MRI shows uh, uh, no remnant uh, so, and improves the obstructive hydrocephalus. So this case, next case is 40 uh, years old female uh, suffered this headache and visual disturbance due to intracranial hypertension caused by the uh, obstructive hydrocephalus. So this tumor was metastasis from the lung Calcinoma, and mainly located upper bamis, and then we plan the surgical strategy to cut the uh, spleniums. So right side lateral semiprone position and the occipital interhemispheric approach was started, uh, started, and the video started. So on this case, no co uh, to control intracranial hypertension, ventricular drainage, and open the foramen magna. And then you see the tentorial cutting was performed. Uh, so you, you, so this is, here is, uh, uh, you can see the stretch sinus and one centimeter behind the stretch sinus. And you see that we use uh, uh, so colorado needle monopolar uh, to cut the tentorium like this. So, so, so we uh, often the, uh, so encounter the venous uh, bleeding. So, uh, hemostasis, uh, we will need it. So you see the tumor uh, came into view here. So the edge of the tentorium is retracted and we can, uh, we can get the view, wide view of the uh, whole operative view. So, so, so here is a tumor like this. So um, the tumor was so soft and uh, easy, easy breathing, but uh, so, so no, no problem to control the breathing. So uh, use uh, Q-cell as the instrument uh, debarking and uh, finally we confirm the uh, remnant tumors. So post-operatively MRI shows uh, uh, uneventful hole and no visual field deficit uh, after the operation. So, uh, as I shown you, the, uh, the, this approach was so useful for pioneer and the upper Bamian regions. On this time, I will show you this approach can also be useful for mid Sagittarius Falx region uh, around here. So this case was previously experienced about uh, 15 years ago. It was a painful example, uh, so cases for mid Sagittarius deep Falx regions as shown in this slide. I decided that uh, it would be best way to reach the tumor from the nearest parietal interhemisphere approach using a uh, plumb position. However, it was so difficult to turn over the dura mater and to get the surgical field while preserving the, these placental central vein and then uh, it was not possible to remove it. In the, uh, at the end of the uh, operation, we have no choice but to, uh, to change the transcortical hyperlateral approach intraoperatively. Uh, therefore, on the next cases, uh, I try to remove it by using the official interhemispheric approach with the left side down with gravity retraction. Uh, so th there is uh, usually no breaching uh, vein uh, between the confluence and torrid veins. And occipital interhemisphere approach can be very suitable for these 
regions. So uh, like this, uh, post-MRI shows gross total limb and no complications. So on this time, uh, this case, 76 years, uh, incidentally found its tumors. So on this case, the same way, gross total removal and the post-operative uh, cause was uneventful. So next case was also removed by the same approach, and but the cause was very good, no problem. So uh, uh, the advantage of this approach is that it is less likely to damage the central vein and trara vein. The bridging vein was uh, that flow into the uh, superstructure sinus is not located uh, about uh, five centimeters centrally from the confluence of the sinus. So, and the lateral semiprom position, the occipital lobe can drop uh, due to the own weight. So we can get the wide uh, working space and the less brain retraction and the less load of cardiopulmonary damage. So. As for uh, pitfall of uh, related to this uh, op operative operation, so there's a concern that it may cause hemianopia due to occipital lobe retraction. It is likely to improve the uh, a few months after surgery. It's usually uh, so improve. So intraoperatively, the uh, superstructure sinus transverse sinus junction should be fully exposed by uh, paying attention to the retraction of the official law. So, and wide and full opening craniotomy of the conference should be needed. Sufficient brain retraction is required for the uh, cerebral spi spinal fluid uh, drainage through the spinal drainage, uh, dorsal horn puncture, and the quadrilateral system openings. Next, so for these uh, falcotentorial meningioma, uh, as you know, that these tumors are relatively rare, tend to be larger at the time of founded. So deep seated and surrounded by uh, vital uh, neurovascular structures. So uh, remains a surgical challenge for uh, removal of these tumors. This case was 47 years old female, asymptomatic, but uh, 10 years follow up MRI shows the tumor enlarged uh, four or four centimeter in size. The bilateral internal uh, cerebral vein and the vein of Gallen was displaced downward like this. So, uh, so the first operation was conducted the right occipital by transtentorial function approach on the uh, lateral semiprom position with gravity retraction. So the tumor was attached uh, to the severely falcotentory junction. So it was very extremely hard and so easy bread. So we can uh, get the, uh, so running, running the stretch sinus here. So we cut the falchion. So we have to, we have to uh, conduct it to uh, remove the contralateral side, but uh, you see that we can uh, get, we can cut the uh, falchion uh, fully. So uh, we we have just uh, the stopped uh, the operation on the uh, or just only the uh, half of the right side. So you see the post operative MRI shows that uh, the right side of the tumor has been uh, removed. So she showed the transient. Uh, left, left uh, lower homonymous quadri uh, uh, hemianopias. So after disappears the visual feed deficit, about four or months uh, after the oper first operation, the second operation was performed uh, four months later the, via the uh, left, uh, left side uh, of the interhemisphere approach uh, in the lateral semiprone position. So, I will show you the second operation, the video animation. So the tumor appears uh, whitish and uh, less bread uh, than the, uh, during the, the first operation uh, because the tumor had been well uh, detached, detached from the falcus and the tentorium during the first operation. So tumor bleeding was not so severe at the second operation compared to the first operation. 
due to the uh, previous complete uh, devascularization. So you see the easier dissection of the remnant tumor from the surrounding vital structures without causing deep vein injury, in particular to the galenic venous complex. So uh, finally, uh, you see the uh, gross total removal was accomplished and transient light visual hernia anopsia. However, two months after the second operation, uh, the visual field deficit was completely improved. So in general, falco meningioma is a high risk mortality rate uh, you see in this slide. So in particular, uh, vessel vein injury is a serious complication and the visual field deficit uh, can be occurred at a very high, high rate. So several papers have been reported over one stage removal using these approaches uh, of by transtentorial trans uh, approach. Uh, but uh, as, it, as I said, uh, uh, noted in this, uh, in my presentation, so, uh, but it may be worth considering uh, two stage approaches without overdoing it. So I st uh, still the, con uh, the con context of this presentation is shown in this paper in details, uh, uh, neurosurgical focus uh, 2018. So I appreciate uh, we ha you have uh, any interest in on these temas. So, uh, now we are coming to the end of presentation. I hope you have gained the knowledge about these topics through my presentation. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Professor, for your uh, great uh, lecture. With this uh, approach, you showed us actually how it's feasible to take, very, uh, take care about very hard and tough tumors. So uh, do we have a question from the audience? Yes, Professor Russell, please. Uh, just please unmute. Yeah, yeah. Uh, great talk. I think it's always good to have gravity as your friend. A um, Couple of questions, these large meningiomas, would you consider um, embolizing ahead of time? I found that these large vascular meningiomas that can make your surgery much quicker if uh, there are uh, feeders that can be embolized. And secondly, uh, why not, or as an option, uh, not go for 100% cure, but just follow up with radio surgery to the bed if you're able, if you have to leave a little bit uh, rather than risk, yeah. uh, say, venous damage. Yeah. Any your Thank thoughts you on those? Your, your question there. So, one question is uh, so, of course, uh, we have uh, external from the external external or feeding arteries, so mainly, so we usually uh, embolize the preoperatively. But okay. uh, as I mentioned, uh, shown the, in two cases, uh, two, so second cases, it's a pyre, pyre or feeder is mainly. So we do not uh, embolize uh, uh, tumors uh, for the pyre, pyre upright. So, and, uh, uh, so the second question is radiosurgical, radiosurgery. Of course, uh, we use uh, uh, less than two centimeters uh, uh, meningiomas. We uh, usually use uh, gamma knife therapy or the, uh, so cyber knife therapies, but uh, more than two, two, three, three centimeters, three centimeters, more than three centimeters uh, tumors, we usually, uh, so, uh, Priorities are dem after, uh, remove, remove the tumors. And uh, uh, if we get the remnant tumors uh, be because uh, the adhesion with the uh, uh, vein or the arterial vascular structures, so we uh, intensively uh, re so de leave the remnant tumors. So after that, uh, so uh, I know for, after that, follow, uh, during the following the uh, outpatient, so uh, if the tumor is grow, uh, so grow slowly grow, growing, so we, we decided to uh, decided to use the gamma knife therapy. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. 
Okay, uh, thank you for the question and the answer. There is a Dr. Mama Daliev also with a question. So please, thank Dr. Mama Daliev. Thank you so much, uh, Otani Sensei, for great presentation. Uh, I have a question about pineal region tumors. Uh, do you use uh, endoscopic ventricular cisternostomy as a uh, alleviating options for obstructive hydrocephalus in case of uh, pineal region tumors at the first step, or you just go directly to the tumor and relieving the obstruction. You, this is your strategy. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you for your good question. Well, I, I also use uh, uh, endoscopic surgery. Uh, so at first we decide uh, uh, so uh, pathologic, uh, so Mm. It is, uh, the type of the tumors. So we, we usually use uh, endoscopic uh, so, uh, biopsy. So in, in the, this case, is a pin, uh, pineal region is a pineal cytoma. So it's a very benign tumors. And the size is uh, three, uh, more, more than uh, three centimeters and uh, causes uh, obstructive hydrocephalus. So we decided to the, uh, so remove, remove the tumor firstly, we decided. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, any other questions, please? Uh, I have also one, uh, uh, actually two questions related to if you have a severe edema, uh, what would be your strategy also if, uh, if there is edema, does it influence your approach? And you mentioned also hemianopia as a, one consequence of this surgery. Do, is there any specific therapy for that or it regresses spontaneously usually uh, during the time? Thank you. Okay. Prof Professor Atani, are you with us okay. here? Yeah, they, uh, okay. So if the so if there is a so severe edema, uh, so it's a pyal dissection is uh, so so uh, risk risky. So uh, we so of course of course uh, you of course you said that, uh, around the uh, so edema area. We we intensively uh, rem remain the uh, so uh, so we try to uh, intra intra uh, capsular uh, surgical uh, strategies we usually use. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, if there are no any questions, we should proceed. Uh, the next next speaker is Dr. Dragan Jankovic, uh, who is a final year neurosurgical resident in uh, University Medical Center of Mainz, Germany. Now he is the, doing the cerebrovascular fellowship under the mentorship of Professor Yoko Kato in uh, Nagoya, Japan. So Dr. Jankovic, please uh, proceed with your lecture. Uh, good afternoon to all. Uh, I hope that you heard me. Yeah, we and, do. And it's great to see you all. And I try to make my presentation. Did you see that all? Oh, I have one question. Uh, I, I think that um, I have a, some problem with connection and that um, can you please uh, next speaker ask because I have to I have to move uh, out of the webinar and then one more connection. Uh, we, we will wait for you. Uh, we will see is there a next speaker while you are reconnecting. Yes. Okay, um, I will ask kindly Professor Yamamoto uh, if you are with here, here with us to uh, start your lecture if you are ready. Okay.
All right. Uh, can you see this uh, slides and my my voice? Uh, everything is fine. We see the slide. Audio is fine. You can proceed. Okay. Uh, so my uh, specialty is uh, epilepsy surgery, and then uh, I'm uh, selected uh, VNS at this time as as one of the epilepsy surgery. And the title is complication avoidance in a VNS implantation for uh, medical refractory epilepsy. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, my talk will include uh, preparation for surgery and a surgical technique and a VNS implantation, and uh, finally uh, surgical surgical complications. So preparation. Uh, positioning is uh, very important in neurosurgery. Uh, it is the same as in this procedure. Uh, extension of the neck is essential uh, to find the vagus nerve easily. Uh, then uh, we place a roll of a large uh, bath 12 uh, along the backbone. Uh, the patient head is, uh, will, uh, will tilt downward and the neck will be extended. So the yellow uh, arrows uh, indicates indicated uh, skin incision. Uh, as you, as you can understand, uh, an obese patient with a short neck uh, is the most difficult case in in uh, in exposing the vagus nerve. This is uh, the layout and the positions in the OR. Uh, the primary surgeon, uh, I normally stand on the left side of the patient uh, to obtain an easy access to the left vagus nerve. One or two uh, assistants, uh, the scrub nurse and the running nurse and the anesthesiologist. The surgical, surgical technique. Uh, this slide shows uh, anatomy of the vagus nerve. Uh, the vagus nerve is this stated deep in the neck, as we see uh, here. This is this is a, a main trunk of the vagus nerve, and uh, therefore it is difficult to find the vagus nerve, particularly uh, for uh, beginners in in uh, of this procedure and uh, also uh, young uh, young trainees trainees. The critical thyroid ligament uh, is the good uh, indicator for the level of uh, the VNS leader uh, placement here. In C4, C5, uh, C5, C, C6 uh, is the best level of, uh, for placement of uh, the uh, leader and the cervix. This figure shows uh, uh, the left left side uh, left side of the uh, neck uh, viewed from below, and uh, I normally uh, pull the uh, sternocleidal mass of the muscle uh, laterally, and I pull the uh, inner inner muscles uh, such as the uh, uh, sternohyoid uh, muscle, sternothyroid muscle uh, mediary. Uh, the, then uh, we can find uh, 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 we can go through this way and uh, we can find a uh, carotid sheath. Uh, but a more exposure is necessary to find the uh, vagus nerve because the vagus nerve is seated to deep uh, between the common carotid artery and the internal jugular vein. So this, we, uh, we sometimes see this uh, uh, superficial uh, nerves before uh, uh, we go deep in the neck. Uh, these nerves may be uh, answer, maybe the answer of the calyx or other branches, and then uh, just uh, preserve and keep dissection. So I will show you my uh, surgical video of my of, uh, venous implantation. Uh, skin incision with the two or three finger finger breadth 
uh, is made along the skin wrinkle uh, at the level of the critical side of the ligament. Uh, Volant dissection is uh, necessary uh, to prevent uh, uh, unnecessary bleeding. So this is a fatty patients. In, in some in some fatty fatty patients, it could be very difficult to dissection, uh, to dissect uh, because uh, lots of fatty fatty tissue. And then we uh, we can find the carotid sheets, and uh, we can see the position of a carotid artery. Then uh, we can find the vagus between the carotid artery and the internal jugular vein. So we, this is this is the uh, the vagus nerve, and uh, uh, we are going to uh, put the vascular vascular tip to uh, pull up the pull up the vagus nerve. Then we place uh, the chloride, uh, chloride, the cervical uh, refractor to uh, make a good exposure. Uh, this is uh, uh, also used for uh, cervical, cervical spine surgery. And then more uh, dissection. Uh, 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 cutting cutting the uh, membrane along the uh, the vagus nerve uh, to place the lead lead electrode. So when we uh, place the, uh, the electrode, it could be easier if we put the electrode under the vagus nerve. Uh, then uh, we place uh, the anchor, anchor. This is anchor, anchor tether. This is not an electrode. Uh, just for uh, tethering uh, of the of the electrode. And uh, and then move up to uh, uh, positive uh, electrode. <clears throat> see this. See, see uh, this. This white white electrode is a uh, positive electrode. And then the last one is uh, uh, negative beta group. And then, uh, so the electrodes and the anchor tether uh, are placed. Then uh, we can cut to the tape, uh, vascular tape. And also, we place the uh, uh, 
a tie down. This this white one, this white one is tie down uh, for anchoring the lead. Then uh, finally, uh, closing the uh, platysma of the of the uh, uh, cervix. Then uh, we move to pectoral region. So this is the closing uh, of the neck. So this is this is the whole system, uh, and then uh, after this uh, cervical region, then we move to the pectoral region, and then connect to this system. The complications uh, we had uh, seven uh, cases uh, with the complications in the first the consecutive 130 patients. Uh, two, uh, four, uh, one, two, three, four, four vocal cord paralysis. These are the primary primary cases, and then uh, probably due to uh, much retraction of the cervical uh, cervical tissue. But uh, these pa uh, these patients uh, resolved spontaneously uh, without any uh, particular uh, uh, treatment. And then there's the uh, three uh, surgical site infection. Unfortunately, we uh, remove these uh, whole whole systems. This is uh, this is surgical site infection. Uh, if infection happens, uh, antibiotic antibiotic same uh, uh, invalid in my in my in my practice. The same thing. This is uh, also uh, surgical site infection. And then when we open the wound, uh, we can see fluid in the pocket uh, of, of the generator. See this, this is, uh, uh, it is harder to see, but the, the, there's a fluid in, in, in the pocket. So uh, uh, normally uh, we do not, uh, uh, remove the cervical uh, cervical electrodes because uh, there's a risk of injury to the vagus nerve and uh, large uh, large incision and exposure like this are necessary uh, in most of the cases uh, just to pull the lead a bit and cut it and the leave in the in the uh, oh so, sorry leave the tips of the electrode in the neck. So this is very difficult to uh, to expose this uh, uh, vagus nerve uh, because it, there's a much uh, adhesion around the vagus nerve. So we wait uh, wait for uh, at least the six months to uh, six months for re, re implantation of the system. Uh, when we do do that, uh, we place the electrode a bit higher, just to one spine. This is before uh, SSI and after SSI, just the one uh, level of the spine, and, and we can we can find a very clean uh, vagus the vagus around here. So another uh, complication. So when the, your programmer tells you the high impedance and the low output, this is uh, one of the emergency of a venous uh, venous treatment. And uh, this is a post-operative chest X-ray after one uh, first implant in the preoperative X-ray before revision. Is uh, there's a lead here, right? But uh, uh, this time, this is a, this is the lead. So we expose, uh, we uh, open the wound, <clears throat> say fracture of the lead. Uh, this is probably uh, the the generator, the the generator turn turned round and around in the pocket, and that uh, that made it pull the lead much, and then the lead was broken. <clears throat> Okay, uh, take home. Uh, positioning is very important. Extension of the neck uh, gives you easy access to the vagus nerve. Uh, microscopy is useful to keep the surgical field bloodless and see small vessels around the vagus nerve. Post-operative complications were found in seven out of 130 consecutive patients for 5.4%. And SSI is the most serious and it gives patients and surgeons a hard time. Thank you very much for your attention.
Thank you, Professor, for a nice lecture. Um, do we have any questions and uh, comments? Yes, Professor Andrews, please. Well, I want to congratulate uh, Professor Yamamoto on a very nice discussion of, uh, I think, an underrated topic. The VNS can be very helpful for intractable epilepsy. Um, just for the residents, uh, if in your training program, if you're doing carotid endarterectomies, that's a great way to get familiar with that anatomy. Um, I did many when I was a resident long before the VNS came around. And so getting the vagus nerve out was really no problem. But as Professor Yamamoto said, uh, if you're not familiar with it, uh, it's a new experience. So uh, if you can do it, some carotid endarterectomies, that's a nice way to learn the anatomy. Yeah, yeah, I think so. But, uh, you know, uh, many cases of a carotid stenosis, uh, we go into uh, carotid uh, yeah. stent. <laughs> and then there's less and less a chance for young neurosurgeons to, uh, you know, uh, uh, pra practice and hand practicing. Yeah. Uh, but but you, you are right. Okay. Um... We have a question from audience uh, from Oraz Rahim. Uh, Professor, how about pediatric patients? That's just a question like, maybe is it the same strategy or? Oh, oh asking me, pa pediatric patients? Yes, yes, how it's, is it, I, it's yeah, just yeah, yeah. mentioned like that. Yeah, so I, I don't have much time to present uh, pediatric cases, but uh, we do. Uh, normally, uh, uh, less than uh, 10 years old uh, patients. Uh, and it, 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 it is the same as in, in the adult. And the uh, uh, smallest the patient was uh, uh, just one year old. Mm -hmm. Okay, there is a Professor Feletti. Yes, thank you, Professor Yamamoto, for the nice presentation. Um, I have a question about uh, the cases when you have to remove uh, the implant. As you said, it is clearly uh, dangerous to remove the mm -hmm. electrode from uh, the vagus nerve. So mm -hmm. in, in the cases you had to remove, uh, if I got it straight, you just cut the, the lead and left the electrode on the vagus yeah. nerve, right? Yeah. So when you have to re-implant the patient uh, and you choose a different level, is there any risk of, uh, I know, in interference uh, between the new lead, the new electrode, and uh, the old one? Yeah, uh, good question. Uh, so if if we uh, leave the previous previous electrodes uh, a lower lower uh, part of this uh, vagus nerve, and then we uh, move to the upper part of the vagus nerve, then we can find a very clear uh, field of a vagus nerve, and then we can let us see uh, the previous deed. So there's no problem. You can see uh, good surgery, whether the uh, upper side of the uh, vagus nerve. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, again, Professor Andrews, please. Just a quick uh, comment, and maybe Dr. Yamamoto can uh, elaborate. Uh, pediatric cases, I've only had a couple, but um, I think the literature supports they can have some very dramatic benefits from BNS. Uh, what's your experience? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, for, for pediatric patients, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, not, not, all, not always, but... Uh, uh, some patients uh, get, got a, a very good response to vagus nerve stimulation. And then uh, some uh, patients with a Lennox, Lennox gusto, severe, severe epilepsy, uh, about her became uh, seizure free. Yeah, great. Uh, thank you. I had also a question, but it's the same like Professor Sfeletti. So you have already answered. Um, we should proceed uh, since we changed the schedule. Uh, now it's uh, Dr. Jankovic, following by Dr. Kondo. So please, Dr. Jankovic, first. Do you see my um, presentation? Uh, we do. We do. We hear you well. You can proceed. Okay, very good. So thank you much for uh, for the Adi for your introduction. 
Um, I am from uh, Germany and actually uh, already in Japan from the because of um, fellowship in the department from uh, of Professor Kato. Today my topic is about um, glioblastoma, uh, glial tumor and frailty. Um, I'm on, on introduction. So demographic changes with increased life um, expectancy lead to rapidly um, growing geriatric population and as high-grade gli uh, gliomas are the most commonly central CNS malignancy and are mostly diagnosed at the age of 64 years. The incidence increased with growing expectancy. At the same time, um, the treatment of glioblastoma in elderly patient uh, patient with 70 plus is particularly challenged due to uh, general condition comorbidity. In the view of um, poor um, of, of the pure neurological status and continued need to uh, continue uh, medical um, attention in GBM patients, uh, post-charge care forms are important component in the management of this disease. Um, here we can see um, one table from the Professor Stoop publication for 2005 um, the most treatment decisions are by, uh, based on chronic, uh, chronic um, age, Karnowski performance, and uh, neurological status. The landmark study from Professor um, uh, Stoop and the colleagues showed a benefit of radiotherapy uh, plus uh, temozolomid followed by adjuvant therapy with temozolomid to treat glioblastoma. But uh, only patients younger than 70 years were included in uh, this trial. The addition information from the, from the next seventy years, there is a less effective uh, effect of temozolomid. Older patients are often um, treated less uh, aggressively due to um, a lack of physical resilience uh, in response to to the post-operative uh, complication and treatment of morbidity and the influence of the extent of resection uh, on overall survival is still a matter of debate. Uh, we have a, a few trials. Uh, the first is uh, E uh, or TC trial uh, at 26062, uh, and they show that the patient uh, with the tumor resection had significantly a longer um, survival uh, than those with the biopsy only. Uh, modified treatment regimes have been proposed to minimize treatment associated uh, toxicity. And uh, there are a few, a few recommendations in the, in the literature about short course radiotherapy with uh, 34 grays for two weeks proved to be effective standards, a standard radiotherapy, a standard is about, uh, is uh, 60 grade for six weeks in the patients um, older than uh, 70 years. And also uh, temozolomid alone um, might be um, more efficient than um, radiotherapy in patient meet MGMT uh, promoter, but just, I said just in um, early patients, uh, 65 plus. And then we talk about frailty. Uh, frailty has emerged as tool um, to estimate uh, overall health status and risk uh, adverse events, particularly in uh, geriatric patients. And the uh, uh, patient's frailty and comorbidity um, burden um, have recently emerged as predictors of morbidity and uh, mortality in various types of cancers in older patients and also in glioblastoma. And here is very important something, and that is frailty in sarcopenia phenotype. Uh, like other um, functional status, frailty is also the consequence at the end uh, of the interaction between uh, two aging process and some chronic diseases and conditions. And here on the picture, we can see this um, from the paper from Angulo and colleagues from 2016, uh, the cycles on um, inactivity and uh, frailty covering to sarcopenia are the basis for the uh, phenotypic manifestations. Um, here we see that high vulnerability due to change in several uh, physiological systems 
mainly inflammation, endothelial and, and vascular dysfunction. And these chains lead to the so-called cycle of reality, um, which finally produced sarcopenia, that is the target organ uh, explaining many of clinical uh, manifestations in this phenotype. And at the end, lead to high uh, mor uh, mortality, morbidity, and complications. Here we can see influence of the chronic uh, disease on aging, a related loss of uh, functional reserves. And as we can see that the functional reserves declines um, with the aging. The, uh, the decline, uh, this decline may, may be slow, corresponding to successful aging free of frailty and um, disability, that is solid line, or more pronounced corresponding to the unsuccessful aging manifest, uh, manifesting uh, frailty and disability in the uh, elderly patient, dash line. Uh, skeletal muscle in, is crucial for um, function, mobility, energy, uh, energetics and its body on the molecular levels primary reservoir from amino acid and um, sarcopenia phenotype uh, should be the central focus of the frailty assessments and um, intervention. Sarcopenia has important clinical implications from the surgical oncology standpoints uh, and uh, its present indicates that patients have limited reserves to handle and uh, the surgical stress response uh, and prolongated uh, hospital length of stay mortality. Medically, also sarcopenia may produce tolerance to the life um, extending uh, chemotherapy. And what about sarcopenia and what we use for, for measurement. So here is two paper, one is from Kate and the second is from Hag and colleagues. And um, we published also from Minds uh, in the last year and in this year, we, uh, we, uh, we will be to, uh, we will pub publish paper about temporal muscle thickness in, the, in the another uh, um, disease. Traditional methods of measuring sarcopenia includes uh, assessment of skeletal muscle, for example, PSOAS, uh, and in the last three years in the in the in the science society, we use temporalist uh, muscle or um, mas uh, masseter muscle. Um, we use also anthropometry. We use uh, dual energy X-ray um, um, exams, CT, and also physical uh, physical performance uh, testing. Um, and a commonly described radi radiographic methods involves measurement of the psoas of the CT scan. Uh, Kato and the colleagues confirmed that um, use of temporal muscle thickness as a surrogate marker of total body muscle uh, in gerblastoma and TMT can be also used to identify the patient with the mask loss early in the disease process, which enables the implementation and of um, adequate uh, intervention strategies. Uh, also, the uh, Hook and, and the colleagues uh, confirmed that um, TMT correlates uh, with important prognostic um, factors in um, glioblastoma and predict overall survival in the patient with progressive disease. That means that uh, TMT, temporal muscle thickness, may present a pragmatic neurosurgical marker in glioblastoma uh, surgery. And here is our uh, publication from the 2021, uh, where we found uh, that um, the patient uh, where, uh, uh, was identified as frail using a geriatric aid questionnaire. Um, the Groningen um, frailty questionnaire have a significant reduced overall survival. As patients over 70 years of age are underrepresented in clinical trials, uh, trials there is even less data uh, on, the, on the impact on chronic age uh, in patients uh, with different glioblastoma. And here is the also results from our last study that the um, Overall survival uh, improved in the patient receiving tumor resection compared to the biopsy, taking independent uh, from pre-existing frailty. As expected, 
uh, patient undergoing uh, resection had a um, um, higher um, likelihood of um, improved uh, neurological outcome, while those receiving biopsy also remain unchanged on or, or deteriorate. Also, um, geriatric patient had a higher uh, developing of uh, post-surgical complication if they uh, are uh, identified as uh, frail. Um, what about um, cost and um, hospital stay? Um, the median length um, of stay was in the um, patient that there was frail. Uh, two to six days longer compared to the patient which uh, was in non fray group. So longer length of stay correlates with frailty. Um, we perform also multivariate logistic reg uh, regression um, to identify independent predictors of overall survival in geriatric patients uh, with glioblastoma. And we found that um, ECOG-3 um, and also radiotherapy and frailty detected with groaning and frailty index were significant and independent predictors of um, oral survival. Um, and what is our future directions? Um, use of artificial intelligence to automate um, TMT because actually, uh, and already we make that manual with softwares on the CT scans. Um, and electronic medical records could alert uh, providers uh, to patients' low uh, temporal muscle or frailty status, and then prompt order says for, um, cons and for consultant for, to relevant specialty, and also potential prognostic uh, relevance of TMT uh, in another uh, brain tumor and consider possible correlation with another sarcopenic and with another um frailty uh, factors uh, and in conclusion we can say that frailty is associated with shorter um however survival in geriatric patient with glioblastoma that the frailty screening is essential um, and telling addition to clinical and demographical patient evaluation and that frailty screening provides information uh to to ameliorate uh, concerning their, uh, those patients and their families. We believe that better um, understanding and quantifying the impact of sarcopenia and frailty in glioblastoma in the patient over 65 potentially could potentially improve treatment planning and perioperative, uh, perioperative optimization for this patient. Thank you very much for your attention and best greetings from Nagoya, Japan. Thank you, Dr. Jankovic. Uh, very interesting topic, interesting lecture. Uh, do we have a questions? Uh, what is your uh, current opinion in, a, as you mentioned, other tumors, for example, a meningioma grade two, grade three, uh, since uh, I know that you do these studies, what is your current opinion on in these tumors? Could it influence actually the outcome and the treatment of these patients? Uh, we yes, uh, we are already in finishing uh, a paper about uh, meningioma two and three, and uh, we have a small series, and I think that that is the 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 big uh, limitation because there is the first study about in the in the world in the in the literature about influence on sarcopenia, and we found that uh, in the meningioma, such as meningioma or benign tumor, that in meningioma two and three, there is some significance. But uh, already we we are uh, for collecting of more patients because uh, we are on the thirteen patient, and there is no no possible to to do the 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 really statistical significance. But the first our first. Um, results said that there is some correlation between meningioma three and two with um, sarcopenia. Okay. And so, Ali, so maybe I think Dr. Kondo is expert of the glioma, so maybe he can make some comment. Okay. Hi, yeah. everyone. This is Kondo. So I think that it's it's a good talk and it's a good point to decide that the future direction of the agreeable patient, especially for that uh, uh, geriatric patient. 
But uh, uh, it's there's some like a difficulty to uh, assess that, that their actual uh, weakness, uh, since that we don't know about that uh, how they are good before the diseases. So that uh, you may all know about that uh, glioblastoma and glioma has a specific like a mass effect or a specific like a, a functional disorder. So that's that uh, uh, it is almost impossible to uh, understanding that uh, how much they are good uh, before the before the diseases. So if that uh, if uh, you know the tumor located is exactly that the motor area, which means that they are causes a lot like a disturbance of that the walking or some like a daily life. And in the point that you know, if frailty is like high score, which means that we have to give up that further treatment for him, it's also a good idea for us now. So I think that there, uh, it's one of the good idea is like uh, having that classification for that uh, uh, tumor location or tumor size or that kind of like a uh, uh, detailed information is kind of a key to understanding that what's the uh, appropriate treatment for that gelastic patient. It's my opinion. But uh, anyway, that's a good idea for that. Uh, thank you, Professor Kondo. Um, is there, are there any more comments or questions? Okay. Um, now um, it's my uh, honor to present Professor Kondo, uh, Chair and Professor of Department of Neurosurgery, Yuntendo University, Japan. Uh, I'm glad that we have you again with us, Professor Kondo, and you can proceed with your lecture, The Surgery of Glioma. Thank you for your introduction, and I'm pretty honored to having that uh, time to uh, discuss about the uh, surgery of the uh, gliomas, gliomas. And uh, I'm sharing that to my slide. Okay, we, we see everything's fine. Okay, so let's start my talk. and. Uh, I have no like a specific uh, COI for the, this talk. And uh, uh, as I mentioned before the question, <laughs> that uh, most important thing is to uh, like uh, uh, doing the surgery of glioma is like a, a maximum surgical resection. As you all know that the extent of resection is a prognostic factor and the effort at obtaining the complete resection are justified across the whole glioma entities. And in the current surgical approach to gliomas, the prevention of the, the new permanent neurological deficit has high uh, priority than the extent of the resection. So that we need to focus on that uh, uh, the uh, role of the surgery, which is not like a sweet for that uh, if the surgery would make the, the other uh, neurological deficit. So, so to 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 prevent that uh, uh, you know complication of the surgery, we need to understand precisely about the, the brain surface anatomy. It's like a, a you know pretty much the basic things and the fundamental things. But uh, before all starting to the, the surgery, we need to understand that the 3D image of the, and, the, and also that we are understanding about that the sulcus and the sulci and the gyrus of the, the brain, and uh, it's it's. It's a little bit complicated, but still we have to uh, see that the exact location of the tumor and exact the extension uh, level of the, the tumors. And uh, one of the good ideas is to, to picking up that some like a surgical mass, a surgical milk mal or a surgical point uh, before doing the, the surgery. Then in case that uh, even the, the tumor is small, it's better to understand better to open that widely to see that the brain surface since that uh, uh, MRI image is not like a fit that the your surgical image is uh, to start that the surgery for that. And uh, uh, I think that you can go back to the this kind of like a literature and uh, as you can see that uh, we have to uh, special consideration for that uh, uh, central sulux and uh, identified in, identified with that uh, uh, frontal inferior frontal Robes, especially about the uh, uh, past past triangles and the past like uh, uh, lines. So, so that's that uh, we. Uh, I'm just going to use that some type of the V and U and U and U is a kind of like a good milk mark for to identify that uh, uh, central sulcus and also the kind of like an important like uh, milk mark is going to the uh, precentral sulcus. And uh, also we have need to understanding about the, the insulars. 
And uh, uh, insular is almost like a cupboard with uh, the frontal lobe and the temporal lobe, so which means that uh, we cannot see that they go through that uh, uh, the lesion if that uh, tumor is located with the, the insular, which means we need to understand that or, uh, or move that the frontal lobe, the cupboard with the insular and the cupboard with the temporal lobe. And uh, uh, you may have a good chance to having uh, the uh, clipping surgery or, or for that uh, MCO, ICPC, or that kind of like a, a vascular diseases. But uh, uh, unfortunately, that uh, uh, the passing through that uh, uh, middle cerebral artery is not exactly located to the cerebral feature, uh, which is more like a, a down or bad side of the uh, temporal lobe, which means that not just opening that the cerebral fissure is not good enough to identify that the insular location of the, the tumor. It's kind of like a, a tips to 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 open the uh, skull and it, it tips to identify that the exact location of the tumor. Let's see one of the examination of that uh, one of the example of that uh, tumors. As you can see, that the tumor is like a, a nicely enhanced with the contrast enhancement. And uh, uh, it's so-called that ring like enhancement. Uh, what is exactly the reason of uh, what is exactly the location uh, of the uh, tumors? As you can see, that uh, this is uh, like a deep like silks here, and also you can identify that the deep like silks. This is exactly the central silks. So that's that we can just say uh, it's located to that uh, uh, superior frontal gyrus. But uh, what is the su superior frontal gyrus? To go back to uh, to go to go to get into the surgery, we also understanding that uh, uh, vascular location with that uh, uh, superior frontal lobes. As you can see, that uh, uh, we have that lobe like a cortical branches from that uh, uh, anterior cerebral arteries. It's located like here, and uh, also that the location of that the superior frontal gyrus. It's not like a simply like a covered with that uh, one single. Uh, cortical arteries, which means that uh, we need to exactly the understanding that uh, what kind of like a feeder or, uh, is like uh, uh, originally from that uh, what kind of like a uh, uh, cortical artery. Also, we need to understanding that uh, uh, what we should to preserve the, the artery if that uh, uh, cortical artery is covered for that uh, much more high, higher function of the uh, brain. So that means that uh, uh, we also go, have to go back to the uh, anatomical things, including that uh, vascular things. So this is one of the idea of that uh, opening the skull. This is uh, uh, of that uh, superior frontal lobe diseases. As you can see, that the uh, more easiest way to identify that uh, uh, the location is like uh, like this, and as, as you can see that uh, we can see that uh, some type of that uh, uh, tumor uh, through that. Uh, through the uh, brain surfaces. But uh, before getting into the, the tumor, I think it's better idea, uh, better idea to identify that there are much more like uh, uh, arterial things and vascular things. And if you can open that uh, uh, suicide first and identify that the location of, and the feeding artery, and also that uh, we need the understanding of that uh, uh, exact part of that uh, arteries, which is not like uh, feeding for the tumor. So after the all the identification that uh, uh, we should start that the surgery and surgery itself is not like a difficult things and uh, so or if uh, glioblastoma is also like a higher vascular lesion so that uh, it's not like a clean surgery but uh, if you can uh, special consideration for the uh, arteries and suicide and anatomical location which means that uh, we never injured about the, the uh, uh, artery and also the uh, normal functional brain. One of the a uh, the other idea is like this. Uh, as I mentioned, something about that the placental artery or placental surface is kind of like a key to understanding about that the motor functions. Uh, as you can see, that uh, very small percentage of that the placental artery is covered for that uh, is covered covered for that uh, pure motor uh, functions. So that's uh, it's also a good idea to just sacrifice the, the uh, uh, internal. A frontal artery, since that uh, if that a uh, uh, very uh, very like a large uh, inferior uh, internal frontal artery is covered for that uh, pure motor cortex, so that the, uh, they have that uh, variation for that. So that uh, we need to uh, we need to see the exact 
uh, vascular uh, location or uh, running through the uh, arteries to to cover that uh, which area uh, is like covered with that, that kind of artery. And also, or we should know to about that uh, how to preserve the artery. So I just want to show you that uh, uh, some of the technique about that uh, how to preserve the uh, trees, which is not uh, not uh, correlated with the uh, feeding of the tumor. And to understanding about the uh, vascular uh, vascularity of the tumor, as you can see that uh, if you, you can see that the specific uh, arteries, which is run through the, the suicide, which is not like uh, uh, locate, uh, associated with the uh, tumors, so that we should preserve for that. Then after the checking that that kind of like uh, images, uh, we get into the surgery like this. So let's see that the surgery. And as you can see that uh, it's exactly the tumor and uh, you may see that the uh, you know, normal part of the brain, but at first that the uh, first injury or first cutting is not like uh, easy to identify that the uh, uh, arteries. But uh, if you have that specific like instrument, and if you also or try to control that uh, uh, heating technique or melting technique of that the tumor, uh, you can preserve that uh, arteries like this. So that's uh, even covered with the tumors, and uh, it's like a so-called that the lung through arteries, which is easy to preserve uh, if you understanding that uh, what is important to do that the surgery, and. Uh, you may see that uh, uh, some kind of like, a, uh, let's say that a, a presenteral artery like this, and also or we can dig into the deeps, but still we can understand that the exact location of the part of the uh, suicide or gyrus or like this. So after that, uh, we can preserve that all the tumor like this, uh, all, all the functions like this. The next example is like this. And uh, uh, if you may have that some like a specific like uh, uh, instrumentation uh, which is like controlling the power of the uh, 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 suction or a power of the uh, ultrasound function, and uh, uh, it's not like uh, difficult to preserve the artery like this. So even that uh, just go through the uh, uh, the uh, tumor. And uh, located to the exactly the, the located in that the intra tumor, but still we can uh, understanding that the, if that the, uh, the that type of the uh, arteries are half to preserved, uh, we could do this like this. So as you can see that uh, uh, these arteries are uh, having that the perspiration. So so that that uh, it's uh, we can say that we can preserve that the artery. Then uh, we also uh, we also keep that the, the function of the, the uh, brain. Yeah, so that they, that uh, even even that uh, tumor is located for the more eloquent or functional area, uh, preserving that is one of the key to preserve or, or, or maintain that uh, patient condition like this. So I just summarized about that uh, with the shamer, and uh, uh, if you have that the specific artery. Uh, you could uh, have that the two way to preserve that uh, uh, this kind of uh, vascular things, and if you are uh, like uh, much familiar with that uh, vascular surgery, it's it's like dissecting into the the gyrus and uh, uh, getting into the sucs. One of the good idea is that the preserving that the surface of the uh, pier like this. But uh, pier is like uh, uh, still like a good like a uh, protection membrane uh, to to obstruct the other uh, part of the brain. So that the the second idea is like uh, internal debulking of the tumor is one of the good idea. And after the uh, after the uh, special part of that specific part of the tumor, I think you can get into more closely to the pier membrane. And uh, uh, you know, weak like a uh, sectional techniques or weak like a uh, uh, bipolar uh, heating technique is also uh, uh, one of the good idea to preserve that uh, PM matter so that that we have never get into the functional brain like this. The uh, second effort to preserve the, is like uh, fibers, and uh, fibers are like a more, much more complicated thing. So that it's not so easy uh, to uh, identify that the fiber. But uh, uh, fortunately, we have a uh, good like uh, uh, you know or MRI images, so that that we can uh, visualize that the specific uh, specific fibers or tracts. 
So as you can see that this is a glioblastoma, which is located to the, uh, the lower uh, frontal lobe. But, uh, and uh, as you can see that uh, some specific aggregate fiber is like located just around the, the tumor. So that we should preserve that kind of idea. But uh, uh, in the operative, in interoperative things, it's almost impossible to see that, that this kind of fiber. So that's, uh, we, are, we are just uh, picking up the specific technique, so-called that uh, colitical, colitical evoked potential waveforms. And uh, uh, if you can uh, locate it to the e, e, some specific electrode, we can uh, keep uh, monitoring about the fiber function like this. This is one of the uh, uh, cases. As you can see, that this is 60s females, and uh, they are uh, she's coming for the difficulty in the speaking. And the MRI, MRI scan revealed that the tumor located in the frontal lobe and the craniotomy was performed. This is an uh, interoperative findings. And uh, we use that the navigation guide, and we also use that the interoperative fluorescence diagnosis. But the still, uh, the important things for her is like preserving the aggregate fibers. So that uh, we just picking up that that's two point uh, with the navigation system, and the two located to the uh, electrode load on the frontal lobe and temporal lobe. And uh, uh, using that the specific anatomical idea that if you uh, stimulate that the specific part of the uh, frontal lobe and go through the, the, the uh, acute fibers, then uh, we can picking up that uh, some specific like a signal uh, from the, the temporal lobe. But if you continue to be monitoring about that, uh, uh, the, the level of that uh, uh, electrode load, we can identify that uh, how much like uh, obeyed or invaded uh, with the surgery. So that uh, this is uh, like time course of that wave. That if you are succeeded to 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 preserve that uh, acute fiber, uh, we can constantly have having that uh, specific amount of that wave wavelengths. But uh, if you uh, are not like a good surgeon or not, not we can uh, we can uh, occasionally we, we it is difficult to identify that that kind of high find things. So that's that, uh, as, you, as you may know, that uh, the, the, the wave levels of that uh, CCP is a little bit going down. And so that states uh, she uh, has a little bit like a speech dysfunction for that. So that's uh, uh, one of the uh, ideas for that uh, uh, preserving the fiber is using that uh, CCP, so-called that the coach could describe the potential waveforms. And uh, uh, the final examination or final case is for to see that the fiber is like a located the tumor, which is on the uh, uh, brainstem, like this. And uh, as you may know, that uh, to identify that the fibers is not like uh, just uh, MRI images. Uh, we should uh, go back to the bed and uh, ask that uh, ask the patient that uh, what is exactly the problem for her, for her. And then if you can put up that uh, some specific like uh, neurological findings, we can identify that uh, trap fiber, uh, which is like a. Uh, 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 invaded or uh, which like uh, uh, disturbed, uh, disturbed by the tumor. And after the identification of the, the fibers, uh, we could pick up that the, some entry zone. It's so called that the safety entry zone for the brain stem. And uh, uh, if we, we could have that, let's say that they evoked the potential and also that the specific like a nerve, nerve evoked power, uh, we could safely remove that the tumor like this. So oh, next one is like a, a surgical video. Uh, we just picking up that uh, uh, subtemporal approach for the uh, uh, Pons region. As you can see, this is a tentary, free tentary edge, and open the arachnoid, and also oh, to widen the uh, specific surgical spaces, we could cut that the tentary surface. And uh, we identify that the fourth nerve, and after that, we just get into the lateral sulcus of the uh, uh, midbrain. And uh, as you can see, that uh, it's not like a, a, a like a wide uh, surgical cordial, but still, we just get we just go go straight uh, to the tumor. It's like a, a hemangioma-like tumor. And as you can see, that uh, uh, not like uh, injured the other fibers, we could pick up the tumor. And then finally, we can see that some feeding artery uh, before the study of that uh, surgery. 
we just coagulate and the down. It's like enough procedure to remove the old tumor like this. Here you go. And after the after the uh, surgery, they she has no like uh, uh, neurological deficits. So as you may know that uh, especially about the glioma, like a classification is a little bit complicated and it's almost like impossible to catch up that uh, every like a classification technique since that uh, we almost like uh, every four years, three or four years, like uh, uh, we have that uh, specific new classification for the gliomas. But the basic sequence is not so hugely different from that the previous like edition. So that's that uh, uh, not like uh, we don't have to uh, be specialized about that the classification, but still uh, the uh, consensus of that the glioma surgery is like a keep the anatomy and keep the uh, function and keep the uh, vascularity. So that's the that, uh, uh, most important thing to, to uh, carry out that the uh, glioma surgery is like an anatomical recognition and the functional disability this uh, attribution of liberation and also that the vascular notable is the most important things for us. So thank you for your attention. And uh, this is like uh, uh, my uh, policy for the glioma surgery. Thank you, Professor Kondo. Excellent lecture as always. Uh, questions from the audience, comments? Uh, Professor Feletti. Uh, yes, uh, uh, Professor Kondo, nice to see you again and thank you for the see nice you. lecture. Uh, I have a question. You mentioned about uh, uh, gliomas in uh, insula, insular gliomas. Yes. So, uh, what's your preferred strategy? Do you use uh, the transilian approach or a sub PL approach because there are two different uh, schools uh, to approach these kind of tumors in the insula. So I would like to know your opinion about the pros and cons of these okay. two approaches. I think Please. that we need uh, we need a uh, 20, 20 minutes <laughs> to explain that to you. <laughs> but but anyway, right. uh, yes, that uh, it's kind of like a most difficult uh, gliomas which are located to the insula. And as you may know, oh, that uh, first of all, we have to reach the lesion uh, in, without any like injury to the uh, brain and also the uh, arteries. So that's the one of the idea is to identify clearly about that, the location and see that the vascular uh, location. So that uh, it's one of the good idea is like opening that the cerebral fissure widely and see that the remain insular to the posterior limbs of that uh, insula is the most important things. And before the surgery, I think we need to understanding about that uh, feeding of the uh, uh, vascular location, which you may know something about the long insular artery, which is like a, a supplied for the, uh, let's say that the pyramidal tract. So that's the that, uh, injury of that uh, long insular artery is most like a, uh, 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 you know, the, the tragedy if you injure that, that, that kind of like a small artery. So that uh, understanding that the perforator location and understanding that the long insular artery, artery is like a key so that, so in that mean that, uh, you know, some prior approach for that uh, insular glioma is one of the good idea. But still, uh, we have to uh, get the, the good cordial to the tumor so that the uh, wide, wide cerebral opening is one of the key to uh, get the succeed or that removing that the insular glioma, just that the short answer. But if you like that, I'm happy to show you that the another, uh, our, our series is, uh, if you have that uh, another chance uh, to, to show that the, my surgery like this. Yeah, thank you very much. Maybe we can organize a separate uh, webinar just <laughs> focusing on this topic. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very thank much. You. Yes, we, we, we should definitely. Uh, we have also Dr. Almir. Dr. Almir is our uh, colleague neurosurgeon from uh, our department from Sarajevo, and he's doing his PhD thesis actually in glioma. Um, mm -hmm. So he has a question, as I see in a panelist. So please, Dr. Almir. Uh, you can proceed. Thank you, Adi. Uh, thank you, Professor Kondo, for your wonderful lecture. Uh, I just want to ask you, uh, do you use away craniotomies in, in any type of this surgery, especially in these insular gliomas? Or what do you think about that for using awake craniotomies? 
Yes, that's a good question. And uh, it depends on the, the patient. And uh, especially about that, uh, if you, that the patient have the specific like a psychological problem, it's like kind of like impossible to carry out the, the awake surgery for the gliomas. And also we have the good monitoring. I think that you mentioned some, you want to mention something about the CSEP or the other interoperating monitoring is good enough to, to remove the, the tumor without any awake surgery. It's one of the good idea. Uh, and so that, that uh, we can say that uh, if the gesture, <coughs> let's say that the motor function, it's not have to uh, awake the, the patient uh, in the surgery. But uh, if the, uh, uh, the tumor is like a relation, have the relation to the uh, verbal function, or uh, occasionally we have that the patient, it's which is not like a you know, bilingual and two language that acquire the patient. It's, a little bit difficult to uh, evaluate that uh, uh, pre-surgically the the uh, bubble location, bubble function location of the uh, uh, brain. So that in that case, it's, it's uh, we sh we should awake that uh, patient and uh, having that a good like a cortical monitoring, and then uh, we can safely get into the tumor. So that uh, you know it's depending on that the patient is my answer. Okay, thank you very much. Um, thank you for the question and your answer, Professor. As also you mentioned uh, uh, that anatomy is very important. Many, many uh, new actually generation surgeons are relying to the technology, which is actually neural navigate, navigation, et cetera. But the anatomy is a key for, uh, we can say, safe resection and the comfort of the surgeon. Also, do you, uh, for the rest of the audience, since, since we have a, we can say international, um, especially for this southeastern region, uh, do you offer any kind of fellowships for uh, uh, tumor oncological fellowships in your country for the international neurosurgeons, for example, for Dr. Almir or any other who is more interested in this topic? Yes, I'm happy to have that, but still that, uh, you know, Japanese government is a little bit control, uh, uh, controversial about that, uh, accepting the role like uh, uh, people or who uh, originally from the, the you know, or, you know, that uh, uh, infectional country. So that's uh, just just call me or mail me or something like that. And we, we should have that specific like a department which can manage about that accepting that uh, international colleagues. So that's uh, just uh, uh, mail me or something uh, and if there is something I can do for you that uh, I'm happy to do that. Thank you so much. We will uh, stay in contact. Dr. Almir too with you and Professor Kato of course. Uh, okay if we don't have uh, other questions we should move forward. Um, the next next speaker is Professor Shoji Yokoburi. Uh, Professor Director and Chair Department of Emergency and Critical Care Medicine. Division of Neurosurgical Emergency in Nippon Medical School, Japan, with the COVID-19 response of Emergency Neurotrauma Center in Japan. So please, Professor Yokoburi. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, yes, hear me? yes. Okay, we okay, yeah. Uh, thank you, Professor Adi, and uh, respected uh, Professor Yokokato for giving a like this great opportunity to be here with you. And uh, unfortunately, I was now out of my house and. Uh, uh, I have, because of uh, joining the, uh, another conference here uh, in the rural area of Japan. And uh, uh, some uh, uh, internet is a little bit unstable. And so I used to uh, uh, my presentation video instead of my uh, direct talking. And uh, this is my talking topic is about not for uh, a treatment or the management of uh, uh, neural uh, surgery, but just for uh, uh, response and the preparation of a pandemic of COVID-19 in Japan. I hope uh, you enjoyed to see the, my presentation video like as an easy uh, cartoon, and thank you so much. Okay, and now I start my presentation uh, with uh, like this. Can you see? Uh, we see it, uh, just, oh, it's gonna start. All right, okay. Okay, um, thank you all for giving me a like this great opportunity to speak in this conference. Um, I'm Shoji Kobori from Nippon Medical School in Tokyo. And today's my talking topic is about the COVID-19 response of Emergency Neurotrauma Center in Japan. Okay, first let me introduce our Nippon Medical School. Um, our Nippon Medical School is located at the center of the Tokyo district 
and was from the 1876. And we have uh, uh, 897 beds in our hospital. Uh, we also have uh, 60 emergency ICU beds. Um, we have so unique system uh, that means the self-contained emergency medical system. So this means uh, we dispatch, we use uh, like this uh, uh, doctor's ambulance and we directly uh, dispatch to the uh, injured or uh, disease. Um, then uh, we take the patient into our hospital uh, like this and uh, we taking care of the patient uh, from the uh, beginning as a uh, resuscitation and we do the operation by uh, with our uh, skills and then uh, we take in the pair the patient in the ICU and then uh, we take the patient to the rehabilitation so uh, uh, I hope uh, we can uh, show you the experience at the time of the COVID-19 and uh, trauma is a worldwide problem and actually the trauma has a uh, eight percent of the all cause of the death and also the main cause of young age all over the world so uh, trauma is now is a very big medical social economic problem and this uh, situation of the japan about the uh, traumatic brain injury and uh, this graph shows the uh, percentage of the number of the patient of the each uh, trauma uh, injury uh, uh, kind of injury and the lower extremity is the highest and the traumatic brain injury has the second largest number of the all uh, trauma cases in japan um, I also show you the data from the Japan Eurotrauma data bank. So this means the uh, data from the 32 uh, level one trauma centers in Japan. And uh, we could st uh, we struggle uh, to reduce the uh, preventable trauma cases, preventable deaths in trauma cases. And uh, this shows the graph of the uh, mortality, uh, the number of the cases of the uh, preventable trauma deaths. And uh, this uh, polytrauma means uh, uh, that patient that have the uh, severe uh, trauma uh, in two parts of the body. And this means the AIS uh, is over three and uh, two parts uh, in the whole entire of the patient body. Um, the, about the polytrauma, we could reduce the uh, uh, number of the preventable trauma cases, preventable deaths in trauma uh, from the 1998 to 2015, uh, from the 20% to 10%. Uh, but uh, for a sole TBI in the only uh, simple traumatic brain injury, uh, we could not reduce the number of the preventable trauma death cases. Uh, this means that uh, we cannot see the, the big progress over these 15 years. So how do we uh, reduce uh, like this uh, preventable trauma death cases? And uh, our treatment is so simple. So uh, uh, actually the, this uh, like this uh, A, B, C approach. Uh, we just uh, give the patient the oxygen rich air uh, from the airway and uh, uh, we keep the uh, patient ventilation uh, for uh, uh, good oxygenation and uh, reduce the uh, uh, CO2 uh, from the uh, blood. And uh, we also need to uh, send the oxygenated blood to uh, uh, brain tissue so uh, the patient brain could keep the higher oxygenation uh, to prevent the brain ischemia. So uh, this means uh, uh, we can uh, reduce uh, secondary brain injury and to uh, reduce uh, uh, preventable trauma uh, in uh, severe cases. And to prevent uh, secondary brain injury, the oxygenation and the ventilation is also crucial. Um, but the next uh, problem was happened in Japan. This was a COVID-19 pandemic. 
Actually, the first case of the COVID-19 was uh, from the 220 in January, and uh, that was uh, a spread from the one person uh, returned from the Wuhan, China. And so far, uh, the from uh, from the 2020 to the this year, uh, total number of the, these people is uh, over 70,000. And uh, 32 million cases, uh, people were infected. And how do we overcome uh, like this uh, COVID-19 pandemic in our hospital? And um, I show you the chronology of the, our uh, activity uh, in my hospital. And the, actually, the uh, COVID-19 pandemic was started from the 2019 in China. And uh, from the uh, this year, the COVID-19 infection was spreading in our hospital too. Um, the first case was uh, checked. Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, first check was a uh, first case was a uh, Diamond Princess uh, cruise ship was uh, anchored at the Yokohama, and uh, uh, we uh, respond. Uh, these are uh, over three thousand cases. Um, then, uh, first this uh, case uh, was confirmed in Japan at the time of uh, two, February 13, 2020. And in our hospital, uh, at the time of the uh, February 28th, uh, we already established a headquarter in our Nippon Medical School and all, uh, with uh, uh, many uh, types of the doctors, like uh, the ER and ICU, CCU doctors are uh, included here. Uh, also, the, from this point, uh, we could uh, make in a, uh, we could make a manual, a response manual for uh, COVID-19 in our hospital. And our Nippon Medical School is uh, very good at for uh, disaster uh, medicine. And uh, we have a uh, so long time history and uh, experience for uh, uh, disaster uh, relief. Uh, and, uh, uh, actually, the, we are uh, dispatched to the uh, overseas and uh, national uh, disaster cases. And our motto uh, of the treatment, our motto of the management of the patient is a koki junko. That's koki junko means the uh, dedicate uh, ourselves to the public service. And I show you the uh, theory of the disaster response. So this means the CSCATTT. Um, CSCATTT means uh, command and control and safety and communication assessment and blah, blah, blah. Um, we need to uh, establish uh, these point uh, before entering the disaster scene. The first we should establish is a command and control before entering the disaster. Actually, we make a like this uh, organization chart, and uh, this means the uh, command and control of the all part and all a part of the uh, doctors and nurses and the safety and transfer team, blah blah blah. And also, we establish the duty roster every day um, for uh, COVID-19 uh, response uh, in our hospital. And sometimes we, we need to uh, frequently use a communication tool uh, like a radio or a cell phone. And we also uh, use a, like this whiteboard to share the information of the cases of the uh, situation of the pandemic. And the uh, first S is the safety. And uh, we say that safety has the three components as the uh, self, um, scene, and survivor. So first safety we need to establish is uh, self. And uh, we, before uh, 2021, and we already uh, trained the PPE uh, wearing for the all medical staff like this. And I show you the case of the 
video uh, of the uh, injury cases, and uh, that was a uh, uh, suspected infection. And uh, you see the uh, like it's all doctors and nurses wearing the PPE and uh, checking uh, every time the uh, COVID-19 uh, antibody. And we taking the care of the patient in the like this. Uh, uh, so specialized uh, place to reduce uh, spreading the COVID-19 with uh, using a uh, like this seat. And uh, this uh, example that shows uh, uh, like this, uh, we put the seat and we divide the uh, area that's safe and the infected area like this. So, and we also uh, established the operating theater for uh, infected people. And um, we also uh, established uh, like this uh, sh shelter for, uh, uh, in the ICU. And the assessment of the patient is so crucial. Um, when the, we accept the patient, uh, we have to check the patient status of the body temperature or uh, a symptom as a dyspnea or uh, a history of the sick contact. Uh, when we uh, suspect one plus two or three, uh, we have to activate our uh, full PPE operation every time. And uh, like I said, this approach uh, of uh, initial management in uh, our emergency department. And uh, first, we uh, accept the hotline and uh, we check the patient status. And uh, if the a uh, patient was suspected with a COVID-19 infection, uh, we activate the uh, treatment team uh, in our department and uh, we, ask, uh, we treat the patient with a full PPE and check PCR every time. And the second T is the treatment. Um, sometimes we uh, use uh, like it's a VL uh, educational system for the training of the in, uh, intubation and uh, with the uh, uh, emma, uh, emergency doctors or uh, resident doctors like this. And sometimes uh, we need to uh, use a, a special device like a name as a ECMO and extra corporeal membrane oxygenation for the patient. And uh, we train, uh, we treat the patient, only one patient with a uh, uh, like this uh, team, and uh, including uh, six doctors. And uh, for uh, all uh, doctors, we need to train the how to establish the uh, ECMO device uh, for the cases. And this is a case of the, our first experience in uh, this pandemic in our hospital. And actually, uh, he was uh, 15 years old male. Um, the, before the induction of the ECMO, uh, and, uh, his uh, oxygenation was so bad. And after the established uh, ECMO devices and uh, put the ECMO devices, and uh, we uh, choose a long list for the patient. And three weeks after the induction, and uh, his uh, respiration was so uh, recovered well. And uh, fortunately, uh, he could uh, recover uh, without any uh, morbidity and discharge one month after the infection. And also, the transfer is so important. Um, every time we use a, like it's a mobile ICU to uh, bring the uh, to take the patient to the uh, other hospital, or uh, we collect the uh, severe cases to our hospital. And uh, this uh, mobile ICU have uh, a big monitor and ventilator, or sometimes we use uh, like this uh, X-ray devices for uh, uh, treatment of the patient. And this is the final slide of the, and the take home message. And the response for the pandemic is so close uh, to the one for the disaster. And the CSCATTT, the, uh, this means the theory of the disaster uh, is also the useful for the uh, response of the COVID-19. And thank you for your kind attention. And we hope 
uh, we can see, uh, we can meet uh, face to face in the future. Thank you so much. That's it. Yep. Could you Thank share your session? All right. Uh, we saw we saw your video. Uh, very okay. very good. Excellent excellent Thank presentation. Uh, Thank you. Uh, sorry, about this. Yes. Uh, okay. No 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 worries. Uh, everything is fine. Uh, do we have a uh, comments or questions from the audience? Uh, please, Professor Andrews. Yeah, that's a just an excellent presentation. You know, for a few years now, we've been advocating taking the trauma stroke center model and expanding it to what we call mass casualty center. And that sounds like what we've done at Nippon already. I uh, hope we can keep in touch. Uh, that's, you know, really what's needed. I mean, as neurosurgeons, in, especially in developing countries, the vast majority of what they're seeing is neurotrauma. And, you know, we're talking about intraoperative MRI and, you know, 98% of the world doesn't have that. Yeah. Um, but you're you're dealing with what's what's really important. And thank so, you, uh, thank you. Congratulations. Thank you, Professor Andrew, for your uh, great and uh, encouraging uh, comment uh, to me. And uh, I hope we can uh, keep and keep in, keep in touch with uh, uh, sharing the, uh, our uh, unforgettable uh, experience for the future. Thank you so much. Yeah, hopefully you can share emails here so we can continue to contact all the other speakers tonight. Thank you so much. Yes, of course. Um, thank you, Professor Andrews, for your comment. Uh, any other questions from the audience, please? Yeah, the COVID-19 pandemic actually really influenced not just mm -hmm. our lives, but really, really influenced our works uh, with the patients. Uh, we had also some similar issues and uh, nowadays luckily uh, everything functions very well we can say it's just uh, with the with the, with the uh, short antigen test we can proceed with the especially with the emergency cases which we also didn't abandon during the during the pandemic um, but um, it's it's a great great uh, topic to just to share it and maybe hopefully we'll we will not need it in the future yeah. again but it's very good to have that experience from you Thank you, Adi, for uh, your great comment. Thank you. Um, you're welcome. You're welcome. Okay, then, um, if there are no any more questions, uh, we could proceed to the next speaker. Next speaker should be Professor uh, Shiro Horisawa, Professor, uh, Department of Neurosurgery, Tokyo Women's Medical University, Japan, uh, with a lecture in incisionless functional neurosurgery for movement disorders. So please, Professor Horisawa. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm Michelle Horisawa from uh, Tokyo Women's Medical University. Uh, it's very happy to participate in this wonderful conference hosted by the Professor Yoko Kato. Uh, I'm a functional neurosurgeon. So uh, today I'd like to talk about the uh, insidious uh, functional neurosurgery for movement disorders. And uh, functional neurosurgery for movement disorders, uh, majority of the neurosurgeons consider that the deeper inspiration for Parkinson's disease. But actually, we have uh, uh, several uh, treatment modalities, including uh, uh, radio frequency ablation, which is uh, old fashioned, but still uh, useful uh, procedure and uh, selective peripheral denervation using a microscopic uh, treatment. And uh, we also use uh, focus ultrasound, uh, which is a cutting edge technology, uh, which can make a uh, summer region in a deep seated area without skin incision. So actually, this uh, functional surgery is really powerful treatment for uh, movement disorders. This patient is a typical essential tremor presenting a bilateral hand tremor. She received a light side VIM, uh, ceramic uh, VIM nucleus reasoning, and the left hand tremor completely stopped. And this patient is uh, presenting a bilateral hand tremor and uh, received a left side VIM uh, aberration, radio frequency ablation. So the essential tremor is the best candidate of a functional neurosurgery. So tremor, uh, majority of the patients uh, with essential tremor uh, uh, can have uh, great benefits from this surgery. And additionally, uh, cervical dystonia or uh, other kind of uh, hyperkinetic movement disorders are also good candidate of uh, functional neurosurgery.
So, uh, and uh, lesioning surgery uh, without implantation device uh, includes three types of the lesion, uh, lesioning uh, surgery. Uh, one is a radio frequency uh, ablation, which requires a skin incision and uh, electrode penetration into the brain. But the effect is immediate and uh, it enables us to confirm our intraoperative adjustability, uh, the region location. And uh, but skin incision surgery uh, carries the risk of infection and intracerebral hemorrhage. And the gamma ray uh, radio surgery is an incisionless uh, radio surgery, but the effect is delayed, and it carries the risk of uh, radiological adverse events, which is unpredictable. There is a uh, big problem. And uh, another is a focus ultrasound, which is also an uh, incisionless uh, surgery, which is a state of the art. Uh, treatment uh, procedure for movement disorders because the uh, effect is immediate and it also enables us to confirm the intraoperative adjustability. And uh, the incisionless surgery, uh, the, the advantages of the incisionless surgery uh, does not carry the risk of infection and uh, intracerebral hemorrhage. So the, in recent reports and the radiofrequency aberration or deep brain stimulation, and the one to two percent of the patients may have uh, intracerebral hemorrhage. So this complication is the most concerned uh, associated with this kind of the procedure. Uh, and the gamma knife uh, radio surgery, uh, which uh, can make uh, radiological necrosis in deep seated structures by using a focused gamma rays on the target uh, without skin incision. So, but the lesion development of the gamma knife uh, is slowly progressive. So you cannot see any lesion on the three months post-operative MRI here, but after the three months post-operative MRI, you can see very small and the tiny region on the left at VIM nucleus. So, so the lesion uh, gradually becomes visualized with time. And this is the essential thermal patients. Uh, our case uh, by uh, left side VIM thermotomy, 130 gray on the left VIM nucleus. And this is a pre-operative MRI and a post-operative MRI. So this is a six months post-operative MRI. You can see small, tiny region on the target and the patient's uh, tremor. Uh, this is a before uh, the surgical condition. This is after the patients came to write a uh, very uh, uh, fine and delicate Japanese characters. And this is a focal hand dissonant patient. This is a preoperative MRI. The, the target is at the ventral olar nucleus, which is effective for focal hand dystonia just anterior to the VIM nucleus. And you cannot uh, see any lesion on, at the one month post operative MRI. This is a three months that you can see very small, tiny lesion here. And uh, the effect and the, the symptoms started to improve around at three months post operative MRI. And uh, the lesion uh, becomes uh, gradually visualized with time, like this. And this is the, that patient, the patient having the right hand uh, dystonia. So left hand movement is completely normal, but right hand, the stiffness, due to the stiffness, she could not move the right hand smoothly and quickly. So she was a professional pianist. So due to these symptoms, she could not play at all as a professional pianist. And then she received a left side gamma knife thermotomy. And this is a condition 10 months after the gamma knife thermotomy. So the patient's right hand movements uh, looks completely normal. So, but uh, the uh, several uh, concerns uh, we have to say in the in terms of gamma knife radio surgery. One is a hypo uh, response, uh, which may happen from seven to twenty two percent of the patients after the gamma knife radio surgery. This is our patients. Uh, the patient received left side VIM a gamma knife thermotomy for assistant tremor, but 24 two, two years after the treatment, you cannot see any uh, lesion. And uh, of course, the tremor uh, didn't improve at all. So this is a big problem of the gamma knife radio surgery. And this is unpredictable uh, response. And this is also a big problem of the hyper response of the gamma knife. 
uh, this is uh, our patient uh, at six months after the gamma knife thermotomy. So very widespread edema uh, around around the VIM nucleus on the target. And uh, the patient presented a severe hemiparesis and uh, hemidesesthesia. This is another patient at three, three years ago, uh, three, three years after the treatment, uh, the widespread edema still exists. And the patient presented uh, as mild dysesthesia. So this is a hyper response. Uh, this is also uh, unpredictable complications. This is a report by uh, New York University Professor Douglas Conzi Olga. She he re reported two cases of the Parkinson disease uh, with a, a gamma knife subthalamic nucleus aberration, and the two cases presented a, a severe uh, edema. Uh, and the, the two patients have a uh, had uh, this uh, serial dysesthesia and a mild hemiparesis. Uh, but fortunately, this uh, edema spontaneously improved. And uh, another concern is uh, that the difficulty with gamma knife is uh, inability to adjust the treatment site according to the neurophysiological uh, evaluation. So DBS and the radio frequency uh, aberration and the focus ultrasound can be performed with a test stimulation or test sonication to confirm the improvement of symptoms and the presence of uh, side effects before finalizing the target. So this is essential for uh, improving uh, treatment outcomes. So as a result, uh, the treatment outcome with gamma knife uh, radio surgery are uh, somewhat uh, inferior to uh, those of other treatment modalities. And the chronic encapsulated expanding hematoma is an unpredictable uh, rate onset complications of the gamma knife radio surgery. Uh, it uh, expands over time, and the symptoms such as the paralysis and the numbness will appear. This is our patient uh, presented with severe hemiparesis and hemi uh, dysesthesia, and also uh, dysphagia. So that and he had a repetitive aspiration pneumonia. So this is a big problem. And uh, other reports also uh, show the very deep-seated, uh, encapsulated, uh, expanding hematoma. And uh, due to the location, it is very difficult to remove uh, this hematoma. This is a very big problem to manage in the gamma knife radio surgery. So even with these complications, why choose gamma knife as a treatment? This is because uh, gamma knife is a is the only treatment that can be administered even in conditions with a bleeding tendency. So radio frequency, uh, deep brain stimulation, and the focus ultrasound cannot be performed on patients with bleeding tendency uh, due to the possible intracerebral hemorrhage. So the gamma knife is still a uh, necessary and important treatment procedure for uh, movement disorder surgery. And uh, focused ultrasound is a state-of-the-art treatment device that allows for uh, real-time uh, visualization of the treatment target on the MRI. And uh, by focusing ultrasound waves on the target, heat is generated and the tissue distraction is caused, resulted in uh, therapeutic effects. So therefore, the treatment mechanism uh, is the same as uh, that of a radio frequency hammer uh, coagulation. So we can see uh, the region uh, in, uh, while the sonication using the MR thermometry. So this is an essential tremor patient, uh, bilateral hand tremor, the light hand tremor already treated, and the he. Uh, the condition before the left hand treatment. So this is a typical essential tremor, uh, posture and the action tremor were significant. So right side uh, focus ultrasound via M reasoning, the left hand tremor uh, improved very much compared to the before the surgical condition. The focus ultrasound also provides uh, a great benefits uh, as similar uh, that of a uh, radio frequency average or deep brain simulation. So the lesion uh, by the FUS focus ultrasound lesion, like this, like this. So with out skin incision, so 
this fine uh, region can be made by the ultrasound ablation. And this is a focal hand dysonia patient, uh, right? Force and the fifth fingers in voluntary fraction only while playing a piano. And then she was a candidate of a clinical trial of a focus ultrasound uh, thermotomy for focal hand dystonia. This is a one month after. But actually, the benefits are uh, achieved uh, just after the sonication on the day of the surgery. She was a professional pianist, and uh, she now she plays uh, piano very well without any dystonia uh, five, four or five years after the treatment. So this is a big uh, region on the ventral nucleus by the focus ultrasound. This is another patient, professional guitarist. Now take a look at the left fourth and the fifth fingers stiffness. This fourth and fifth fingers uncontrollable due to the stiffness and the light side venture all uh, region by the focused ultrasound. Well, he was a completely uh, uh, free from the dystonic symptoms. Uh, this is a typical right as a cramp, the very severe stiffness of the right hand only while uh, writing. So that due to the very severe stiffness in the right hand, it takes a lot of time to write a single uh, letter. This is one month after the treatment. The hesitation, you cannot see any hesitation to write. Writing speed uh, very much improved after the treatment. And that is one year after. The condition stayed the same. So uh, the, we recently started uh, the prospective clinical trial of a uh, focus ultrasound uh, operation for cervical dystonia. And uh, the target is a pyridocinomic tract, which is an um, effluent uh, fibers from an uh, internal segment of the gubbins pyridus to the salamus. So this is a target uh, on the pyridocinomic tract. So the dystonic head tremor uh, was uh, gradually improved after the FUVF treatment. It is slightly tremorless, but uh, better than uh, before the treatment. This is one month after. Oh, and, and, and the current problem is the focus ultrasound treatment is the uh, inability to uh, clearly control the lesion boundary. Uh, it's, it, it's, it's possible to destroy the target area as we want, but uh, still difficult to control the spread of energy to the surrounding area. I wanted surrounding area like this, this region completely cover the posterior rim of the internal capsule. Fortunately, this patient didn't have any hemiparesis but this patient also had a lesion uh, on the internal capsule. So both of, both of the patients didn't have any deficit, but this is a problem of the focus ultrasound, the region de deviation. So the incision surgery, uh, gamma knife and the focus ultrasound are available for a movement disorder treatment. The advantage of the incision surgery are less likely to happen the infection 
and the interest level here, right? But uh, gamma knife radio surgery carries the unpredictable radiological adverse events such as expanding hematoma and the hyper response. And the focus ultrasound also carries the risk of a lesion deviation to the unwanted surrounding area. So please keep in mind that um, incision list does not mean non-invasive. So gamma knife and the focus ultrasound are less invasive uh, surgery. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Horisawa. Great lecture. Uh, any comments or questions from audience? Yes, please, Professor Andrews. Well, I want to thank uh, Professor Horisawa uh, for presenting kind of a very balanced view of these incision incisionless techniques. And I'd like to reinforce um, sometimes the best advance in treatment is a whole new type of treatment. And I think as MRI guided focus ultrasound matures, it's going to become even more important in uh, all aspects of functional neurosurgery. So uh, I think Professor Rosal has really been on to, you know, the cutting edge of neurosurgery. And we really need to keep in mind that sometimes the best treatment is a novel treatment. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. And uh, nowadays, uh, focus ultrasound uh, reasoning is also available not only for a movement disorder, but also for epilepsy and the psychiatric disorders. So mm -hmm. in the recent 10 years, uh, we hope uh, so many good indications will come in the, in the field of our fun, uh, focus ultrasound treatment. Thank yeah, you. if I could just add, uh, we had for one of our neuroscience uh, conferences, uh, Guillermo Heinenen from University of Toronto, perhaps you're aware of him, He's kind of the, the guru of uh, MRI guided focus ultrasound, and he he can really present all the ways that that can be used in neurosurgery. Uh, excellent speaker. And so uh, if you need to publicize the benefits of MRI guided ultrasound and the potential future for it, uh, he's a great speaker. Yeah, great. Thank you. Uh, I congratulate to your excellent uh, lecture and also results which you have shown us in a very short period after this treatment and uh, could it be that the ultrasound is gonna uh, be superior to gamma knife in the future because of maybe less of the radiation effects or adverse effects what is your opinion on that yes of course the i think the 10 years after uh, probably the focus ultrasound is more and more available in the every kind of the movement disorder and the functional neurosurgical treatment. But still, the, the but at this time, the focus ultrasound still carries the risk of a small intracerebral hemorrhage or infarction in the early report. So that the FUS is not available in the patients with a bleeding tendency, such as anti antiparatoid coagulant therapy or a hemodialysis patient. So for those patients, we still need a gamma knife radio surgery for uh, those patients to improve the movement disorder. Uh, so gamma knife is still difficult to manage the region control or region progression, but uh, only the, our indication of the gamma knife is a patient's uh, age uh, over 70 years old or older. So that we don't do the gamma knife radio surgery for younger patients because uh, so many unpredictable uh, rate onset complications can happen in the gamma knife radio surgery. So in terms of the complications, so the focus ultrasound is much, much better than the gamma knife. Uh, what about the recurrence rate? Do you have any data on that, of the recurrence of the symptoms in a patient after the treatment of the ultrasound? The sound, yes, of course. Y yes, it happens, it occurs. Uh, but uh, it uh, can happen af even after the radio frequency and the deep brain stimulation. Yes. So yes, so that's why it, so focus ultrasound can uh, be administered uh, repetitively to improve the recurrence of the symptoms in other the countries. But in Japan, unfortunately, the only one time focus ultrasound procedure is covered by health insurance. So. In case of that, uh, the patients uh, need to have uh, uh, radiofrequency ablation or deep brain stimulation uh, after the failed focus ultrasound treatment in Japan. 
Okay, uh, Professor Andrews. I could just emphasize one more, I think take home lesson from your lecture is you really need to be trained in all the various techniques to treat a specific disorder. So you don't favor one technique because that's all you know. And I think that's a, one of the beauties of what you're doing there. You've got those, all those techniques available to you and you just match it to the right patient, right technique and the right patient. That's a very, very, very important point. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, so we should uh, proceed if there are no any other, other uh, questions and comments. Uh, next speaker is Professor Takao Mitaira, a special adjunct professor from Haigo Medical University in Japan with the neurosurgical management of focal dystonias. So please, yeah. Professor Taira. Thank you very you much. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you very okay, well. Very good. Uh, I'll share my uh, video. Uh, share. Can you see this? Yes, we do. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for kind invitation. I really appreciate your hospitality very, very much. And uh, the previous speaker, the Dr. Hori Sauer, is my uh, pupil, and uh, we have been working for many years. And today, I just changed my topic from focal uh, hand dystonia to more uh, wider uh, area or, or management of movement disorders. And uh, uh, my message today is that we can say goodbye uh, to deep brain stimulation uh, for movement disorders. And of course, over the past 20 years, uh, we have been, uh, we have seen tremendous progress in management of neurosurgical management of movement disorders. And mainly thanks to the introduction of uh, deep brain stimulation. However, the, after many years, say 10, 15 years, most patients may often have such kind of hardware-related complications, uh, infection, rejection, or cosmetic issue. And uh, uh, this is uh, uh, very uh, miserable co condition for patients. And also the patients feel that they are not cured. Uh, they feel I am, I'm, a, I'm a kind of cyborg or I'm a kind of robot. And uh, they cannot escape fearing that I am cured. And they feel just uh, my symptoms is controlled with the device. And if you look at this young lady, for example, this is a young uh, essential tremor patient, bilateral. If you put deep brain stimulation for this young lady, uh, we have to follow her up, say, uh, 50, 60 years from now. And uh, she is always, always afraid of hardware-related complications or, or breakage of the device and so on. Now, however, we treated this lady with, this is after operation, bilateral radio frequency VIM thermotomy. Of course, uh, the, this was a stabilized uh, approach and tremor is completely gone. And uh, we know if it works for at least three months, the effect is forever. So we can say this patient is cured from this tremors condition. Okay. And uh, this became possible because of interaction of modern uh, stereotactic uh, techniques in old days before year 2000. MRI was not available. We only used the ventricle graphy, uh, and we only saw the shadow of the, of, of the brain. And the computer programming was not uh, available, and the lesioning technique was very uh, primitive. But today, we can see the exact trajectory on the uh, MRI, and we can use fiber uh, tracking uh, or other uh, mapping techniques to identify uh, where the uh, where our target is. So the 
So what we are doing today is completely different from what they are doing in old uh, days. And of course, we use the radio frequency lesioning uh, 70 degrees. If it is higher than 80, uh, the region becomes uh, very irregular and adherence to the vessels is a problem. So we don't use very high temperature at all. And we can use uh, electrical stimulation testing and we can see the impedance uh, to differentiate white and uh, gray matter. And the temperature is uh, uh, controlled uh, automatically uh, up to say 70 degrees. Well, if you look at this uh, lady with jacky neck movements and uh, cervical dystonia, but she also has uh, such kind of uh, walking gait uh, like this. We call it the bending of the body, camp to comia. And the, uh, after left GPI radio frequency lesioning, the jockey movement stopped and uh, she became able to walk like this. So even unilateral GPI pallidolomy, uh, we can uh, treat such kind of patient. If you look at this young lady uh, with jockey movements of the left shoulder and the tilting of the head, this is the typical segment of the stone here, uh, treated with GPI radio frequency pallidolomy, and uh, symptoms are, is almost all uh, gone completely, uh, like, like this. And uh, if you if you look at this uh, young uh, man, forty six year old man with tired type dystonia, he has very severe cervical or facial uh, dystonia. And he was treated with the stepwise bilateral radio frequency pyridotomy. And uh, one year later, he is completely uh, normalized with, without marked uh, complications like this. So, and uh, we can see the, for example, optic tract here optic tract here and the, in the if we didn't have uh, mri scanning the optic tract is not was well, not visualized so the the disturbance or visual field is a problem in all days but nowadays we can avoid uh, optic tract or internal capsule uh, thanks to the imaging technique and uh, also, if you look at here, th th this is a GPI, and GPI sends uh, uh, to the fibers to the ventral oral uh, thrums. There are two pathways. One is red one is anza lenticularis, blue one is lenticular fasciculus. And in case of GPI pyridotomy, we are targeting the here and the lenticularis area. Uh, however, the another output, lenticular fasciculus, is also important. So if you target here, uh, we can target both uh, pathways, uh, which may have a more robust effect uh, on the symptoms. Uh, if you look here, uh, this is GPI and the lenticular is here, lenticular fasciculus is here. And uh, this is called pyridoceramic tract in the on, in the area field of foral foral H uh, field, and we call it the PTT pyridoceramic tract. And uh, with this uh, such kind of concept, the, we started the pyridoceramic tractotomy or foral H tomy. Uh, this is an example of unilateral radio frequency pyridocyamic tract totomy and the severe neck jacket movements of the neck and the blepharospasm eye closure. And this is after, immediately after the, uh, the procedure. This is simple cervical dystonia, uh, neck rotation to the left. 
and the uh, unilateral uh, PTT tummy in the neck rotation is normalized. If you look at this uh, young lady, uh, when she stands up, the, she can't walk because of the jerky uh, backwards the pulling movement like, like, like this. And uh, she had unilateral, only unilateral uh, PTT uh, lesioning. This is after, after the treatment. And uh, the jerky movements completely disappeared. So the palidoceramic tractotomy or, or photo edge field uh, lesioning has very powerful effect on uh, such kind of dystonia. Actually, the, the response is uh, the surgery delayed over uh, six months. And uh, the, this is often uh, seen in, also in case of GPI pyridolomy or GPI deep brain stimulation. And uh, in this preliminary in our study, uh, the improvement rate was uh, 70, nearly 4%. Four, four and uh, this is also effective for Parkinson's disease. This is a kinetic type Parkinson patients, typical frozen gait here. And uh, we did the unilateral PTT, Tommy, and immediately after the operation, the symptoms are almost gone. And uh, the, th this is off stage. And uh, even, even off stage, the gait dramatically improved. And this is on stage with the dyskinesia. This is before operation. And she had the severe dyskinesia like, like this, but uh, this kinesia also disappeared after pyridoceramic tractotomy. And uh, uh, we reported uh, uh, this uh, in Parkinson's disease and the response rate was 27% in uh, UPDRS score. And uh, I talked this already. So now this we combine multiple uh, stepwise uh, lesioning uh, based on the patient uh, condition. For example, this young man had the jerky uh, movements of the trunk, uh, actual dystonia, and he underwent the first uh, GP, uh, right GPI, then uh, about a month, uh, about uh, about a year later, see, he had a contralateral lesioning, and finally, uh, he became a computer symptom free, uh, like, like like this. And uh, if you look at this young man, he had the pineal jam jam cell tumor treated with the uh, chemo radiotherapy. Uh, however, he started having such kind of uh, abnormal movements on the, of the neck. And uh, he underwent the GPI pyridotomy first. This is after GPI, right GPI, uh, I'm so sorry, sorry, left left GPI. And then fi finally, he underwent contralateral pyridoceramic tractotomy. And uh, he became completely uh, normalized like, like this. Okay. And uh, so another good indication of uh, uh, lesioning procedure is uh, the ventral oral nucleus uh, for focal hand dystonia. We have uh, published many papers before uh, together with the previous speaker, Shiro Horisawa. And uh, for example, this was uh, my first case. And uh, this is young lady, 27 years old, uh, who had the writer's cramp and she was a professional comic artist. She had been publishing such kind of comic books. Uh, but uh, because of the writer's cramp, she, she became unable to uh, draw. Uh, and uh, she underwent uh, ventral oral uh, thermotomy about 22 years ago. Uh, six months later, uh, she started again. 
and uh, she's still even now she's still active. And finally, she received uh, uh, recorded in the Guinness Book as the most popular uh, manga uh, artist in the world. So this is my uh, longest follow up, uh, 22 years now. And for example, th this patient had a rises cramp initially and had Botox injections, but the symptoms worsened and became continuous. And the task specificity, task specificity dis disappeared. And uh, we performed ventral oral ceramolomy and this is after treatment and uh, his completely co uh, well controlled. And uh, there are many musicians suffering uh, from such kind of uh, uh, focal hand dystonia, uh, Japanese drum or uh, drummer, uh, pianist, guitarist, uh, and uh, every, every kind of uh, musical instrument can induce such kind of focal hand dystonia. And uh, many patients and uh, many musicians are su suffering. For example, this is a drummer uh, with left hand. Uh, you can see the abnormal extension of the thumb. Uh, this is before operation. This is, uh, sorry, th this is during operation. And this is after the operation. Left hand movements became completely okay now. And another patient uh, who had the both uh, arm and the leg uh, dystonia, dermal dystonia, and he's playing. He's explaining how about his. He feels now it's a big difference now. Very quick, very quick. He says it's amazing. Okay, so the effect is immediate, and also such kind of focal this tone here uh, may appear in the foot. For example, he has left foot dystonia. Uh, here you can see the inversion of the foot here. And uh, this is after uh, the uh, ventral oral ceramolomy here. And the gait became uh, normalized. And uh, such kind of uh, focal dystonia may happen in, in the mouth, in the, the, which we call it ambusher uh, dystonia. And if you look at the, this patient, air leaks uh, from the mouth here. Okay. And this is during operation. And the uh, air is still leaking here. He's counting one, two, one, two. Uh, we are checking, uh, we're making a lesion. Uh, we are checking his speed. And after making a lesion, the, his play, air leak stopped. And his play completely became normal. It's surprising. For uh, mouth or face, uh, the Sonia, which is Vento, uh, so, sorry, GPI, uh, Globus pallidus target, while the, in case of hands, we choose Vento oral nucleus. Uh, here, uh, as, as you can see here, the, in case of tremor, it is VIM, focal, for focal hand or foot dystonia, we target the Vento oral uh, times. And as you know, the, the, for dystonia, the neck or face action or generalized we use GPI or pilothymic tract. So the, the, you may say uh, lesioning is dangerous, but uh, the, the serious complication is very, very rare. Even compared with deep brain stimulation, it is not so dangerous. And so my message here is lesioning surgery for movement disorders is much safer than in pre-DBS or MRI era. Uh, what we are doing today is completely different uh, from what uh, they, they used to do 
in 1960s, 70s. And uh, it can bring cure to the patient. And there are no devices related to complications, of course. It's cheaper and quicker. So why don't you restart the regional operation? And you can say goodbye to deep brain stimulation. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Teira. <clears throat> Great lecture. Uh, since I don't have too many experience in this field, I would kindly ask other panelists to comment and have a question. If, yes, Professor Andrews, please. Uh, just you have to unmute, unmute yourself. It's, it's uh, muted. Yeah, another great lecture. And uh, I'd just like to stress, uh, as in your last slide, it's cheaper and quicker. We're talking about how we need so many more neurosurgeons, but here's one way you can get the same result with uh, less expenditure and less time. And so you can do twice as many patients, take care of twice as many patients. So this is the sort of thing I think we need to emphasize in neurosurgery, not just trying to treat, train more neurosurgeons, but train us to be a little smarter in how we treat patients. Yes, thank you very much. The, actually, the study in uh, Europe or, or North America, the very few doctors perform such kind of reasoning operations, but uh, uh, together with several uh, famous neurosurgeons in Europe and America, uh, we have a training course uh, uh, every two years uh, to train such kind of operation, which is that the course is called Noble Art of Lesioning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Taira. Um, now we will proceed with, uh, we are getting back again to glioma surgery for the next last uh, lecture for this session. Um, Professor Yanis Ravnik, he's a senior neurosurgeon and head of department of neurosurgery in Maribor, Slovenia. And uh, he's, he will present the improvements in high-grade glioma surgery. Please, Professor Ravnik, you can proceed. Yeah, just a moment. Uh, I cannot start, uh, start screen share. Uh, we see a slide with the time in London, San Francisco. Is that your slide? No, oh, no, that's the previous one. You can, you must switch it off. Uh, please, Professor Taira, just uh, yeah, you have you have to stop your screening. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay, no, you I, can you can start now. You can. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, you can see it, I suppose. Yeah, we see the last last one, last slide. Uh -huh. Just a moment. Let's start from the beginning. Yeah, yeah. Okay, better. Can you see it? We just see this last uh, last slide. We don't see the full screen of the first slide of the presentation. No, it should be. Because I see. Maybe you can try to refresh or start screen sharing again. Okay. Oh, now, now it's, 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 it's the first slide. Yeah, it's, you know, it's the first slide. slide. Yes. And now it's also the first slide. Yes, it's first slide. And now the second. No, no it's still first slide. As Maybe I, said. I just go like, I just go like this, okay. Okay. And this this is go, it, it, it yeah, goes it works. further. It goes okay, further. it works. So anyway, thank you for the invitation. I would like to thank organizers, especially for having the ability to talk. Um, I have one of the glioma subjects. I sort of um, meant to present on overall improvements, especially in our departments. I come from Maribor. I was trained in Ljubljana by a, a more famous neurosurgeon. But I, um, then I moved to a small, uh, smaller center and so we are a sort of a low volume center. We still do like 50 glioma surgeries per year and uh, only two specialists are doing them, me and the uh, younger guy. Um, and I would just like to 
perhaps highlight some of the improvements that we've made in the recent years regarding the high-grade glioma resection. Uh, so the main stream of treatment is still surgery, uh, then usually followed by both chemo and radiotherapy, and then you have other uh, modalities. Um, the treatments, this is basically how it looks now in the hour of operation theaters. It's, since we're much more equipped now than we were before, but you can do biopsy, partial, subtotal, total resections, gross total resection. So um, it, we do not do um, major resection for every glioma patient, especially if he's an older one and so on. Um, the maximum safe resection should be a, a golden standard for this type of surgery, I think. So to remove as much as possible while uh, preserving the quality of life without no, no, no major neurological deficits. And you, can, you must uh, consider the age, the performance of the patient, the comorbidities, the histological type, which predicts the diagnosis, the other treatments that will follow. Um, so those are the factors that I think that are all important. So proper patient selection, which I already mentioned, uh, pre and post operative diagnostics, which was also already measured in the extent by Professor Kondo, uh, proper surgeon who should be familiar with glioma resection on a regular basis. And then you need the proper equipment, anesthesiology, neurocare, monitoring. And I would like to say a few words at the end about the awake craniotomy, which we do more frequently now. Um, so that I mentioned already, you must, I mean, a major surgery is not suited for everybody and especially not for the patient that has severe comorbidities that have a highly malignant extended disease and a limited period of survival. Um, those are the usual pre and inter and post operative diagnostics. Unfortunately, we don't have the intraoperative MRI and uh, I think that we won't get it in a few years, but now we have a good quality ultrasound that helps us a lot. And I would show you, I would show you some pictures about it. You need a good histological analysis um, because that usually dictates either intra or uh, at least postoperatively. That dictates also the if you have a good intra, uh, intraoperative uh, histological analysis, that can possibly dictate the extent of uh, resection that you would uh, need for the patient. Um, we do functional MRI, we do functional MRI, which is at least in our institution not very accurate. You can only show some of the cortical function, especially motor and cesar, and speech to some extent. This still is a work in progress about this functional MRI. I suppose most centers can do it better. We are also improving, but still at the end, what you think about, uh, what you might get with the, with the certain glioma is that you get a, a speech area all around the tumor. So it doesn't help you much then at the end. It helps you with the site, but not uh, in the end with the, with the planning of the surgery. Um, you need a good microscope. We had a former one that was not very good. You need a microscope that uses, that has the ability of um, fluorescence uh, that show you areas of high malignancy. You must have the navigation at least for the, at least for this planning of the craniotomy and perhaps the start of the surgery. And it's nice to have some sort of intraoperative imaging. And we also have all of, kinds of instruments. We don't rely on CUSA that much in our um, institution. And the anesthesiology, which is especially important in the low volume center, it might be that the anesthesiologists are changing all the time in the operation theater. You're always the same, but the, every time you go into the operation theater, you get a different anesthesiology. And it's really difficult to, to work with people that are not familiar with, with uh, neurosurgery because they must do things to minimize brain damage, to do brain relaxation, be familiar with monitoring video, especially video awake. Then you need a good pre and especially post-operative care 
and a proper response. And then you need all sorts of equipment, which is now necessary. In the end, it's still in the hands of a neurosurgeon. And the more experience you have, the better you are. But in the glioma surgery, I still think that a young neurosurgeon can learn the proper surgery for the glioma quickly compared to some other difficult areas in the brain. Anyway, intraoperative potentials, we use them almost always. Uh, we use them to plan the safe entry area. Uh, we usually use, uh, this is the bipolar, but we also use monopolar. And for example, especially for the subcortical monitoring, we usually use the monitor at the tip of the suction. So you can basically monitor um, all the time. And it's a nice, once you used it, it's a nice tool. It's so nice that you're at least re, uh, reminded by a monitor, uh, by, a, by, a, by a person who does the new monitoring, that you need the motor area. You need the motor area. You're just more careful enough. I mean, we definitely proved the the results after the, uh, the regular use of, of MIP and SIP, especially the MIPs. Um, this is now the standard stuff. It wasn't a few years ago, at least not in our institution. You need a uh, you need a good uh, you need a good microscope, and then it's always amazing. I mean, you think you removed everything, and then it just starts to show and show and show further on. The areas of malignancy that you didn't expect to be there, you have to remove them. I mean, at least you must strive to remove them if it's possible. And this is the, we now know that even in the areas of malignancy, there can be functional tissue. That's why, that's why you need all this monitoring and everything. So this is now that we use on a daily basis, basically. This is a, a one, this is a, a great three glioma. It's not a low grade. Um, it's also uh, interesting to see how many non-enhancing tumor actually enhanced by uh, fluorescence, by FIFA-LA. Um, and this is one of the cases. And this, we did it in a wake uh, setting. We usually do in a wake setting those types of tumors. And you can follow the resection by the ultrasound. And here you can clearly see that we didn't remove the, the whole tumor, but we had to stop because the, 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 the deficits of the speech were quite obvious and we had to stop. We, didn't, we couldn't go further without further damaging the person. And then you have options. You either put them on treatment, you either wait, you either do a, an fMRI a few weeks or uh, months uh, afterwards, and then you see what happens with the speech area. And then you can go further on. We do now two or three settings for some surgeries for the glioma. And yes, we do awake. Um, I think once you start to do awake surgery, it's just a, a, such a strong tool during the operation. It's just as uh, um, 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 you can monitor so much. You can be so much confident that you won't harm the patient that you just start to use them for many cases that you usually wouldn't. So um, not only speech, you can locate different cognitive functions. Um, and those are the contraindications, the rejection of incooperative patients and so on. But in my experience, I would say most of the patients are actually suitable. We just we sort of become more famous now in Slovenia with the awake, and many patients are now coming that want to be operated awake. Actually, so we rarely reject patients that wants to be operated awake. That's one thing, and we we rarely see patients that are not proper children, perhaps, and very old patients, very incooperative patients with panic attacks and so on. And then you have a combination of local and general anesthesia. We do skull blocks. And then you have different um, types of anesthesiology during the awake settings. We do a sleep awake sleep. So actually, this is quite comfortable for the patient because he's asleep during the 
most time of surgery. You don't need to have him awake during all the awake. You sometimes it's just enough to to map a certain area where you would enter, um, and then you you just put him to sleep again. Um, this is uh, we've started. The, this is four or five years ago that we started. We've we've been doing sky blocks ourselves at the at the beginning, but now we are leaving that to anesthesiology. So this is I, I, I'll skip then uh, this uh, video. But um, so anyway, it's once you used to do awake, it's very easy. It's very quick to get a, a proper setup, and then this is the the craniotomy that you did just to emphasize that you if we put uh, lots of local anesthetics or everywhere, I mean, for the scar blocks, for the pins, for the incisions and so on. So this you can uh, do. But here, actually, the patient is asleep. I mean, he has a, a, a laryngeal mask. He has a laryngeal, using mostly a laryngeal mask during the sleep states. Um, and then you, you can monitor, not only in geological vital function, so on, but you can monitor speech, higher functions, motor functions, sensory functions. I mean, even if you don't have the neuromonitoring, monitoring, even if you don't have the MIPs, if you have the awake patient that's able to cooperate during some times of surgery, some periods of surgery, it's still much better. And you can, you can monitor various aspects of, uh, of, of speech. Um, and then you must be attentive to the arrest, the slurring, difficulties, understanding, poor speech, Usually we stop and then we wait. And then we put um, physiological um, um, fluid, uh, water, um, uh, nitrogen, uh, so sodium chloride, and then, and uh, which is a bit colder. And then we wait and then we see if we can proceed. Sometimes we can, sometimes you not. There are many, in many cases, there is only a, a partial um, uh, rest, uh, uh, function gains after several minutes and so on. So th those are those cases that we nowadays usually do young patients. This is a great three again. There is a slight enhancement, but actually um, this is a, this is another patient. It's not a fair person, but I mean, the awake settings, once you use it, it's so used. I mean, it's so useful. You you just you just map the, the, the areas and then you can go transcortically. We don't do the transcellular approach for the insular gliomas. We did it before and then we stopped. Once we had the awake on the regular basis, we basically stopped the left insular glioma with the transcellular approach. And then you can resect and resect. I won't go much into that. And yeah, this is to emphasize in the awake setting. I mean, I, I won't say that the wake is for everybody, and that all I mean, may, most surgeries can, for the glioma should be in the awake setting. But for some, it's very useful, and we are now monitoring the other hybrid functions, attention, executive functions. You can do a simple tests um, via the the tablet computer, and the patient can cooperate with a simple test, and you can monitor some of the functions. Uh, so we have simplified versions of the tests. Uh, we also do awake in this <laughs> in the uh, situation like this, where you can speech areas of the fMRI on both sides. Again, with the great three glioma, we have most many of them where we can try to resect as much as possible. And this is again, this is the the right sided, the right sided, and yes, there was a, a speech on the right side. You cannot, I mean, at least in our institution, you cannot show it properly by the FMRI. You need a, a novel question. By the way, this is this is now a tip. Uh, this is a monopolar. A monopolar usually stimulates a much greater area than the bipolar. So, and then you go further and then you do uh, uh, fluorescence during the operations and the patient is still able to cooperate. We, we did a, a nice surgery with this patient uh, with both insular gliomas, actually. Those are the complications during the, um, during the awake setting. You need a good anesthesiologist. 
uh, that's the key point because the respiratory depression is, is frequent, but in the proper anesthesiologist, this is completely unproblematic. Uh, seizures are frequent, but you can stop them either with uh, um, cold water or with the, with the um, anti-epileptics. Um, so we, we rarely stop the awake once we start it. I mean, we usually get from the awake surgery what we want. Um, and then the advantages are quite obvious for me. So you can just directly observe the function. You have the awake patient and everything is under control. You can, uh, you can do a safer resection at the end. So uh, at least in our institution, the result of high rate glioma changed much and it's influenced by many factors. Some of them you perhaps you who come from the major centers would not notice, but I do especially the anesthesiological part. And then to improve the result is to improve as many factors as possible. And you, you must be attendant to every kind of thing that it needs to be developed and you need a constant development. Thank you. We can go back now. Thank you, um, Professor Raunik for a great lecture. I would kindly ask uh, Professor Omer Hodzic to um, give a comment. Thank you, Adi. Uh, hi, Ravnik. Good to see you again. Uh, just, to, just to mention, thank you for, for uh, uh, accepting the invitation to give us a lecture today. Uh, sure. Just to mention that uh, I spent a very nice time with Professor Ravnik almost 20 years ago in Ljubljana as the fellow yeah, of much Professor <laughs> as the fellows of Professor Dolenz, that was the great time. And I know him, I know uh, Professor Ravnik as the skull-based guy, not uh, a glioma surgery. <laughs> but I, I'm, I, I'm really surprised today that he's he's doing very well, the gliomas. Uh, thank you, thank you. Yannis, just Just one question. What do you think about the, the immunochemistry? Is it, is it help us with the glioma surgery? I mean, pathological exam, uh, findings uh, uh, during the surgery samples uh, can can we can they help us pathologists or later on with uh, for the uh, uh, re reoperation uh, as uh, when when we get the final findings and also what about the supra total resection and uh, this eloquent areas is not possible. Yeah, Always, the human yeah. Hem chemistry helps. Now, um, all other glioma um, tumors are now sent to one center only in Ljubljana, and that is in Ljubljana. And they do mm -hmm. all the biochemistry, all the molecular diagnostics, um, all the mutations. And it helps not only the surgeon, I would say, but the, the oncologist who follows the patients and in order how to follow and how frequently uh, the, um, the oncologist should make the follow-up pictures. And we have a good cooperation with the oncologist. We are constantly communicating with them. And once there's a um, recurrence in a patient that is capable of another surgery, we usually operate it. So in that way, I think, all the additional pathological diagnostics is helpful. To, 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 to have as a prognostic factor and then to be more attentive in some in cases. But generally speaking, for a surgeon itself, for performing surgery, not. Because you, you, do, you do get the, the results of the immunochemistry quite late. For, for the surgeon, I think it's, it's <laughs> sometimes it's quite important to know if it's a high grade or low grade glioma surgery. And that's what everybody can tell you. And sometimes you have an older patient with a high grade glioma in the um, risky area, you just stop. But with a low grade, perhaps you would go further. And so on, that's uh, a decision that you must make during surgery. But just to follow the patient as a surgeon, I would, I would say no, it doesn't help you, but it helps the patient. It helps the patient. So the second thing um, about the supratotal resection, yes, when it's possible, we do it regularly with the metastasis. 
um, especially in areas like cerebellum, uh, quite uh, frontal polar, temporal polar regions, especially on the right side. And we do it when it's possible. I think it's a good thing to do it in a glioma surgery. But in my experience, it happens early. It rarely happens that you can remove much more than the tumor itself in the glioma surgery. But if you, can, if, if, if you, you need, and then you need at least some, a good, a good um, neural monitoring, especially the MIPs and MIPs um, uh, subcortical monitoring, because you must be very careful with the, with the supraturtal section, not to damage the patient, just to, it, um, we've seen more results about the supraturtal resection uh, with the uh, metastatic surgeries, not with the glioma surgeries. Okay. Yeah, I agree. Thank you. Good. Uh, Adi. Any other any other questions? Okay. Can, then can can uh, I have a comment? Yes, please, please, Professor uh, Horsella. Uh, 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 thank you for your great presentation. I actually, I'm not a glioma surgeon, but uh, I understand the monitoring is really important to secure the safety of the glioma surgery, uh, and uh, it's. Uh, I think the monitoring of the motor uh, function or sensory function, such as uh, SEP or VEP, are really uh, easy to perform and in a short, quick of time. But it sounds like a little difficult to uh, monitor the higher brain function. So uh, it, it takes a lot of time to assess the higher brain function, such as the executive function, or, um, uh, such as uh, memory or attention. So how, how many times do you uh, perform the monitor the brain, higher brain function in a one-time surgery? Um, once you have the, okay, first of all, the, about the monitoring of higher brain functions, you, you, you do not, I'm a psychologist besides myself, and I'm quite familiar with the psychological testing. During the awake surgery, you don't do tests like in the normal psychological testing you have a, a very simplified versions of the test. For example, you have a strip test that's just naming, um, uh, not reading words, but naming colors, for example. And this is quite a simple test or trail making test. We can just connect one, two, three, four on the tablet computer. And you can do it, I mean, every 10, 15 minutes once you are there, every five minutes if you want to. Um, but, um, in the awake setting, after two to three hours of awake surgery, that the patient is awake, it usually gets too tired to cooperate properly. So you, for the um, monitoring of the higher brain functions, we still are quite limited. We are limited to simplified tests on the tablet computers. And that's why we use it quite early with a very high patient in an area that, it, that it, he needs um, for his job or so on, and he must be, uh, he must want it very, he must be able to cooperate for hours. It's, it's unsuitable for most of the patients actually. So we do it sadly, but once you can do it, you, might, you just need the simplified versions of the test on the tablet computer. You have to program it because they are not available usually. Me, and, I have a colleague that's a computer an expert and she did, she, she's actually a few months. She, she also monitors patients and she did the uh, simplified versions of the test for, for monitoring hybrid functions. And this is what you can use. But it's in reality, it's just an approximation. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? Okay, I believe we are on time. This should be the part of discussion. So uh, are there any other questions from previous session that maybe you didn't ask or maybe a comment? Okay, uh, then we should move to the next session, uh, which will be uh, moderated by Professor Ibrahim Omerhojic. Uh, I don't see here, next speaker should be Professor Yoshida, but uh, probably he's still not connected. Do we have Dr. Almir? Dr. Almir, just let me promote you. Just a second, please. 
Dr. Almir Jurlic, he is our uh, neurosurgeon from the Department of Neurosurgery Clinical Center of University in Sarajevo. As I already mentioned, he is uh, interested in glioma surgery, but also in other tumors, and he he's works in his PhD thesis in IDH mutations uh, in gliomas. So, for any question about uh, an issue, you can you can actually ask Dr. Almir Jurlic. Uh, Almir, we are waiting for you. You are promoted as a panelist, so you can start. Also, while we are waiting, I would kindly ask other um, attendees from um, uh, this following session. I'm going to promote you now uh, if we have delay of some of the speakers. Uh, so we could actually, please, I would kind of ask you to be prepared for your following lecture. So here we have Dr. Okay, Abdul Nadi, Jirlich. thank you, you very start. much. You're welcome. Uh, let me share my screen. So can you uh, can you see my presentation? Uh, no, mm, not yet. We don't see it yet. Yeah, we we see it. Just to go for the full screen. Uh, okay, I just uh, make a full screen. Can you see now the full screen? Presentation? Yes, we do. Okay, thank you very much again. I'm very happy to be part of this great webinar. Thank you, Professor Kato, Professor Ibrahim, and Dr. Adi. So I will talk about the minimal invasive microsurgery for the supratentorial brain tumors. So the concept of minimal invasive microsurgery is the concept of the safety removing brain tumors through the smaller, more precise opening that minimize collateral damage to the surrounding scalp, brain, blood vessels, and, and nerves. So what are the potential, potential advantages of the keyhole surgery? So it's sm smaller incision and bony openings, less exposure to the normal brain structures, no use of the brain retraction with less manipulation of the brain itself, we usually use the dynamic retraction with the suction, uh, less pain and lower need for the narcotics, rapid recovery, mobilization, and return to the normal activities. And usually discharge from the hospital typically within three to four or five days post-surgery. Uh, I didn't mention here some poten potential disadvantages, but there are some disadvantages, especially in the glioma surgery. We had a great, great, great lecture from the uh, glioma professor Koto of uh, Congo. And uh, if we need some, some uh, mapping of the brain, we in that cases, we need some uh, wide exposure. So this minimal invasive craniotomy in the, some surgery of the glioma uh, requiring the, some uh, brain mapping. So it's some potential dis disadvantages. So Professor Sami mentioned after the 50 years of, of his experience that the simple, simpler makes it safer. So less extensive, unnecessary approaches with uh, less complications. So what is the learning curve? More simple approach. It's less risk of morbidity and give us the best available results. So what are the principles of the keyhole surgery? So first is the positioning, maybe one of the most important step at the beginning, then trajectory. So usually we use trajectories along the long axis of the tumor. And of course, utilization of the technology, instrumentation, navigation, endoscopy, and the mapping softwares. So this is the principle of the craniotomy from the great book of, of Professor Tio. So here is a, the explanation of the in some deep-seated tumor, we don't need some huge wide craniotomies. It's enough to make a small craniotomies and then we can reach deep-seated tumor by changing the angles of the microscope 
and special utilization of some different tools such as endoscope, so we can reach different angles with the small openings. But in case of the superficial tumor, we cannot perform the small craniotomy in the superficial tumor. So the principle of the craniotomy is to make, we should expose the whole tumor in the convexity of the brain. So craniotomy in the superficial tumor should be wide enough to expose the most uh, superficial part. So what is the two point concept for this uh, type of the craniotomies and exposure? So we mark the deepest part of the tumor and the most superficial part of the, of the tumor. And then we draw the line which connects these two uh, dots. And this line showed us trajectory along the long axis. So the best approach is the along the long axis of the tumor. And this long axis should be perpendicular to the floor. Why is I will show you for in some cases, because in, if the long axis is, is per per perpendicular to the floor, then we avoid some brain going into the surgical field. There is some exec exceptions, especially if that line guide us through the some elephant cortex, especially in some uh, motor area such as or, or Broca area. In that case, we cannot use these principles along the long axis, then we use some other trajectory. And in that case, we use some different tools like endoscope to, to, to have a good vis uh, visualization. So I will show you some cases about some deep seated tumor, some convexity tumor and some tumor of the skull base. So what are the R principles? This is the interventricular meningioma. So here we, you can see we use this trajectory along the long axis of the tumor. And we put the head patient is the, in the prone and we turn a little bit head in the right. So as I told you before, so these trajectories should be, should be perpendicular to the tumor. So in that case, in the small craniotomy, we avoid some brain going in, in the, because sometimes we struggling with the brain going in, in the, in the uh, operative field. So in that case, we avoid, in, uh, avoid that, that potential uh, complication. Again, the example of the deep metastasis. So again, we try to avoid, this is left side to avoid the vernix area. So we go a little bit posterior. And then in this case, in this case you can see we make a small craniotomy about three centimeter wide. And then usually in these cases, we, we go through the intraparietal sulcus and then reach the deep, deep part of, of, of the tumor. This is the case of superficial metastasis. So here you can see there is a presentation on the cortex. In that case, we should make a craniotomy wide enough to expose this superficial part of the tumor. Like here, and you can see the post-op CT. So craniotomy is wide enough. In that case, we cannot perform the small craniotomy, and then we will struggle with uh, finding the, the, this part below the bone. In the intraventricular tumor, we usually use this technique. We put the head parallel to the floor, and we make the two type of incision, sometimes perpendicular or parallel to the sagittal sinus. And by putting the head par parallel to the floor, we allow uh, gravity to little bit put the brain and give us the extra space. And we think in, in this position, also the hands of the surgeon are more comfortable in, the, in this position. So gravity allows us to reach, to go into interhemispheric approach, reach corpus callosum, and then open the ventricle and, and resect the, the tumor. This is the glioblastoma patient. I told you before the gliomas are not the best candidate for this minimal invasive opening, minimal invasive surgeries, because sometimes we need some big, bigger exposure, some wide craniotomies, but there are also some cases where we can use smaller incisions, smaller craniotomy, especially if, if deep seated tumor, if there is no cortical presentation, and if, if we, not, we don't need some, some mapping. So this is the patient of the glioblastoma young patient. So you can see the trajectory, it's posterior to the uh, motor cortex along the long axis again. 
we always try when we can to use the gravity to relieve the, the, the brain to, to help us to go in the in the to reach the interhemispheric um, fissure and to perform the approach. So you can see here the craniotomy is, is wide enough to just to expose the superficial part and then deeper part we reach by changing the, the angle of the microscope and using the, the endoscope and so on. Of course, still there are cases where we need a huge opening, uh, huge craniotomy, such as convexity meningioma. So like here, there is the giant meningioma in this type of meningioma. We usually use, if we can, some linear incision instead of some uh, flaps. But of course, in that case, in these cases, we, we should to, to perform the huge craniotomies bigger, even bigger than, it, than, than the tumor itself on the convexity, because usually we, we need to resect also the dura to find the, the, the edge of the tumor and resect the, the involved dura. So still there is, of course, surgeries, tumors, which require the huge wide craniotomies. So looking in the skull base approaches, especially in the anterior and some middle fossa, uh, tumors, we use, we use usually these three types of approach for the most tumors of the anterior fossa. First is the lateral supraorbital approach introduced by the professor Hermes Niemi. So we organize a couple of different uh, courses with the professor Hermes Niemi in Sarajevo. So the indication for the lateral supraorbital approach in our institutions are usually the tumors of the anterior cranial fossa, cell, especially cellar and paracellar region, and the anterior circulation aneurysm, except dike aneurysm. So you can see that the principle of the lateral supraorbital approach, incision, craniotomy, also, for some smaller tumor, we use the eyebrow approach. This is the small tumor, but, but showed progression of the control MRI in the young patient. So that was indication for the, for the surgery, progression of the MRI. So in the, the eyebrow approach, we make craniotomy about three centimeters in, in diameter. Of course, we, we release the CSF from the cistern. So even in this small approach, you can see we can make a, a space with the brain relaxation by releasing the, the CSF. And this is the patient uh, after the surgery. A mini perioneal approach for indications for the mini perioneal approach are the some tumor specially especially lateral to the clinoid involving the sphenoid ridge, the temporal, middle temporal region, temporal apical region, and so on. So these are indication for the mini perioneal approach. And uh, our technique for mini perioneal approach is that we make the incision in the front of the ear, in the hairline. Sometimes if we need to extend the incision, then we extend the incision the, in the wrinkle of the forehead. So it's invisible scar. We make the curlinear incision and uh, also we open the fascia of the muscle in the same way like we open the skin. So there is some advantages that we found for, for this type of the opening. So we open the fascia parallel to the skin incision. And then we don't cut the muscle, temporal muscle, then we just dissect the muscle in the parallel to the fibers of the muscle. So we open the in different type uh, in uh, fascia and dissection of the uh, temporal muscle. So here you can see after opening the fascia, then we dissect muscle parallel and we just then retract the muscle and, and expose the bone. Uh, what are the advantages of this type of approach? We found it's uh, less uh, temporal muscle atrophy in that type of, of opening. And it's, it's better for the cosmetic, cosmetic results. So of course we make one burr hole, then craniotomy. And usually after the craniotomy, we perform the drilling of the Svanid ridge to make the early devascularization of the tumor and also coagulation of the dura. In the opening, you can see it, we expose the, the temporal and the 
frontal lobe. There are some variation if we need little bit exposure. So the tumor, if the tumor is located, for example, more temporal, sometimes we need to make a little bit more temporal extension instead of, of, the, of, the, of the frontal. So this is post-op, usually craniotomy is around three to 3.5 centimeters in long. This is the uh, post-op patient and, and CT. So we are the beginners in, in this field, but we are trying step by step without pushing anything, without making some, some indication if, if they are not for this type of approaches. So in, there is a total of 20, 221 patients underwent uh, keyhole surgery in the last six years in our institution. There is no sig significant difference in outcome and morbidity compared with the, the classic opening. Four patients uh, had small local infection. Two of them required a, a wound revision. Intraoperative extension uh, craniotomy was needed for three patients. And we registered a significant time reduction of opening and closing faster mobilization of patients, shorter hospitalization, less post-operative pain and better cosmetic results. So this uh, three extension, it was in our beginnings. Usually we, we perform the navigation in every patient because we need a precise mark of the craniotomy of the opening in this small approach. It's, 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 it's uh, crucial to make a good planning before the surgery to planning the craniotomy. It was one patient of the, I think of the, um, the meningioma where we need some little bit extension to reach the part of meningioma. Uh, there is some tips for, for extension without opening some extra, extra craniotomy. For example, sometimes we, we drill the inner table of the bone if we need some little bit of extension and wider exposure. So what is our conclusion? Then our practice is to use a linear incision with small craniotomies in many cases, and this utilization of this, this technique with this linear incision and then small craniotomy significantly progressed, but it's, it's going step by step over classic approach from the almost 30.4% uh, in 2009 and now in, in almost 70% in two, uh, 2022. So usually we route, uh, we use the different route, transalkal or transcortical approach, depending on the type of the tumor size and site of, of the lesion. And thank you very much for, for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Jurlic, for excellent presentation, great results, and the series which you showed. It's, we can say, uh, impressive. So, um, Dr. Professor Amir Hodjic is there, so maybe uh, he can give us a comment about the lecture. Uh, thank you, Adi. Thank you, Dr. Jurlic, uh, my great guys from my department. Uh, uh, if there ends, if there is any uh, question from audience, I would ask the colleagues before I comment on his presentation. Maybe any question. However, uh, I would like to thank you, Dr. Almir, for your uh, nice, nice presentation and show us how and how you are going. Uh, 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 we are trying to support our, uh, our neurosurgeons from our region. This webinar is also the, the, the chance for that. Uh, but also uh, 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 we see that those, those efforts we are all doing together give us results. And every day we see the improvement of neurosurgical skis in the in, uh, uh, Balkan region. I would like, uh, I don't like to say too much about the Almir as a great uh, young, young neurosurgeon. I would like reader uh, thanks to Professor Kato for her support for all young neurosurgeons in the region. Also Adi, which he was 
uh, Professor Kato as fellow also, uh, and also Dr. Jurlich been in Japan on training also in China and so. Uh, 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 but uh, thank you, I would like to say thank you, Professor Kato, uh, for your uh, uh, grant, your, your, your uh, financial support for young neurosurgeons in, in my region, and Dr. Jurlich and Dr. Adi are the persons who get some money from your foundation. So as you see, they are growing up every day very fast, and I'm proud of them. And thank you. Thank you once again, not only you, but Japanese Neurosurgical Society, ACNS, and all the professors here who share their knowledge and their experience with, with my people. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ibrahim. So just I want to ask uh, uh, Dr. Almil, so it was a nice presentation. So maybe I think in the future, I think uh, that your region should have some endoscopic treatments. So the concept of the endoscopic treatment is totally different. Maybe some of the classical one, even the, not on the smaller. I think maybe some uh, uh, the place of the incision and the, and the size. And I think uh, uh, if once you have a chance to come to Japan, maybe with uh, lots of the endoscopic the, uh, excellent neurosurgeon here. So maybe you should discuss with uh, your boss. Anyway, congratulations, you have a nice lecture. Okay, thank you, Professor Kato, once once again for supporting us in, in, in every field and in, in, in every every type of, of support. Uh, so of course I mentioned it's it's uh, impossible to make this this type of surgery without some additional visualization tools, and the endoscope is one of the most important tools for, for the of this type of surgery. We have some, like in, 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 in some tools, additional to our microscope, such as uh, uh, Kievo visualization. Uh, so there is, but unfortunately we don't have the, the good micro endoscope. We have one older endoscope, and sometimes we try to use them, but of course we, we need the, the, the new type of endoscope. And in that case, I think we will even more improve this type of surgeries and, and uh, to make patients safer and, and sur surgeries with, with uh, less complications. So as I mentioned, it's, in, it's very important to include endoscope, endoscope assisted uh, surgeries, not only for the tumors, also for the, for the aneurysms and then the uh, skull base approaches surgery. So it's in nowadays, it's almost impossible to make this small opening, small surgeries without uh, endoscope and these additional tools that help us to, to better visualization. Thank you. Thank, you, thank you very much. Adi? Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you once more, Professor Kato, for your support. As Professor Momerhoj mentioned, uh, Grant, which actually uh, you with your ACNS Foundation have donated to our society uh, was shared between uh, many of us young neurosurgeons for our development and the research work. So we are very thankful to you because you are uh, our great found founder and also a supporter. Uh, and we hope so that we will go on and that we will make you proud and honor your name as we already did. Uh, I will kindly ask next, pro next speaker. If there are no questions, of course, we didn't ask for other presenters. Are there any questions? Okay, then we can uh, move forward. Uh, we have Professor Kazumichi Yoshida, Associate Professor, Department of Neurosurgery, Kyoto University, Graduate, Graduate School of Medicine, Kyoto, Japan, with a proper surgical approach to reduce ischemic complication for MCA aneurysm with short M1 segment. So please, Professor Yoshida, uh, we are very happy to have you here. Thank you, Professor Adi. And excuse me, I couldn't enter Zoom in, in time due to some trouble. So first, I would like to show my deep appreciation to Professor Kato for give me, giving me a chance to present my work in this fourth ACNS webinar. I prepared uh, the, uh, my presentation uh, of, of movie. So could you share the screen? Uh, oh, OK. Uh, Yes, you can, please. Yeah, okay. we, we don't see it yet, but... So uh, I'd like uh, to start we... my presentation. 
please. We see it, great. Uh, Professor Ishida, uh, if you don't hear. Yes. Do we see the slides, but not your speech? There is no audio. No audio, oh, sorry. Oh. So please turn on the audio and you can start from beginning. Okay, it, um, audio. Uh, so, okay, yeah. excuse me. Nick, especially. Hello, doctors in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Okay. I'm Dr. Yoshida from Kyoto, Japan. It's okay now. First, I'm really happy to participate in Bosnia Herzegovina webinar 2023. I'd like to show my deep appreciation for Professor Kato to give me a chance to present my work about cerebral vascular surgery. I'm now associate professor of Kyoto University Graduate School of Medicine. Kyoto is an old city. This special four seasons in Kyoto. In spring, we can enjoy arcades of cherry trees in full blooms. And in summer, this is an historical summer festival continuing more than 1,000 years. In autumn, old temples are decorated with autumn colored leaves. And this is Kinkakuji Temple, the golden pavilion covered with snow. Anyway, I'm looking forward to have a chance to see doctors in Bosnia and Herzegovina in the near future in person. Today, I'd like to talk about surgical technique, especially for middle cerebral artery aneurysm. The title of my topic is Proper Surgical Approach to Reduce Ischemic Complication for MCA Aneurysm with Short M1 Segment. Endovascular surgery has been recently gaining popularity, and endovascular coiling is replacing surgical clipping and the treatment of cerebral aneurysms. However, clipping is still superior to coiling for MCA aneurysm, probably due to its unique shape and its easy surgically accessible location. This article is published by Dr. Smith. They conducted a systemic review and meta-analysis. They compared the efficacy and safety of endovascular coiling versus microsurgical clipping for unruptured MCA aneurysms. They conclude that compared with coiling, microsurgical clipping yields a higher aneurysm obliteration rate with slightly lower short-term unfavorable functional outcomes and they recommended surgical clipping for unruptured MCA aneurysms. Therefore, the opportunity of clipping for MCA aneurysm will relatively increase for direct aneurysm surgeon. This is a basic technique for safe clipping of MCA aneurysm. First, wide opening of the Sylvian fissure, then dissect M1 and M2 segment to prepare temporarily trapping in case of intraoperative rupture. After dissection of the neck, tentative clipping is now available whatever happens. Then go to dissection of the dome. As shown in this photo, cerebral veins such as common vertical trunk often adhere to the dome of MCA aneurysm. After dissection of aneurysm neck and dome, neck clipping is performed and confirm the absence of dome filling by ICG video angiography. Ischemic complication due to perforator injury sometimes leads to serious complications. In the clipping of MCA aneurysm, the relationship between the site of temporary clipping and the lateral straight arteries, LSAs, is very important especially for MCA aneurysm with short M1 segment. Temporary clipping at the distal M1 segment carries a high risk for LSA's ischemia 
because the distance between area C and M1, M2 bifurcation is short, or area C sometimes branch from proximal M2 or behind the neck of the aneurysm. This is a case of terminal infarction after temporary creep application at distal limb segment. The patient is a 50 years old male, and pre-operative CT angiogram showed a right side MCA aneurysm with short M1 segment. In the coronal view, aneurysm is located medial to Lyman insulae. Temporary clip was applied to distal M1 segment to facilitate neck clipping by reducing the tension of the dome. However, a few minutes after temporary clipping, the amplitude of MEP monitoring began to decrease, then temporary clip was removed. Fortunately, the patient didn't show any neurological sign after surgery, but the post-operative diffusion-weighted image demonstrated acute terminal infarction. As there has been no strict definition of short M1 segment, in this presentation, short M1 segment is defined as a case whose M1 M2 bifurcation or the neck of the aneurysm is located medial to Lyman insulae. This slide shows my proposal for different approach for safe clipping of MCA aneurysm. In patients with long M1 segment, Short dissection of distal cerebellum fissure is sufficient as temporary clip can be applied at the distal M1 segment. On the other hand, in patients with short M1 segment, long dissection of cerebellum fissure is essential as proper size of temporary clip are A1 segment of anterior cerebral artery and internal carotid artery. I will show operative video in cases with long M1 segment and short M1 segment respectively. Case 1 is right MCA aneurysm with long M1 segment. Preoperative enhanced CT demonstrates the aneurysm is located lateral to Lyman insulae. This is an operative video of right MCA aneurysm with long M1 segment. Right frontotemporal craniotomy was performed. Now this cerebellum fissure is sharply dissecting. And now you can see the M2 superior trunk and this is the aneurysm dome, M2 superior trunk and this yellowish atherosclerotic inferior trunk. These vessels are sharply dissected. So now you can see the distal M1 portion and now simulating temporary clip application. And then start dissecting aneurysm neck. When cerebral vein adheres tightly to the dome of the neck, Meticulous sharp dissection with micro knife or micro scissors is essential technique. Now complete aneurysm dissection. And the creeping was performed with multiple curved creep. and complete clipping at no dome filling was confirmed with ICG video angiography. Diffusion weighted imaging obtained POD1 show no acute infarct and CT angiograms demonstrate complete neck clipping. Case 2 is MCA aneurysm with short M1 segment and the right side MCA aneurysm with maximum diameter of 7 mm is shown in 
and enhanced coronal CT demonstrate aneurysm located medial to Lyman injury. This is operative video of short M1 case. Somewhat large front temporal craniotomy was performed to facilitate subdural electrode insertion for MEP monitoring. And start Shibrian fissure dissection from distal to proximal. And preserve many small veins as far as possible by sharp dissection. Now you can see internal carotid artery and optic nerve. Now simulating temporary clip application at internal carotid artery. Then start the dissection of the aneurysm dome or aneurysm neck. And you can see multiple areas A's branch from distal M1 portion. This is inferior trunk, M2 portion inferior trunk. And now protecting areas A's by surgical cotinoid. This is A1 and ICA. In this case, temporary clip was were used to facilitate neck clipping by reducing tension of aneurysm dome. During the tem temporary clipping, MEP monitoring demonstrates no significant change. And now clipping was performed with L-shaped clip. Then uh, additional L-shaped clip was applied face to face. Now confirming the complete neck gripping. And finally, no dome ring was confirmed by ICG video angiography. Also, you can see a good blood flow of RSAs. Post-operative diffusion weighted images show no significant... Uh, so, depending on the length of the M1 segment, Proper site for proximal control is essential for reducing the risk of perforator injury. In patients with long M1 segment, short Sylvian dissection is sufficient because the temporary clip can be safely applied at the distal M1 portion. But in patients with short M1 segment, long Sylvian dissection is essential because the proper site of temporary clip is ACA A1 portion and internal carotid artery. So short Sylvian approach for long M1 segment and long Sylvian approach for short M1 segment. This is, my, this is my message of this presentation. This photo is a garden of an old temple nearby Kyoto University Hospital in November. Last three years, face-to-face -face communication was restricted by COVID-19 pandemic. 
But now I'm looking forward to having a chance of talking with you, friends of Bosnia and Herzegovina, in the near future. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Ishida. You. Yes. Very nice video, very good technique. And excuse me again for some editorial error in my slide. No, 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 that's, 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 that's very nice. And uh, good to see those uh, uh, precise technique, very slow and clear, completely clear surgery. Uh, thank you. Uh, is there any question for Dr. Yoshida from the audience? Professor Kato, would you like to comment? Yes, yes thank you very much, yes, please. Uh, Professor Yoshida. Oh, yes, so thank we, you. Before we may, maybe add Neil, please, you can go ahead. Thank you, Professor Kato. Uh, thank you, Professor Yoshida, for your excellent presentation. Uh, first, I just, want, I just want to comment that uh, I'm very impressed about the, the Japanese technique. It's like a, some special technique for, for the dissection of the, especially in these vascular cases for the Syrian fissure, fissure dissection, your sharp dissection in the, in the fissure and around the aneurysms. It's, it's so clear, so, so excellent that, that, that I'm impressed, impressed by, by your technique. And my question is, uh, uh, for how long we are safe I mean, in the, for the time, meaning how long time for the temporary uh, proximal control of the of the uh, in the in the uh, surgery of the aneurysms. I mean, in 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 a minutes. For what do you think? Um, uh, I use MEP monitoring and the short MM cases, and I depend on the MEP monitoring. But uh, in in the general situation in aneurysm creeping. I think that five minutes is a maximum duration for safe temporary creeping. But it okay, depends on the collateral flow in the intracranial arteries and so on. Thank you very much. Usually we use also this five minutes, but according to literature, there is some, uh, some also data that's even sometimes it's, it's possible even longer, but usually we use that also five minutes as like a maximum for the, for the proximal control. Okay, but thank you very much. As I, uh, but as shown in my presentation, the perforator injuries are very um, uh, um, occur as as soon as you apply the temporary creeping. So, um, okay, it's a very essential to uh, reduce the injury for perforator injury. I see. Thank you very much. Thank you for your kind comment. Thank you, Professor Kato. Thank you very much for an excellent lecture, uh, Yoshida Sensei, as always. <laughs> so the, in Kyoto University, the, the endovascular treatment is very strong, as well as uh, the open surgery. So how would you like to, to make uh, some uh, indication in between the endovascular and the open surgery, especially the MCA? So and I discussed uh, in, in case with uh, endovascular surgeon, chief of the endovascular surgeon, Dr. Ishii, and but uh, actually, for the MC aneurysm, um, over 90 or 90% 90 of the patients were treated by direct creeping. So, MC aneurysm, in the vascular surgery for MC aneurysm, it's very restricted cases. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any other question? Thank you, Professor Yoshida. Thank you. Uh, we, I hope you will enjoy with the rest of the webinar. And now uh, we are moving to Italy to our uh, professor and friend, uh, Maurizio Iacoangeli from Ancona. He will talk about the correlation of extracapsular surgical resection of the volumetric property of MR in order to maximize the resection and minimize complication in the neuro monitoring era. Professor Jaco Angeli, you are here, I see. So, okay. panel. And... Thank, thank you, Ibrahim, and thank you to uh, Yoko for the kind uh, invitation. And uh, I, unfortunately, I'm not in Ancona. I'm uh, at the North American Skull Base meeting uh, in Tampa, in Florida. So, <laughs> 
Um, I have a, a meeting uh, in a few minutes. So I thank you and um, uh, for this opportunity. And I encourage you always. I know uh, Yoko from many years, uh, and she is always devoted to this uh, high level educational activity S since uh, really many, many years ago with Professor Carno. So I encourage uh, uh, her and you to continue these um, uh, activities, even uh, uh, beyond the COVID, hopefully in presence, but uh, the web seminar are still uh, a way to connect uh, all together uh, in, uh, in a few minutes. So I leave the podium uh, to my collaborator that uh, uh, give uh, uh, this lecture. And uh, I thank you for uh, your uh, invitation and consideration. Bye. Thank you. Ciao. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, for the Alessio, yeah? I'm Denis Ayudi, a collaborator of Professor Iaco Angeli in Ancona. I share the screen. Okay, thank you very much for this uh, opportunity to speak in this prestigious uh, webinar. Uh, I'm talking about uh, nutrients in high grade uh, glioma, above all, uh, in the excellent of resection and the perineal plastic uh, pseudo plane, in order to maximize and to optimize the uh, clinical outcome uh, of patients uh, operated for high grade glioma. <laughs> The glioblastoma is the most common intraxial tumor in adults, and the median overall survival is 14 months. And despite the scientific innovation of the last year, the uh, survival and the uh, clinical outcome is almost the same in the last uh, 10 years. The most important prognostic factor is the extent of resection in the tumor, in the surgical uh, removal of the tumor. And the gross total resection is the most important prognostic factor. And this means uh, uh, over the 90% of the resection of the tumor and is related to a better prognosis. The prognosis is uh, also related to the recurrence of the tumor because uh, after six or eight uh, months uh, from the surgical uh, procedure, the recurrence occurred in almost uh, all the cases. And in uh, over 90% of the um, cases, the recurrence is the area near the primitive uh, neoplastic nodule. This is related of the characteristics of the, the tumor of because the tumor, uh, the recurrence is related to the high capacity of infiltration of it. And the, it spreads in a different ways around the neoplastic area because the tumor spreads uh, to brain issue, leptomeningeal space, wet matter tracts, and even a perivascular uh, space. As uh, in the MRI uh, scan, we can see in uh, flare sequences uh, the representing of uh, both edema and infiltrative tissue around the tumor. And uh, the gross total resection represents the very surgical goal of the uh, treatment of the kind of tumor because it allows to remove tumor and also perineoplastic infiltration uh, even without, uh, when it's possible, damaging the eloquent area around the tumor. In our cases, uh, we had uh, 80 patients in uh, four years with a diagnosis of, of glioblastoma. And for each of these patients, we um, had a neurosurgical parameter such as the tumor volume and the flare volume pre and post-op. The tumor volume was obtained uh, evaluating the contrast MRI tune uh, sequences in a sagittal coronal <coughs> and axial uh, sequence. And the flare volume was obtained considering the area of hyperintensity surrounding the tumor. So we had the four different patterns of the resection, the extent of resection, different pattern. The first pattern is the biopsy, a resection of under the 10% of the tumor. The second pattern is a subtotal resection that's uh, uh, from 10 to 89% of resection of the tumor. And the third is gross total resection 
from 90 up to 100 uh, percent resection of the uh, t1 area of the tumor but the uh, real uh, surgical goal is represented by the supra total resection that's a resection uh, even in the flare abnormality or upper intensity uh, area surrounding the tumor we demonstrate that the supra total resection has a better prognosis a better kps uh, prognosis value among the months even after the surgical uh, procedure despite the other kinds of uh, pattern and so the supra total resection uh, we demonstrate that is related to a better prognosis even in the overall survival it is important both for clinical outcome and even for the overall survival as well as the uh, progression free uh, survival and it's related to a perineoplastic uh, extracapsular uh, removal and uh, i'm uh, glad to introduce my colleague dr maurizio gladi for the next uh, speaking thank you hello to everyone and uh, thank to the for the opportunity to be here i'm uh, my name is maurizio gladi i'm assistant professor of uh, professor Jaco angeli in ancona and uh, my part um, thanks to the opportunity in particular to professor ibrahim and professor cato and uh, even in the in a constant uh, in a constant of multimodal treatment approach uh, uh, surgery still represent uh, for the glioblastoma the mainstay of treatment or treatment able to obtain a rapid neurological symptom relief uh, to provide histopathological molecular information and a low uh, safe adjuvant uh, treatment uh, and thought glioblastoma is an infiltrative disease uh, um, the typical goal of surgery is maximal safe resection obviously when possible and uh, eventually peril is another resection despite the uh, jbm is an infiltrative tumor this making an um, authentic and blocks resection infeasible uh, many neurosurgeons in the world uh, um, resect uh, glioblastoma from the center to the uh, to the periphery in uh, intralesional piecemeal fashion Thus, the difference between the resection technique, uh, perilesional and intralesional, was most profound in a short-term complication. Uh, we found uh, in our experience in the literature uh, that the perilesional resection was significantly associated uh, with a lower intraoperative blood loss, and furthermore, with a lower rate of postoperative intraparenchymal hemorrhage. We also identify uh, in angular experience, uh, to different morphological patterns during the surgical operation. Uh, in fact, uh, some tumor have a sort of pseudo plane surrounding the nodule. And uh, sorry, this is a, a video, this is an example of video of perilesional removal of glioblastoma until we can see uh, wet matter. And uh, as we can see, a block removal of the tumor. This is an example of perilesional removal. We divide in our experience uh, um, the radiological finding, findings in, uh, to, in Henry High with the T1 contrast sequences in two patterns. One pattern nodular and one pattern thin. Nodular with the thickness of the contrast enhancement component greater than 50 millimeters. And thin where the thickness of contrast enhancement peripheral component was lesser than 15 millimeters. And uh, uh, here, we, here we can see uh, two patterns, thin and nodular. Uh, we now decide that the, the cleavage plane uh, is better respected in uh, gliomas with uh, capsule thickness greater than 50 millimeters and therefore correlated with a better extension or removal and consequently better survival. In this, uh, this picture, this table, these graphics uh, uh, show uh, the significant improvement in overall survival, 13 versus uh, six months. 
but a minor improvement in progression of fish survival. And uh, there is um, some article in, in, the, in, the, in the literature, uh, published in the literature, which agree also with our experience. For example, this article, uh, where circumferential perilisional resection is associated with significant higher rate of complete resection and lower rate of neurological complication, even in the eloquent in tumor in the eloquent in the eloquent location. And the perilisional resection, when, fe when feasible, should be uh, considered a preferred option. Uh, in GBL, uh, the hyperintense area in the hemorrhage flare, uh, in the flare sequences, uh, is characterized by an equally aggressive non-enhancing non -enhancing component of the tumor. Uh, equally aggressive. This surgical strategy, uh, the removal of the fray component uh, def defined as a maximal or supratotal resection and was firstly applied to a diffuse low grade glioma. And some study uh, showed that surgical resection beyond the contrast enhancing boundaries uh, could represent a promising strategy to impact the outcome of JBM patients. Obviously, a careful patient selection, uh, availability of intraoperative monitoring. Uh, are needed in order to obtain a safe surgery with maintenance of neurological integrity. And this article uh, was reported that in relation to the amount of rare abnormality removal, the cutoff value recorded as conditioning uh, survival rate was uh, equal or superior uh, 45%. So in conclusion, take your messages. Uh, the maximal resection, extent of resection is related to a better prognosis. It, this is uh, our experience, uh, as we read in some, uh, some of the articles published in the literature. Uh, removal of surrounding perinodular area is a significant prognostic factor. And uh, another note is uh, that because the tumor is not decompression, decompressed in the perilisional. Uh, 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 regional removal during the dissection, computer assisted magic guidance is uh, well maintained throughout the, the procedure. And the tumor with nodular pattern, uh, hello, in our experience, a better surgical removal, so a better process. But uh, the surgeon uh, must, re must remember always that do no harm because uh, JBL is not a purely surgical disease. And it's important to remember that uh, increasing resection, uh, perilisional, supratotal resection, at the expense of causing a new permanent deficit, nullify all the survival benefit to the, to, 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 to the patient because uh, are needed uh, other non-surgical therapy, radiotherapy, chemotherapy. So the final decision must be well balanced between extension of removal and try to minimize potential postoperative neurological deficit. Thank you to all and thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Professor Gladi. Good to see you again. Uh, thank you for, for your presentation. Thank you for your presentation. So, uh, is there any question from the audience? Any comment? Uh, uh, I would like to ask you about the uh, reoperation during the glioma surgery. Is there any any uh, uh, pattern when you stop to reoperate patients with glioma? Is there any change you made in the last years concerning the new World Health Organization CNS tumor classification and so? So, uh, do you think that that we we still should operate the patient with glioma uh, even if they are? early in glioblastoma as the classification from 2021 said, or for example, for the people older than 70, or, or the after the one, one surgery, we should send the patient to an oncologist and stop with the surgery. Is there any experience with that? 
how, how often we should operate, reoperate the glioblastoma patient in the other but, uh, Obviously, the uh, molecular biology, uh, as, as reported, uh, especially in the new classification, will influence the, um, the, 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 the attitude of, of our surgeon to operate or non-operate. Uh, or non, or non, or non, or non um, obviously, uh, the, the most important things in my, in my opinion is the, is the, the, the couple KPS of the patients and the quality of life uh, that, uh, that the surgeon uh, can do to, to, the, to the patients. Uh, because, uh, uh, okay, uh, a good exportation of, of the lesion, but uh, uh, we also know uh, the, glio the glioblastoma prognosis. But uh, uh, a good exportation is uh, uh, um, good for the patients uh, uh, that uh, uh, after the, the, the surgery have had a, a good uh, quality of life. For uh, uh, to under underwent to the other no surgical therapy, but uh, uh, must be aware to uh, operate uh, without. Uh, uh, this is my opinion. This is the most most important things for uh, in my in my opinion. Operate uh, without uh, uh, cause uh, ne neurological deficit, even, even in the in the in the even the recurrence, obviously. That we consider, because uh, uh, if the patients uh, uh, in the postoperative uh, period uh, have a neurological symptom, neurological deficit, yeah. obviously precluded all the uh, other other treatment. Uh, the surgery alone has have no sense. Okay, thank. Uh, thank you, Doctor Raudi. I I would like to. Uh, ask uh, Dr. Nemir, Professor Nemir from Zagreb University from Croatia to give a lecture. Uh, Dr. Nemir, you are here? Yes, I'm here. Thank okay. you. Thank, thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizer, you, Ibrahim, mm -hmm. and Professor Kato for inviting me and to organize this great meeting. And uh, to all guys uh, which works with you and organize this webinar, thank you so much. And I would like also to thank the, uh, all the speakers for giving us the, such a great uh, lectures. So I will start with my uh, presentation. Please, uh, I cannot share the screen uh, because uh, they told me that uh, the other screen is shared already uh, uh, someone has to turn the uh, it uh, it uh, write me you cannot start screen share while the other participant is sharing Now, now I can. How about that? It's fine. Now it's fine. Thank you. Yes, I stop it. Yako Angelis uh, monitor. They uh, forget it. That that that's okay. You can so go on. You can go see ahead. now my screen. Yes, we see it. Please. Okay. Thank you. So my name is uh, Jakob Nemir. I come from University Hospital Center from Zagreb. Uh, I work in University Hospital, it's the biggest hospital in Croatia, and we also do the all procedure neurosurgery, uh, excepting in the radio surgery. So today I will talk about the challenges in surgery for insular glioma, our experience with it. 
So the insular lobe paralympic region represents a common location for gliomas, up to 25% of all low-grade gliomas and 10% of high-grade newly diagnosed gliomas are found in this region. So we all know that low-grade low gliomas are not low-grade gliomas, and not many years ago, insula was considered as inaccessible, and the tumors in this region were considered stable, and that uh, there is no need for operation. We only need to biopsy and observation. But <clears throat> truth is uh, that these tumors are rather aggressive and they grow continuously, progressing to malignant tumors. So maximum resection is needed and the treatment plan should be individualized according to the patient preferences and, of course, regarding their quality of life. Studies uh, have shown that median survival in, uh, in three times longer is with resection than biopsy alone. And of course, uh, and that the median survivor on this tumor is 15 years with early resection and is in correlation to be extent of resection. The insula is characterized by the, I will just give us, because of the talk, the brief anatomy refreshment. The insula is characterized by the lack of surface exposure its cortex, which complicates direct surgical approach. And the insula is covered by opercula. In example, portions of the temporal, frontal, and parietal lobes located above and below the insula. Splitting the sylvian fissure is one of the most important maneuvers when we operate Insula. Sylvian fissure is divided into proximal part and distal part. Between them is anterior sylvian point where it is easiest to open the and split the fissure. There are several branches of the fissure, like horizontal ascending and posterior branch. We divide orbital, triangular, and opercular parts of the inferior frontal gyrus and are relevant for orientation when operating insula. Fifth cerebral lobe is hidden below the opercula and surrounded by the limiting sulcus. And that has its anterior, superior, and inferior part. Insula has uh, three short gyri and two long gyri separated with the central sulcus. Uh, uh, insula represents only uh, 2% of cerebral cortex, but it is very important functionally and anatomically. It is involved in various important functions like speech production, pain perception, processing of social emotions like anger, fear, and so on. The central sulcus divides insula into the anterior and posterior lobes. The superior lobe is located under the frontal parietal operculum and the inferior part is located under the temporal operculum. Thus, the insula is divided into two, four sections, anterior superior, anterior inferior, posterior superior, and posterior inferior ones. The Berger and Sanai classification of insular gliomas separates insular gliomas based on their location above or below the sylvian fissure. And this is important to know because the largest extent of rejection is usually in tumors within the zone. And the regardless of the zone of the median extent of the rejection is around 80%. For low-grade gliomas, extent of rejection more than 90% have five-year survival. 100% and for less than 90%, five fear survival is approximately 86%. So <clears throat> insular tumor resections, insular lesions can be safely resected via either transopercular or transylvian approach, which is always the challenging. While removal of opercular cortex after functional mapping certainly simplifies access to the subinsular region, there is some evidence that removal of even nominally non-eloquent brain <clears throat> has demonstrable cognitive consequences and is probably best avoided whenever technically is feasible for us. Uh, we can see image. The approach through the cilium fissure has challenges due to a lot of arteries and veins that has been preserved. So when we are going anterior to posterior thickness of the frontal and parietal opercula is increasing which is important in planning transcortical. Uh, so posterior located long gyri are hardly accessible. And we all know when we're operating insula, the posterior part is sometimes uh, difficult to access, even in transylvian approach. Insula is covered, we know all of this, with a lot of MCA branches. Limon insula is covered with M2 branches and the rest with M3 branches and their perforators. There are plenty of small perforating arteries to the insula from M2 to M3 segments, and we all have 
to preserve those vessels because it's crucial for uh, patient's outcome. Preservation of lenticular striatal arteries is one of the greatest challenges of surgery of the insula and damage to these arteries is uh, sometimes considered to be main cause of persistent neurological deficit. In this regard, the most lateral lenticular striatal arteries become important as the intraoperative landmark, which is available only in transylvian approach and allows determining the lateral margin of the anterior perforate substance. So uh, the anterior transylvian transinsular approach uh, follows the sphenoidal portion of sylvian cisterns, is directly to the sphenoid M1 and M2 segments, and we can preserve those arteries. Final exposure of the arteries, uh, transylvian transinsular access, the limon insula and short gyri. So we will now go through the, some uh, cases that we perform. So this is a young male, 43 years. He was presented with seizures. Uh, insular glioblastoma was uh, identified on MRI. And we tried and uh, we operated him uh, with awake surgery, but we used transylvian, not transopercular approach. So uh, we sometimes, when we operate the transsylvic, uh, uh, sometimes we uh, awake patients before splitting the, <clears throat> the insula, but in uh, recent times we split the fissure and we then awake the patients because manipulating with the vessels sometimes cause the pain to the patient. So we try to avoid them patient. So we can see the brain mapping here. We, on the number one, we get the speech arrest and we continuously, with the splitting, uh, we split the fissure and uh, went for the tumor removal, which was not a big tumor, but it is a malignant tumor. And we know that the boundaries of these tumors is very difficult to reach. And we also map with monopolar white matter tract. And uh, at the time that we have to stop, we stop the surgery and the patient's patient recovered well after surgery, but you can see uh, the first three MRI were stable, but the second surgery was done after the verification of huge progression of the tumor. So when the tumor is in the malignant phase, phase like this, we know that we are challenging with the uh, very malignant tumor. It's not uh, able to control the disease. In insular tumors, there are controversies in biopsy versus radical resection, awake or asleep surgery, preoperative eloquence definition of intraoperative radically at any price, and we have to preserve the quality of the life of the patient, which is mandatory in these days. We also use transopercular approach. We can see here the 35-year-old male presented with seizure involving uh, <clears throat> Uh, the involving the frontal lobe, temporal lobe, insula, and goes even in the anterior perforating substance. As tumor infiltrates opercula, the plan was to approach it transcortically. So we did the neuro navigation to, uh, to manage the border of the tumors. After that, we performed the brain mapping. And this is the histology was an aplastic astrocytoma. And uh, we can see the residual tumor histology revealed an aplastic astrocytoma. So patient had irradiation therapy and chemotherapy. Second surgery was performed after, six months later, uh, after lang uh, language recovery, because he had some uh, slight language uh, difficulty after first surgery. And further, further surgery was performed with the same awake protocol because of the histology plan was to be as radical as possible, even to cause a transient deficit. We, all, we also can see on the left side, first mapping, on the right side, the new surgery. And now we use the, the same transopercular approach and try to be as most radical as possible because we knew that this, this is tumor is not so benign. Anaplastic astrocytoma, and uh, all vessels were preserved. After the resection, we also uh, mapped the white matter tracts, and you can see the resected hole. 
this was larger dissection and the uh, tumor uh, was uh, irradiated in chemotherapy and you can see the result of the surgery with small remnant in the anterior operculum but it is not uh, clear if whether it is the uh, tumor remnant or the uh, or the post uh, irradiation uh, thing the second surgery was much more generous and here is the result after two years showing near total resection this is 35 year old uh, male the first seizure in her life in his life showed uh, on the MRI diffuse infiltrative tumor that occurring the uh, parietal temporal lobe and insula so we always use uh, all diagnostic that we have functional MRI we use uh, the DTI, we use magnetic cephalography, transcranial magnetic stimulation, unfortunately we don't have, but we are trying to get it. Tractography is uh, mandatory in these cases, only for, uh, it's not uh, crucial for surgery, but it's crucial for planning, because we know that uh, in real surgery, we sometimes get some information that are not so similar like those on the MRI but it is nice and uh, in many times it's, uh, it's the same but sometimes we have the uh, diff different issue regarding the precise uh, resection again awake surgery brain mapping uh, the letter showed the margin of the tumors which we identified by the neural navigation system and the uh, ultrasound and uh, the numbers show the things that we during the mapping uh, uh, identified and the tumor was uh, radically uh, tried to radically remove even we know that the patients will have slight neurological deficit after surgery but but we performed and preserved the functions this is the post-operative result which shows that only part of the tumor infiltrating primary motor cortex was left and it wasn't able to remove it because the patient will be <clears throat> permanent plagic Transopercular approach has the same accessibility to the uh, superior and inferior part of the insula after removal of the widening area of percular areas, and it shows greater visibility and wider workspace over transylvian approach, especially in large tumors. The disadvantage is that it does not provide the reliable proximal control of the lenticulostriatal arteries. Once I asked Professor Dufo why. <laughs> we were discussing about transylvian approach and he told me Yaku, i don't want to see uh, any vessel anymore in my life so because that i'm using the transopercal approach and the sub peel resection is mandatory transylvian approach this is a young nurse with a small insular glioma presented with seizure uh, and the uh, mri showed the uh, 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 the insular glioma which is pure insular we awaked her after we split the fissure because of the vessels we don't want to manipulate the vessels during she's awake because we noticed that the patient uh, are saying that it's a lot of painful so after we split the fissure we awake the patient you can see the uh, uh, identifying the limonins of the circular sulcus and the tumor was removed in piecemeal fashion we using cucusa and uh, bipolar and uh, after the surgery uh, we usually asleep a patient we use awake uh, uh, asleep awake asleep manner so This is the section on the control MRI shows small residual tumor on the medial border of the insula, which we uh, had to left because uh, the three milliamps showed that the uh, motor pathway is near. <clears throat> this is uh, another case of insular glioma, which we can see preoperative images, postoperative showed. Sorry, uh, the we removed the total remnant and we left uh, the one year uh, follow up and we know the brain plasticity did the thing so we can remove the uh, 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 remove the whole tumor after the second surgery uh, this is the most recent case that we did it is uh, it is a 30 31 year old female with insular glioma 
which affects frontal and temporal tumor, uh, temporal uh, part of the brain, and it's uh, mostly anteriorly. So trans transylvian awake surgery was performed. And this is a coronal view. And again, uh, we can see the opening the frontal temporal craniotomy, splitting the fissure before we uh, approximately uh, did the uh, tumor margins. You can see the splitting the fissure, putting the arteries and the vein on the one side. Map brain mapping. Well, with, bi with bipolar, we, use, we map the cortex and the monopolar white matter tracks. You can see the tumor removal from outside to inside. We always uh, check with neural navigation and monopolar, uh, monopolar mapping during the tumor removal. And at the end of surgery, you can see the hemostasis and we finished with a good neurological outcome uh, during the surgery. This is the post-operative uh, MRI show gross total resection. So to maximize safety uh, during transylvian resection, the recommendation is to widely open sylvian fissure to perform cortical mapping and mapping of the subcortical white matter. So meticulous uh, dissection and coagulation of M2M2 -M2 perforators, uh, we have to avoid long perforators going into uh, radiate crowns. So we have to preserve all this vessel and be aware of it. For transfilling approach, easy access is to anterior and distal part of insula, including limen. It is appropriate for tumor exclusively than insula. We say pure insular tumors. We operated tra using transylvian approach to avoid unnecessary removal of the intact cortical areas and M2 perforators and lenticulous triatal perforators are easier to control. The disadvantage is potentially vessel damage. So to conclude, both approaches have equal value, but smaller tumor, tumors located within insula, and especially anterior insula and limen insula, for our opinion, is better approach through, uh, through a transylvian approach. So I will finish with these views from Croatia, and thank you once again for inviting me, and thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Dr. Nemir, for your nice presentation. Any question? We have a time for one question. Any comments? Uh, uh, I, I would like to ask you, do you recommend or do you have experience after the grade 2 insular glioma, after the, let me say, gross total resection? Do you send the patient to irradiation or you wait and see? If, if we uh, achieve gross total resection and we confirm it with the perfusion, spectroscopy and uh, whole sequences MRI in young patients, we are uh, continue to follow up patients. If there is a, a suspicious for small tumor residual on the first MRI, we did, we did the four to six months after it. And if it's confirmed the residual tumor or the a suspected residual is growing, we send patient to the oncologist if we are not able to achieve a gross total resection, supramarginal resection. Yeah. I see. Okay. Okay. Thank you once again. Thank, Thank you once you. again. Uh, the next speaker is the Professor Miyawaki Satoru from the Tokyo. His uh, lecture is uh, uh, Fusion Three-Dimensional Computer Graphic Images for Cerebral Cavernoma Malformation in the Brain Stem and the Deep Cerebellum. Professor Satoru, please, uh, uh, panel, uh, uh, it's your. Thank you. Um, I'm Satoru Miyawaki from the University of Tokyo. Thank you, Professor Omar Hazik and Professor Kato and Professor Liu. Thank you for your kind invitation. It is my great honor to present in this seminar. So today I'll talk about the fusion three dimensional computer graphic images for cerebral cavernous malformation in the deep uh, brain segment, uh, brain segment, deep cerebellum. So I'll sh uh, share my slide. <clears throat> Sorry. Okay. 
sorry. So can you see my slides? Yeah, we see, oh. that's fine. Okay, can you see my slides? Okay, so I will begin. So um, so today I'll talk about the fusion three dimensional computer graphic images for cerebral cavernous malformations in the brainstem and deep cerebellum. So when determining the approach route for resection for cerebral cavernous malformation, of the brainstem deep cerebellum, it is necessary to consider the anatomical relationship between many important structures in the region, such as arteries, veins, uh, nuclei, uh, and uh, nerve fibers, and developmental venous anomaly. And preoperative simulation with fusion three dimensional computer graphic images would be useful. Uh, our department has been actively conducting preoperative simulation using 3D fusion images. Uh, previously, there was a lot of manual work involved in uh, creating 3D fusion images with different modalities such as MRI and uh, angiographies. Therefore, uh, we have created software for 3D fusion imaging and preoperative simulation that automates many of these processes. It is called GRID and it is already commercialized. It can automatically perform registration of multiple images and segmentation of brain tissues such as cerebellum and cerebellum. And Dr. Keen uh, from our department uh, developed this uh, uh, application. So I will show you some illustrative cases. First, uh, this is a 51 year old male. He had three previous hemorrhage events and presented with ataxia of left upper and lower extremities and ataxia of trunk. Cavernous malformation was de de detected in the deep cerebellum and it was increasing in size. Lesion, the lesion was located in left middle cerebral peduncle to upper cerebellum. Uh, these are corona and sagittal images. <clears throat> So I will show you the process of 3D fusion image. <clears throat> first, <clears throat> first, CT MRI images are aligned by automatic segment registration and the skull, cerebellum, cerebellum, brainstem, and major arteries are automatically segmented. And it takes about one minute for this process. And visualization of the lesion must be done ma manually. MRA tough images were used in this case. So like this, we have to remove the uh, unnecessary parts manually. So we can now, uh, we can see the lesion, visualize the lesion like this. Uh, next, uh, DSA uh, angiography image are then used to visualize the micro uh, small arteries. And registration of the DSA image must be done manually like this. And thresholds are adjusted to visualize the target blood vessel. And unnecessary parts are removed. And then, I'm um, sorry. This part, okay. And next, um, uh, so, uh, development venous anomaly uh, is important for several, uh, se uh, several uh, cavernous malformation surgery, and it's visualized using venous phase information of angiography. Once again, unnecessary parts are removed, and then this is a uh, uh, <clears throat> de developmental venous anomaly on the lateral side of the uh, cavernous malformation. And then, I'm oh, sorry, oh, sorry, I have to go back. Um, and next, oh, this is the fibers. Uh, visual, um, <clears throat> so the cortical spinal tract then visualized using diffusion tensile images. 
like this. <clears throat> and we have to remove the unnecessary fibers. We also visualize um, dentate nucleus and cerebral fibers are visualized. So the fibers connecting dentate nucleus and the uh, red nucleus on the opposite side is important for this, uh, for this case. These are the fiber of the cerebellar. And then uh, the 3D infusion is completed. It takes about one hour for this process to be done. And next we will present the surgical simulation. The fusion image is uh, made by this neurosurgeon, uh, Dr. Kiyofuji, and the simulation is done by uh, the operator my, by myself. Self. So in this case, we examine the cerebral medullary fissure approach from posterior side and the occipital transtentorial approach from superior side. We have to decide which, which approach was better. So first we present the present, uh, approach simulation from the posterior side. First, we perform a uh, midline of sterile craniotomy. <clears throat> yeah. And uh, retraction of the cerebellum is performed by the brain deformation function of this uh, uh, <clears throat> application. The flow of the fourth ventricle is exposed and the retraction of the pica exposes the swollen middle cerebral peduncle. This is, and this is the cavernous malformation. DVA exists in the lateral side of the lesion. And then uh, we'll move on to the uh, simulation uh, of the oxytocin transtentorial approach from the superior side. Approach from Above means the region exists in the uh, considerably deep part and DVA exists in the deepest part. So uh, in this case, uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So based on these consideration, we chose uh, approach from the posterior side in this case. So next I'll present the video of my operation. Linear skin scission was placed in the midline and extend the occipital muscle bilaterally and expose the suboccipital bone. After craniotomy, during the incision, begin the approach under microscope. Cut the arachnoid membrane and left and right uh, teracoroidea inside and tonsils are retracted to superior side. <clears throat> the left uh, overall tonsillar space is opened and the inferior cerebellum is cut so that the cerebellum can be sufficiently elevated. The lateral side is fully open to the lateral recess. The floor uh, of fourth ventricle and the enlarged middle cerebral peduncle is exposed. Uh, we protect the uh, fourth ventricle floor with rubber sheet. We perform the nerve simulation to ensure that there are no important nerve fibers such as facial nerve. Two millimeter incision is made in the uh, peduncle and approach the lesion. Dissect, uh, we is found the lesion and dissect the lesion from the normal brain at the gliosis layer at the border. There are some uh, small feeders and which are, uh, which are co co coagulated and cut. Since the region was large, the lower half was cut and partially removed. And then the remaining upper region was dissected and removed. Finally, remaining lesion around the out, uh, lateral side around the DVA are removed and DVA was preserved. Post-operative MRI uh, confirmed full resection of the lesion 
and the patient did not have additional neurological deficit and the course was good. Uh, next case is 28 year old female. She had three previous hemorrhages event and presented with right complete hemiparesis and right sensory disturbance. She had no eye movement disorder, no facial palsy. MRI showed cavernous malformation in the uh, increasing trend over the course of two years. These are coronal and sagittal images of MRI. The lesion was located in the left side of pons. We present the process of creation of 3D fusion images and preoperative simulation. So this is the lesion in the left side of pons. And DVA is this. The green fiber are motor fiber and the blue fibers are sensory tracts. The lesion is present with the motor tract compressed anteriorly and the sensory tracts are compressed posteriorly. <clears throat> so when we approach from the uh, posterior side, there is a high possibility of causing facial nerve palsy and eye movement disorders. <clears throat> so we determined that this case can be approached with minimal damage by approaching from the lateral side. So we did the simulation for of an anterior petrosa approach. After craniotomy, the temporal lobe is retracted and simulate the anterior petrosectomy with drilling mode. After the anterior petrosectomy, thus we can reach to the region. I will show you my surgical video. This is the design of the skin insurgent craniotomy. We set up monitoring such as MMP and facial nerve uh, mapping. After craniotomy, we begin the approach under microscope. We cut the MMA and elevate the dura of the middle cranial fossa. Uh, anterior petrosectomy is performed <clears throat> and posterior fossa dura is exposed. With the cut the uh, middle fossa dura, and we ligate the uh, superior petrosal sinus and cut, and posterior fossa dura is cut. <laughs> and cerebral tentorium is cut, and we can see the uh, tocular nerve. And this is a trigeminal nerve. We perform nerve simulation to ensure that there are no important nerve fibers, such as motor fi fiber. Uh, <clears throat> We two millimeter incision is made and approach to the region. And we can approach it to the region <clears throat> soon. And we dissect the region from normal brain at the gliosis layer at the border. Since the region was large, <clears throat> as it, uh, in this case, the region was cut and partially removed. And we also dissect the remaining region <clears throat> and the residual uh, region was removed. And post-operative -op MRI confirmed complete detection of the region, and the patient did not have additional neuro neurological deficit, and the course was good. So using all software grid, automatic registration and automatic segmentation significantly reduce image creation time. And small arteries, cranial knobs, and track fibers are, have to be uh, made individually manualized. Information must be shared between the surgeon and the image creators as to what anatomical structures are to be visualized. Uh, simulation functions such as bone drilling and brain deformation are very useful pre-operative simulation. And this is my conclusion. 3D fusion images and pre-operative simulation with grid are useful in determining the approach route for brainstem and deep cerebral uh, cavernous malformation. Thank you for listening.
Thank you, Professor Miyawaki. Very nice lecture. Very interesting reconstruction 3D, 3D manager, like, like the, the game for the children, yeah. but very useful, very useful. This software is probably tricky for the older guys. It's something that younger neurosurgeons prepare better than, than seniors, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yes, I believe so. So young uh, neurosurgeon uh, are creating this because for for education, we let them create the region and made them do the approach. And our operator uh, do the simulation together and share our uh, experience for the young neurosurgeon. So most neurosurgeon doesn't have experience for these such kinds of surgery. So I think I believe this uh, software is a preoperative simulation using this soft software is very um, useful sharing experience uh, with a uh, uh, young neurosurgeon. But for sure, you find it useful for for the planning or for the surgery. Yes, of the, course, the... of course, for of course. So you know, um, there those these cases. There's not many uh, cases uh, these brainstem uh, carbon monoxide cases. So one. Uh, so we have to prepare. Uh, we have to uh, do the preoperative simulation, um, uh, taking time. But these uh, software images can allow us uh, to image uh, uh, 3D structures and surrounding uh, anatomical structures. And I think believe this is very useful. Yeah, thank you. Thank you once again. Mm -hmm. Is there any question or comment from audience from the professor uh, Miyawaki? Professor Kato, would you like to comment? Yes, so Professor Yawak Sensei, uh, thank you very much for an uh, excellent lecture. You're so, welcome. Uh, yeah, so mm -hmm. I think it's a great, uh, great uh, kind of the, uh, procedure the, how we can uh, attack the region. So the, in the future, the, do, mm -hmm. you, do you want uh, some advancement of the, this type of the, the uh, image, such as uh, the hardness of the uh, tissue, or, or you can uh, Create just intraoperatively, so in the middle of the surgery, can you do this to create that uh, image uh, very quickly? Intraoperative. Uh, so, so I'm sorry. The question was that the, uh, using inter, so you using using these uh, image intraoperatively yes, or in, in the middle of the surgery. Mm -hmm. In, in the middle of the surgery, uh -huh, uh -huh. so can can you create uh -huh. such a, such image, or uh, in 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 the future maybe uh -huh. the, if you can uh, uh, some advancement of the creating of the, the image, uh -huh. the hardness of the so, the tissues, uh -huh. so such uh -huh. as the lesion. So uh -huh. how do you think about that? Yes, yeah, so I think this uh, that is the next step. So um. I believe we cannot use uh, make create uh, these uh, images intra intraoperative. We have to make it preoperatively. But we can we can there is a viewer of these uh, images uh, by like we can use iPads and we can uh, see uh, we can uh, scroll and we can see the three D images interoperatively. And this is very useful. And so as you said for the uh, simulation. You, the hardness of the tissue. So when you drill or you retract the uh, brain, of course, the hardness is, is uh, very difficult, dif different. So uh, we have to uh, update the application for those uh, more precise simulation. Thank you for your comment. Thank you. So uh, uh -huh. by the way, the doctor, Dr. Ibrahim, so Miyamaki Sensei is very uh -huh. famous for Moya Moya disease. <laughs> yes. Great. Yes. Great. Yes. Good to know that. Yes, uh -huh. you can send some young fellow to him to learn the oh. Moya Moya disease. Yes. Yes. Sorry. I, I, I will remember that. I remember that. Thank hey, you. I'm sorry. I, I should have presented about Moya Moya disease. Uh, in many webinars, I have presented about Moya disease. So I chose to present about carbon monoxidation today. So, so anytime I can present about Moya disease, then also I am free to so any uh, 
colleagues can come to my uh, department for seeing my surgery. Thank you. So yeah, much. yeah, it's it's not so. Uh, it's actually a rare uh, disease, so it's good mm -hmm. to see. There is not so many neurosurgeons who are experienced in uh, Maya. Mm -hmm. However, thank you for that. I will remember. You're welcome. That. Welcome. We will invite you maybe next up with this lecture. So we have one question more for you from the mm -hmm. audience. Uh, mm -hmm. Najar Ahmed, thanks to Dr. Miyawaki. Mm -hmm. I'm, re I'm reading the message. Mm -hmm. How much that it does it cost the planning mm -hmm. software? Yeah, uh, actually, it is a little bit exp uh, expensive uh, to date, and it's about 60,000 60, US dollars, about 60. 60,000 US dollars. So it's not okay. It's not that uh, the cheap. It's, I believe it's a little bit expensive, but the the, uh, the price is getting lower. So through the time, through the yeah, time is coming. Yes, yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very You're much. Uh, we are joined. So our next speaker is uh, Dr. Poiskic Mirza from Germany. His lecture is Mirza is here. Yeah, I he see him. Uh, his lecture is application of microscope-based augmented reality for a section of acoustic neuroma. Dr. Poiskic, please, panel is yours. Good afternoon, everyone. Ibrahim, thank you very much. Uh, Professor Kata, thank you very much, too, for the kind invitation. It's an honor to be here and to see my mentors, teachers, and my colleagues, some of I know from the ENS courses, Special greetings on Dr. Jakob Nemi from Zagreb to our Bosnian <clears throat> to our Bosnian troop. Does everybody see this and hear this? Okay. So my lecture today is application of microscope-based augmented reality for resection of acoustic neurinomas. My name is Mirza Poiskic. I'm a neurosurgeon originally born and raised in Bosnia, where I finished my medical faculty and started my residency. And then 10 years ago, emigrated to Germany, where I'm working right now at University Hospital Marburg. Marburg is a small city around 100 kilometers north of Frankfurt. We have a big university clinic, and our uh, head of department, professor and chairman, is Professor Christopher Nimsky, who is a worldwide famous name in the application of modern technologies in the um, in neurosurgery, first intraoperative MRI in Europe was actually under his guidance in Erlangen in the, in the 90s. Um, we are probably one of the leading clinics at this moment for uh, uh, application of augmented reality or microscope-based augmented reality, which is a significant advance and provides a real-time updated three-dimensional virtual model of anatomical details, which is overlaid on the real surgical field. Uh, we feel that there is a special need for AR to enhance the surgeon's perception of the surgical environment because the surgical field is often small and the neurosurgeon has to develop an X-ray view through the anatomical borders of the surgical approach itself in order to avoid unnecessary manipulation of the neurovascular structures. This is, of course, not a method which can uh, replace the uh, experience work in the cadaver laboratory or the surgical experience um, for resection of complex skull-based lesions or neurovascular lesions or, or in spine surgery or whatever surgery you use it for. But we believe it can shorten the learning curve and it can help especially the younger surgeons to gain a better uh, three-dimensional and in-depth reception of the surgical field and a better understanding of the anatomy. A microscope-based augmented reality allows overlaying 3D projections derived from preoperative surgical images into bilateral eyepieces of the binocular optics of the operating microscope, which is then precisely aligned with the surgical field. And it does not require a bayonet or a pointer, which is still being very widely used in the common neuronavigation system. As for augmented reality, uh, I've said previously that we are one of the clinics which use it probably the most in, in Germany and one of the clinics which use it the most in the world. And we've published on it in skull base surgery, for example, in transphenoidal pituitary adenoma surgery and for resection of skull base lesions, but as well as for spine surgery uh, supported by augmented reality and intradural spinal tumor surgery. Um, the, our experience with 
uh, resection of um, lesions in the posterior fossa and in the cerebral pontine angle is, is about to get published. So when you look at the PubMed search and you give in acoustic neurinoma or vestibular schwannoma with navigation, you will get a whole of 929 results. And if you write acoustic neurinoma and augmented reality, there are only three results. And these results revolve around uh, visualization of sigmoid sinus and transverse sinus for the maximal safe craniotomy of uh, acoustic neurinomas which is actually not a lot if we know which uh, what kind of complications can occur. And we know that one of the main uh, goals of surgery is to preserve the facial nerve if you do the retrosigmoidal surgery or uh, hearing preservation if you do the translabyrinthine surgery. So it is a bit odd that above all and that near all the technological development, we don't have any kind of very new and good technologies which can be used for uh, maximizing the safe resection of these lesions. So since we have few medical students also uh, here listening to the webinar and younger residents, I have put this slide just for um, uh, just for a small uh, a small reminder that vestibular schwannomas are benign and slow growing tumors. They arise from the vestibular component of the vestibular cochlear nerve. They are most common in the CPA and account for about 8% of all intracranial tumors originally originate within the internal auditory meatus and grow into the CPA. Most cases sporadic and median age of diagnosis is 50 years. So it went from 50 to in 76 to 60 years in 2015, probably due to the reason that we have an increased diagnostic for everything and that a lot of small sporadic AKNs are being diagnosed. Approximately 5% are associated with NF type 2. And cystic, large cystic vestibular schwannomas account for 20% of all of them and are thought to be characterized by a more rapid growth and worse surgical outcome, usually associated with B-allelic dysfunction of the NF2. So when it comes to the uh, treatment of acoustic neurinomas, it is usual that for smaller tumors, there are these three options, wait and see, radiotherapy, stereotactic radiosurgery, and surgery. Uh, we as neurosurgeons are, of course, particularly interested in the surgical part. Uh, for large and cystic uh, acoustic neuronomas, there is practically no viable other option than, um, than to perform a surgery. Uh, the last systemic review of complications by approach is uh, 10 years old, and it's shown that the three, from the three approaches, the middle cranial fossa approach seems safest for hearing preservation in patients with smaller tumors. The retrosigmoid approach seems to be the most versatile corridor for facial nerve preservation for most tumor sizes, but it is associated with a higher risk of postoperative pain and cerebrospinal fluid fistula, and that the translabyrinthine approach is associated with complete hearing loss, but may be useful for patients with a large tumor and poor preoperative hearing. Um, there are several uh, subjects of interest when it comes to AKNs. There is an increase in papers on uh, stereotactic radio surgery and the surgery after surgery, after radio surgery for acoustic neurinomas. And in the time when a lot of patients are taking blood thinner, especially in a developed world, there is a large number or increased incidence of acoustic neurinomas, which have the intratumoral bleeding. And um, Professor Arnautovic, our mentor, and myself are preparing a publication on, on uh, bleeding, intratumoral bleeding in acoustic neurinomas. So there are several classifications which developed over the world. Uh, probably the largest surgical series of all times comes here from Germany, from Hanover, from Professor Sami, and there is this tumor extension grading scale, T1, T2, T3, A and B, and T4. Um, a and B, and uh, like I said, there is also an unwritten rule that when the acoustic neuronoma by his size actually uh, touched uh, or compressed the brainstem, then there is a very, very hard indication for surgical treatment. Um, in, in my experience uh, in, in, in Germany and in Western Europe, there is a very large number of acoustic neuronomas which get first radiosurgical treatment which makes then any following surgical treatment not, not that easy. Um, 
This is also a landmark paper on facial nerve outcome and extent of resection in cystic versus solid vestibular schwannomas in radiosurgery area from Professor Bashkaya from uh, Wisconsin, which showed, although on a smaller case series, that surgery of the large and cystic vestibular schwannomas does not necessarily result in poor outcomes in terms of extent of resection and facial nerve function. And when we talk about the preservation of facial nerve function, this is something which stands in the middle, uh, 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 in the focus of application of augmented reality and application of digital um, uh, tractography, which I will be talking about in, 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 uh, in, in several slides. And um, when we get to visualize all the um, cranial nerves and all the vessels in the cerebellopontine angle, uh, uh, then the surgery, and we um, may manage to superimpose these structures on the operative microscope, which I will hopefully show in a video, then there is a very good chance of preserving all of these structures, and there is a very good and improved intraoperative orientation, especially for someone who is, who is learning this uh, surgery or doing it for the first time. So these are non-published data, which are right now being prepared for a publication. Uh, this is our uh, single center experience on 41 consecutive patients with uh, 21 right-sided, 14 giant tumors, 10 cystic and seven with hydrocephalus. I have to say we do all surgeries via retrosigmoid approach. So hearing preservation is not our goal. Our goal is maximum safe tumor resection and preservation of the facial nerve. We have a medium follow-up, 45 months. So 23 patients underwent gross total resection, 17 subtotal, and one patient partial resection. 25 patients underwent resection in sitting and rest in semi-sitting or the so-called Janetta position. Uh, park bench position and uh, prone position are, of course, or semi-prone are alternatives to it. We uh, prefer sitting and semi-sitting position, which is problematic only for the reason because we cannot do the automatic registration with intraoperative imaging, with intraoperative CT. Uh, we use a fiducial-based navigation, but we help ourselves then with navigated ultrasound, which provides you, so to say, with an updated intraoperative navigation or update of intraoperative uh, neurosurgical field, and we use a microscope-based augmented reality. Um, from these uh, 41 patients, 35 had no facial nerve deficit prior to surgery. 19 patients were intact following surgery, and seven patients had a mild house Breckman grade, Paris is grade two. Two patients, three, six patients, four, and one. And of course, patients with very large cystic tumors had in our series uh, uh, worse outcomes when it comes to the uh, facial nerve. Facial nerve was preserved in all cases, but the function was not. Um, very preserved in all of these. Wound healing deficits with CSF leak occurred in seven patients. This is in concordance with the literature that you have between 15 and 20 patients with CSF leak. Um, one patient's head during this time recurrence and one prior patient with partial resection underwent radiotherapy. You see that this is a pretty um, a large operative time of 316 minutes. Uh, some of these surgeries went for eight or nine hours with very large uh, cystic uh, tumors. Some others were very quick, uh, two to three hours with smaller tumors. But when you make a median or a mean uh, time, then it's uh, around uh, 300 surgeries, so around five hours. What we what really prolongs the operative time is the um, constant update of navigation, but this update which we performed during surgery and the uh, uh, building of the, of the intraoperative uh, setting is, we take that into consideration because that increases the safety of the resection. So using fiducial-based navigation and microscope-based augmented reality, 14 patients, that would be around 34%, underwent uh, resection, all of them in sitting position. Segmented object of interest in augmented reality were sigmoid and transverse sinus, tumor outline, cranial nerves, seventh and fifth, and brainstem. And um, operative time, clinical outcome, and complication rate did not differ between these two groups. 
However, use of augmented reality improved orientation in the operative field for craniotomy planning and microsurgical resection by identification of important neurovascular structures. So this is one of the recent cases which we performed a big right-sided T4B, um, an overclassification of acoustic neuronoma, cystic with compression of brainstem, patient which had actually uh, no functional hearing on the right ear, and who had preoperative with a very mild, uh, very mild facial nerve paresis. So this would be our operative setting. This is the uh, sitting position. You see uh, the the Mayf uh, head uh, fixed in the Mayfield clamp. The skin incision is being positioned. The the whole intraoperative neuro neuromonitoring, which in Germany is being done sometimes by neurologists, sometimes by electrophysiologists, and sometimes by neurosurgeons who uh, know a bit about electrophysiology in, uh, in my department and where I work. Uh, this is my job. Um, and you see here that the reference array is uh, on the right side of the patient head, and the reference array is being looked at by the navigation camera. We do the navigation with uh, fiducials, so with fiducial-based registration of the patient. We fuse the preoperative MRI. Uh, we, set, we, we use the preoperative MRI and the preoperative CT, fuse both of them, and then perform in our software the segmentation of the facial nerve, segmentation of brainstem, segmentation of the tumor, of the uh, trigeminal nerve, there is a so-called auto-segmentation, which the software can do by himself, but we always correct it. And we look that we get the so-called T2, 3D, or KISS sequence, or Fiesta sequence of the posterior fossa, which enables a very good visualization of, of all uh, cranial nerves. And uh, this is once more, so the, the, the position of the reference array uh, uh, to the head. And this is how it looks in the end when you perform this surgery under an operative microscope, the uh, primary surgeon on the left, the assistant on the right. So after craniotomy, what we always perform is intraoperative ultrasound. This intraoperative ultrasound is performed as 3D uh, data set, which is then fused with the uh, navigation planning. And this enables you to um, later on through the course of the surgery to exclude any uh, distant post-operative complications to see the um, uh, differences between the uh, different spatial volumes. And as you can see here, to identify uh, the vessels with Doppler and with the uh, segmented or pre-segmented structures. And this is also one, uh, one uh, screenshot of the intraoperative situation following the fusion of the 3D ultrasound with, with the navigation. So following the craniotomy, we do the calibration of the uh, microscope via the reference array. And this is the surgeon's view. This is how the surgeon sees the um, craniotomy site or the surgical site. Now you see many of these um, uh, segmented outlines. And these segmented outlines are actually segmentation of the brainstem, segmentation of the tumor, segmentation of the petrose vein, and segmentation of the, fa of the uh, uh, proposed course of the facial nerve and of the uh, trigeminal nerve. And the proposed course of the facial nerve can be done if you mirror its position from the right side and then superimpose it to the spatial effect of the, of the acoustic neuronoma. So this is now following the release of a, a cerebellar cystern and receive of, uh, release of CSF. You see the cystic components of the tumor, the entrance of the tumor or the exit of the tumor from the CPA. And this is then from the course of resection, when you see the first cranial nerves and the petrose vein following the resection of the tumor. And when you go with the zoom of the operative microscope on this specific vessel and on this specific cranial nerve, then you can, by adjusting the zoom of your microscope, know at every moment in surgery where you actually are. And why you, because you have these tumor outlines, which are then superimposed with the intraoperative ultrasound, you can do the further ver verification of the position during the surgery with the intraoperative ultrasound.
So this would be the post-operative imaging. This patient did well. He had a HB grade three um, paresis following surgery, uh, which and, and he is now under physical treatment for that. This would be one T2 tumor on the left side. And here, I think you can see very nicely the outline of the tumor, his, its origin, and its, uh, its outline projected on the dura, which is uh, at this moment still not opened. This would be the green outline is the brainstem, which is in the, in the deep. And this would be the first portion of the tumor outside of the CPA. You see here the identification on the right, so on the left side, facial nerve, which is then, of course, as in, as in every modern AKN surgery, identified with the intraoperative neuromonitoring and with stimulation, with additional security, with the use of augmented reality, and here on the right side, the complete preservation of the, of the facial nerve. And this is also one, one intraoperative photo where you can visualize practically every facial nerve. We, you can also do in a, in a software, you can label all of them and then you see through the microscope and you have a labeling of, of five on the trigeminous nerve, which is, which is actually then just playing a bit with the technology, but that is when the technology gets uh, more and more perfect, actually something which will, um, which will probably uh, become a standard. So um, this is one video which was performed by one of our former residents, uh, Dr. Vladimirov, which is, uh, which is unfortunately not, very, uh, not anymore in our department. So you see, we perform all surgeries, all tumor surgeries, all cranial surgeries, and more and more, a lot of uh, surgeries in the, um, um, in the spine with use of augmented reality. And these outlines are actually for someone who does not have experience with that, something which uh, goes on the nerves of surgeon or something which does not help very much at the beginning. But once you get used to it, it can be a large help. Now we see here an outline of the tumor, outline of the tumor cyst, outline of the facial nerve. Uh, this is opening of the cistern as the first step in the resection. The video is a, a bit speeded up, so uh, it, it looks a bit uh, more brutal uh, just for the sake of the time. Um, there is parallel to this, um, parallel to uh, this type uh, of an, a navigation. You can check any time at the head up dip displays which are display which uh, are actually sealing displays at our in our or you can see by adjusting the zoom of the microscope at any moment of the surgery where you are so this would be the opening of the internal uh, acoustic meatus and then the identification of the origin of facial nerve ie identification if the origin is on the superior aspect of the tumor and if not then the resection goes from the superior aspect uh, around around and around the facial nerve there is a very good um, there are very good technical notes on application of digital digital tractography for identification of facial nerves inside of the tumor. One problem with that is that the facial nerve is not the functional unit. So facial nerve is a anatomical unit and it has all kinds of fibers. It is not pyramidal tract that you can one-to-one -one show it with the one-to-one, um, -one, to show it one-to-one -one with, uh, with the tractography. But there are several protocols that will come in a slide um, which uh, enable that you, by mirroring the position of the facial nerve on one side, that you superimpose it to the position of the facial nerve on the other side. And there are some groups which say that that is, that it is possible and viable, it's safe. We are not very um, uh, convinced that this is like that, but we have now started to do DTI also for identification of facial nerve and in order to try to, to try to visualize it inside of the tumor. All of these structures can be presented in 2D and in 3D volume. And um, you can check the navigation anytime by on anatomical landmarks. You can also do a navigation update on the craniotomy uh, lines, uh, on, the, on the outline of craniotomy. And of course, using 
um, uh, fiduciary-based registration, you have diminished or you have less accuracy than you have it with uh, use of uh, intraoperative imaging. So one, one possible uh, future advance is uh, to either to perfect the ultrasound in that way that you can get a three-dimensional image, which is with its quality comparable to MRI, which you then get reconstructed in all three ways. Um, to be the dissection now from the brainstem, the big outline on this, uh, which you see, which we see is the outline, the initial outline of the tumor. And this outline changes only according to, to the zoom of the, of the operative microscope. So this is not something which, like I said, which um, is, uh, which can replace the surgical experience, which can replace courses, cadaver lab, uh, or any kind of microsurgical dissection, but when you start or when you are able to perform a certain microsurgical dissections of any kind, this might be of great help. And any any control over the technology in order to maximize uh, uh, the safety and the resection is actually, uh, in, in our opinion, very welcome. So there are many technologies uh, which we try out in order to see if they help us in any way. Many of these don't help. Many of these are just going into the way, but there are some like this, which helped for acoustic neuronomas and for other tumors of the cerebellopontine angles. We have also a series of uh, trigeminal schwannomas, vagus schwannomas, uh, schwannomas of non-AKN schwannomas of the uh, CPA. Where we used um, where where we used this um, this technology. Um, you can, as you see here, switch off the augmented reality setting at any time. So if you switch switch it off from the operative microscope because you have resected a part of the tumor, then and if you say you don't need it anymore and it's getting in your way, then you can resect it. But these augmented reality outlines are the whole time to see on the on the head of displays of your uh, of your microscope. And we, there is also a plan to integrate augmented reality with endoscopy. Uh, so our uh, chair is one of the scientific consultants for the company Brain Lab, and many of these. Um, uh, many of these technological advances, which are now um, actually part of the official softwares and official gadgets, uh, were partially based on uh, his ideas. And we usually get many of these uh, technologies to try out as, as uh, first users. And I think there is a world of opportunity, especially if we take into consideration the machine learning and the application of artificial intelligence for the um, smart uh, um, identification of structures in the imaging according to experience and to the import of, of uh, thousands and thousands of data sets of patients who have something like that. So I think that these AI algorithms are also going to make these surgeries and use of these technologies a lot, lot easier. Uh, than it uh, used to be. So um, I just have a few slides uh, to show for the end. This is the one of three uh, publications which were published so far on this subject for augmented reality for retrosigmoid craniotomy planning, general of neuro neurological surgery skull base 2021. This is a very good gadget. Actually, they are using um, uh, glasses, so we use microscope-based AR, there is a smartphone, even smartphone-based AR, and um, loops-based AR, and this was actually a cad cadaver study where using AR, you can have the, you can see as on the, on this image on the right side, where the sinuses is, where the nerves is, where the tumor is. One problem, one big problem is when you open the dura, then you have a brain shift, a shift happens, and then after that, a lot of these um, uh, uh, navigation accuracy is distorted. Then you can you can do either the update of intraoperative navigation, 
or you have augmented reality and you can adjust the outline of the tumor to the actual outline you see or outline of the nerve to the actual outline you see. So in that way, you can also do the, the, the update of the navigation. So this is one very interesting paper from Frontiers in Neuroscience uh, four years ago, clinical applications for diffusion, MRI, and tractography of cranial nerves within the posterior fossa. Like I said, one big problem is uh, facial nerve, trigeminal nerves, those are no fu not functional units. So trigeminal nerve has a lot of efferent and afferent and efferent fibers, facial nerve also. So tractography is can give provide you an update of the functional tract, tract and not of any kind of anatomical structures. And uh, these are the three methods which are being used, single diffusion tensor tractography, extended streamlined tractography, and streamlined tractography on fiber orientation distributions, which is derived from constrained spherical deconvolution. There is a lot of research uh, going around this, especially in the field of MRI physics. And I think if you combine it with, with, with some other um, methods, there will be possible to present a nerve within one structure as a tumor, and then to follow it through the entire surgery. Uh, this is also one of these methods uh, where you see on the, in the left image on the right side and the uh, right image on the left side, what is the proposed course of the facial nerve within the tumor. Um, there is a lot of, uh, this is one of the recent, the biggest recent series on uh, outcomes of surgery for vestibular schwannomas. And uh, this group from Miami had um, good facial nerve outcomes in 86% of patients. They had a very large follow-up. And this is also our experience that a lot of patients have a, some kind of facial nerve paresis following surgery, which then if the integrity of the nerve is, uh, is, is confined, which then recovers during the next two, three or four, year, four, year, four years. And to facial nerve function at least follow-up, the correlation has been shown between the facial nerve consistency, logical preoperative HB score, uh, facial nerve stimulation threshold at the end of the procedure, tumor volume, and the amount of cerebellopontine angle extension. Um, from the three approaches, hearing preservation rates are the biggest on the middle fossa approach, um, uh, and poor healing status at baseline, longer surgery and large overlap are independently correlated with unfavorable hearing outcomes. Like I said, this is a very hot topic and very in, but it's not something which we perform and a lot of uh, departments in Western Europe, USA, don't consider uh, hearing preservation, especially in patients who don't have a hearing before surgery, logical, as a, as a primary goal of, of this surgery. Um, Recurrence rates of cystic and solid vestibular schwannomas. Uh, recurrence rates have been shown in smaller series to be similar. We have to also say that the biggest series on schwannomas are actually from the 90s from Professor Sami. And the new series comprise some 400 to 500 patients. And so the actual real actual data is, is, not, is not there. There are some review papers, there are expert opinions. There is from the ENS also a big um, expert opinion review paper on that. There are some experiences, but a large prospective randomized study uh, to look at the, at the or multi-centric study to look at the actual outcomes in the modern time is, is missing. Uh, for the end, I would like to thank very much again for invitation to this uh, to this webinar. It's it's always a pleasure to be here, and I would like to invite everyone to uh, submit papers to our two special issues, which we've started in the journal Medicina. Uh, it has an impact factor of two point nine. It's listed in PubMed. There are two special issues. One is on clinical applications of modern technologies in neurosurgery and spine surgery, which I'm co-editing with our chief professor Nimsky and Ms. Uh, Dr. Bob, who is a, a medical informatics specialist and who takes care of all the technologies which are being performed in our department. And we have parallel to that, a special issue on advances in skull base surgery. And parallel to that, we will prepare a Springer book on clinical applications of modern technologies for neurosurgery and spine surgery where I hope that, that, that some of you might, might contribute with book chapters. Um, that would be all, and uh, thank you very much.
thank you, Mirza. Thank you for your nice lecture. Uh, it's it's uh, for sure the useful uh, equipment uh, for the future, for the early beginning of the PC angle uh, surgery and so. Uh, is there any question for Dr. Poiskic? Uh, how about how about the the small schwannomas, for example, uh, one centimeter in diameter? Do you operate them, send to radio surgery, and do we need the monitoring, especially of hearing and and uh, this augmented reality monitoring? Well, we know for the large force, but for the one centimeter, one five millimeters aid, we know that some surgeons operate also that intracanalicular and so well we give choice to all the patients for them to decide we present them the surgery pros and cons and we always send them to radiation therapists so they talk with both of specialists with neurosurgeon with radiation therapists and then they decide i think i don't have an exact data i think 90 percent of people go for wait and see or for radio surgery we have from time to time patient which said, I want to get it out of my head. And then we do it because this is a viable treatment option. Um, but I would say 90% of patients decide, wait and see, or decide to do radio surgery. We use this technology in that case too, uh, that, because even then it's even more important to preserve the facial nerve and to preserve the hearing. Um, my... My experience with hearing preservation, even in smaller tumors, is not that good. They don't have a complete hearing loss, but they have a better hearing loss. But we do in this department and in many departments only retrosigmoid approach, which is not, not, not very good for hearing preservation. Um, we use the technology always because um, it helps us to get along with it. It helps us to get experience with the technology, and it doesn't do any harm for the patient. So it helps us to get acquainted with that, to see pros and cons, technical pitfalls, what can it do, what can it not do, um, and it doesn't hurt patient. It's not, uh, it doesn't go with any increased radiation. Uh, it is not uh, prolonging uh, surgery that much, and uh, it will help possibly to, to, to perfection it. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Any other question? Thank you, Mirza. Thank you, Thanks, Mirza. Sir. So we are continuing. Continuing. In, it's my pleasure to announce uh, Professor Georgios Zenonos from Pittsburgh, United States, and he will talk today about the minimally invasive techniques in skull-based surgery. Doctor Zenonos, here we go. Well. Um... It's such a pleasure to be with everyone today here. Um, Dr. Dojic, um, uh, Dr. Kato, and Dr. Liu, thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, this series has been such an educational gem. And um, again, I'm so uh, honored to be part of it. I hope you can all see uh, my slides here. Yes, we see it. That everything's fine. All right. Well, um, so... Uh, at the University of Pittsburgh, and we, uh, it's well known for endoscopic intranasal surgery, but, um, uh, I, and that's why I wanted to um, give our perspective of what, um, what our thoughts are in terms of uh, minimally invasive surgery. Many patients will come um, to see you because uh, they're seeking quote unquote minimally invasive surgery. And their perception of that is that the, the it's surgery with smaller or no scar and and you know a surgery uh, that comes through the nose is sort of a no brainer. But the the more precise definition is perhaps um, surgery that uh, minimizes morbidity that does not create any unnecessary deficits to the patient, uh, creates faster and easier recovery, perhaps uh, less amount of pain. Um, a better co cosmetic result, which uh, perhaps is less important than the other two that we mentioned, uh, and still has a calculated risk, meaning that uh, that approach or that procedure should provide adequate visualization 
vascular control, particularly for scalp AIDS or vascular surgery. Um, and then reasonable ergonomics with the available instrumentation at hand so that, you know, the surgery, again, is done in a, in a way that's safe. Um, the hallmark, perhaps, of minimally invasive surgery is that there's less trauma to tissues, but it's useful to uh, categorize the tissues in non-critical structures, such as skin, bone, and muscle, for example, and then critical structures, the vessels, the nerve, the brain parenchyma, et cetera. Uh, and one of the mantras of skull-based surgery is, or has always been to prioritize the critical structures over the non-critical structures. So if you have to remove more bone or, um, uh, or create an approach that uh, creates less brain retraction, uh, less manipulation of the nerves or the arteries, uh, that is likely going to be a, a more beneficial surgery, a safer and overall, perhaps a more minimally invasive surgery, even though the scar may be larger. So in general, if we think about the uh, scalp-based procedures, um, if we draw a line between the lower cranial nerves, it creates essentially two compartments, the ventral skull base that is enclosed in between all the cranial nerves, and the lateral skull base, which is lateral to all these cranial nerves. And where a tumor starts, it becomes very important in, to categorizing what our approach will be. So for uh, tumors that are starting lateral to all the cranial nerves, in general, a lateral approach uh, will be beneficial and, again, quote-unquote, more minimally invasive. Whereas if you have pathology that starts in that cone in between the cranial nerves, that is perhaps a more minimally invasive procedure. In this uh, corridor, the ventral uh, skull base corridor, uh, which is usually endonasal, um, it provides also uh, a much more uh, expanded versatility in, this, in the sagittal plane, but also in the coronal plane in between this cone, again, without crossing the coronary nerves. Um, a surgical principle, again, um, that was uh, taught to us by many of the um, of the masters um, is to follow the tumor for, from where it started. So follow the epicenter of the tumor. And um, if you follow that, then you're following the correct anachronoidal plane. We saw a beautiful uh, presentation uh, from uh, uh, the prior speaker um, showing the, the surgery for acoustic neuromas, which is essentially a surgery of the arachnoid. So is uh, surgery of meningiomas and so of many other skull-based tumors. So if you follow the tumor from where it started, then you're much more likely to preserve the arachnoidal planes and then closed arteries and nerves um, that need to be protected. So for surgeries, for example, like a chordoma, it's almost always going to be uh, an endonasal procedure. And that's purely because you're following the tumor from where it came from. Uh, you're much more likely to be able to uh, follow the arachnoidal planes, uh, preserve the arachnoidal planes, and be on the correct side of the nerves and the vasculature, particularly the microvasculature. Um, and as you make your way through, the, arach the arachnoid essentially becomes your friend and protects all the microvasculature that is enclosed. Um, and that eventually, that's what makes this a more minimally invasive surgery rather than uh, the ancestors of a scar. In contrast, if you have a tumor like this, where it's an anterior clinoidal meningioma, uh, this patient obviously presented with vision loss, uh, but to do um, a, a ventral approach here will be the wrong thing to do uh, because the microvasculature uh, that is going to the optic nerve is gonna be in between you and the tumor. So doing an endonasal procedure for a tumor like this not only will um, result in a uh, subtotal resection, but it would likely hurt the patient because you would likely be transgressing the microvasculature that goes to the optic nerve. Uh, and of course, a, a procedure uh, that is more minimally invasive for this uh, is a procedure that allows an early anticline adductomy, a COZ approach, uh, where there's a, a modified or a full um, that becomes a little bit less relevant. Um, but again, the the goal of the procedure here is to um, minimize um, manipulation of the neurovascular structures, early devascularization of the tumor, good visualization of everything that we need, 
uh, to keep uh, ourselves our, out of harm's way. <clears throat> you know, beyond the development of microsurgery, um, there's uh, many uh, pioneers that ultimately led to uh, Dr. Heidong Jo and Dr. Corral um, performing perhaps uh, the first endoscopic endonasal pituitary surgery, uh, which was done at, uh, at UPMC at our institution. And since then, there's been um, many advancements that, and many uh, landmarks uh, that have uh, advanced this procedures to um, to the point that they are now, including the introduction of the nasal septal flap, uh, transcavernous approaches, transclival approaches. More recently, the contralateral transmaxillary approaches and the retropharyngeal flaps. Um, and um, all these advancements have created a, a toolbox for the scalby surgeon for uh, this ventral corridor that allows us to go to uh, most of where we need to go in the ventral skull base, again, staying in between this uh, cone uh, or between the cranial nerves. Um, this is an example of a, a patient uh, that uh, this approach, again, um, manifests what we can do today. Um, it's an it's a, a epidermoid tumor that extends um, both in the uh, posterior fossa, the supracellular space, the CP angle, uh, and all the way up to the ventricle. Uh, and the epicenter of the tumor is thought to be, again, in the um, uh, prepontine cistern and the supracellular space. Uh, so following the tumor where it came from, it has the highest chances of preserving uh, the arachnoidal planes uh, and um, be the safest procedure. So here I'm performing bilateral posterior clinodectomies to a transcavernous approach, which was described by uh, Dr. Fernandez Miranda, exposed uh, both in the supracellular space and, and the posterior fossa, and eventually combining these two surgical corridors um, through uh, a pituitary transposition, uh, preserving uh, the meningeal layer of dura over the um, pituitary gland, which uh, helps preserve its venous outflow and uh, its function. And again, following uh, the uh, arachnoidal planes, um, we're trying to preserve this microvasculature. These are the branches of the superhypocele artery going to the stalk and then superiorly towards uh, the chiasm, uh, and then making our way back in the interpeduncular cistern and working essentially from the inside out uh, of the tumor. Uh, as we progress up towards um, the uh, displaced um, uh, fornis, fornices on both sides and the uh, floor of the hypothalamus. Uh, and these are the optic tracts on each side. Uh, and again, working methodically and slowly to preserve this microvasculature um, in the prepontine cistern here. Uh, again, trying to preserve every little uh, small vessel, which are so important here and uh, allow no margin for error. And eventually um, exposing in the, in the lateral uh, cerebellar pontine cistern and slowly again following the tumor in the arachnoidal planes um, and the final reconstruction. Uh, and then this was a near total resection where we did leave some tumor, uh, particularly over the uh, floor of the hypothalamus and the fornix, but overall uh, a good decompression. So development of uh, adequate instrumentation, again, helps with the ergonomics of these procedures. Uh, and particularly, we've heard um, also from my prior speaker about neurophysiology. Uh, it becomes extremely important um, when working in the cavernous sinus, uh, and particularly the lateral compartment of the cavernous sinus, such as this case here, uh, would, would be a much more dangerous um, to follow these tumors in, in blindly uh, without the early uh, alert of neurophysiology. Understanding the dual layers uh, and the anatomy from a different perspective, uh, particularly the microvasculature in the supracellular space, uh, is extremely important for tumors such as craniopharyngiomas. Um, again, the, the endonasal approaches have become pretty much a standard for treating these procedures, for treating this pathology, uh, and... Uh, this has happened not because the absence of a scar, 
but rather because we're following the tumor in the correct arachnoidal planes. These are essentially intraaxial tumors that are starting around the area of the tuber cinerium and the stalk. And by following this approach, um, we're probably in better um, position to uh, dissect the microvasculature. These tumors, the trajectory that are is followed is from inferiorly to superiorly. So when we're coming from a transcranial approach, uh, this view is essentially very hard to get because we have to use either through uh, the, uh, the windows, either through the lamina terminalis, uh, or through optical carotid window, uh, the intraoptic window, et cetera. Uh, but what we need to do essentially is develop almost like an acoustic neuroma, this uh, peel away plane between the arachnoid and the tumor. And this, um, once this is developed, uh, all the attachment of the tumor is around the area of the tumor scenarium. So when this is uh, developed, then the rest of the tumor that's expanding into the third ventricle can be easily dissected. Now, once you're in the correct plane, one of the more um, feared complications is actually hypothalamic dysfunction, but that usually happens when we're starting the subarachnoid plane and we disrupt the microvasculature going to the hypothalamus rather than dissecting on the hypothalamus itself um, at around the tumor scenario and where these tumors arise. Uh, and this is a patient actually we're able to preserve function. Uh, this is not always possible, but something that was possible likely because of preservation of the stalk and the microvasculature. Olfactory neuro, uh, neuroblastomas and um, this uh, um, olfactory meningioma also lend themselves uh, to this approach. They become essentially convexed tumor. This patient was anosmic, and that's why uh, we chose this approach. Uh, once you essentially expose the tumor, you devascularize the tumor. And again, you, you're turning this into a convexity meningioma. Uh, working from the inside out, uh, debulking the tumor, and then using, again, microsurgical techniques and um, uh, dynamic endoscopy to try and, and dissect the tumor uh, with minimal brain retraction. And that's, again, why this, um, well, this approach is thought to be more minimally invasive for this particular tumor as opposed to the absence of uh, a scar. And reconstruction is key. Um, crossing nerves, so just uh, transocular motor triangle approaches uh, can be done. Uh, and uh, as opposed to staging procedures, which also is done, uh, enlarging these corridors by understanding the anatomy uh, is key and is possible. Uh, but every time you start crossing nerves and uh, microvascular structures, again, uh, the, the risks start uh, increasing. Uh, but it really has revolutionized uh, the ability of what we can do, again, following the tumor from where they came from. This is an example of a brainstem cavernoma uh, that was starting around uh, the interpeductor cistern and uh, displacing the third nerve. Uh, and because of tall posterior clinoids and the extension of the cavernous malformation above the P1 segment, significant extension above the P1 segment. Uh, so if coming through an orbital zygomatic approach, uh, this would have required us to displace the P1 segment or try and work above the P1 segment where it's riddled with many of the perforators and the posterior perforator substance. Um, again, this uh, transcavernous pituitary transposition uh, allows very good um, view in the interpeduncular fossa. Here are the posterior clinoids that are being removed. Uh, and then opening unilaterally uh, in the supracellular space, dividing the superior intercavernous uh, sinus and uh, combining the supracellular space with the posterior cranial fossa exposure. Um, being careful here to preserve the suprapophyseal arteries, uh, which are very important and um, they don't allow uh, a margin of error. And then going back towards the membrane of Lilliquist, dividing the membrane of Lilliquist here shows the displaced uh, third nerve um, and uh, a little bit further back the microvasculature. So you will see here how much this cavernous malformation is extending above the level of P1. And therefore, if we're coming from above, we would have to either displace this or try and work in between the perforators. 
And that is the reason I thought this would be a more minimally evasive approach. And again, not the absence of a scar in this particular case. You see how much the extension of the solid components of the cavernous malformation, again, are above this P1 segment. So working from inferior to superior, as opposed to the other way around, uh, gave us this uh, better view. This is Dr. Wong here. Uh, this is a very tight corridor. So again, dynamic endoscopy is just so important uh, for these cases. Transclival approaches, uh, what we call it as a tongue cheek, far medial approaches, as opposed to the far lateral approaches, um, can lend themselves um, and can be ideal in a particular um, subset of, of cases. Um, the my go-to approach for for meningiomas geomas is the far lateral approach. Um, but for this particular case, given the encasement of both vertebral arteries, I was worried about the origins of uh, the uh, anterospinal arteries. So choosing for this particular very ventral um, uh, for a magnumin geoma, choosing an endonasal approach um, was again, in my view, like a better approach and a more quote unquote minimal invasive approach, not because of the scar, but because following the tumor from where it started, uh, we're able to get a better view of this anterospinal arteries were essentially encased within the tumor and we became less dependent on a good plane um, and with better visualization, um, I think we uh, ultimately made this uh, surgery safer. This lady ended up having a leak uh, and then we had to go back uh, and uh, repair that, but she did well after that. Um, and um, we were able to preserve this anterospinal without issues. Uh, this is for our medial transcolder and transtubercular approaches, uh, venturing further laterally uh, above and below the hypoglossal nerve in the medial jugular tubercle and the condyle. Um, the so-called extreme meal approach, the jugular foramen, where we, we uh, disconnect the fibrocartilage uh, of the roof of the end, uh, eustachian tube from the foramen of the serum to get further lateral uh, into uh, the P2 apex. Um, resecting the lingual process as well as the mandibular strut uh, can allow lateralization of the choroid artery. And more recently, the contralateral transmaxillary approach where we come through the contralateral uh, maxillary sinus, again, increases our uh, angle of attack into uh, the um, P2 apex. This is We've removed here the lingual process. All three are being done here and then disconnected the forelaminal serum. Uh, and this is working through the endonasal corridor by coming through uh, the um, cowboy lock approach and the control transmaxillary corridor. It gives you even a better view into the petrous apex uh, and going all the way essentially to the cochlea and the jugular foramen. So again, uh, this um, following the tumor for where it came from, this, for example, this medial jugular tubercle meningioma lends itself to a good, uh, it's a good uh, endoscopic endonasal candidate and then allows you to preserve the microvasculature and the, um, you're on the correct side of the, of the nerves. But tumors on the other hand that started lateral and extended medial, such as this recurrence of a meningioma or of course, uh, global jugular tumors, these are terrible endonasal cases, uh, and these are still something that we would very much tackle from a lateral approach. And sometimes you need more than one uh, approach. Uh, multi corridor surgery sometimes is the safest surgery and the more minimally invasive approach. Um, this is a, a case of a central skull based meningioma that's very ossified. Uh, and uh, in this case, uh, what I th thought would be safer is actually starting from a li relatively la uh, limited lateral approach. And this is an anterocleidectomy. This is the optic nerve here. Uh, so performing um, an anterocleidectomy in a more um, a controlled fashion without too much blood loss, uh, exposing the periorbital of the optic nerve and create a medial trough. And then coming in nasally uh, to remove the optic strut uh, completely on the other side is the optic strut, so completely uh, encircling the optic nerve. 
and then working our way uh, the medial aspect of the uh, optic canal where it's usually invaded by these tumors uh, slowly removing um, and again respecting the arachnoidal planes opening the cavernous sinus and removing some of the diaphragma up to the level of the of distal dual ring and uh, the ophthalmic artery here, trimming the dura, and here's the final result. This lady had profound vision loss, uh, starting off. Um, and here's the decompression and um, had no recurrence and then had significant improvement in her vision. And I think that um, that sequence of events helped significantly. Um, we'll try and speed these things up here, as I know we're running a little bit out of time. Transorbital approaches are a powerful tool um, for lateral uh, uh, skull-based surgery that uh, perhaps um, uh, allow a little bit less disruption of uh, the uh, musculature and uh, some less atrophy uh, and a very good cosmetic result. Um, the, we do these surgeries with our plastic surgeons, uh, so they tend to heal uh, quite nicely. So, um, and there are many variations here depending on where we need to go. So an eyebrow incision with a supraorbital craniotomy usually provides good um, anterocranial base exposure. If we extend that a little bit inferiorly and we do a superlateral orbitotomy, usually we will limit this up to a level of the orbital zygomatic suture. I uh, will expose a little bit more of the uh, sphenoid ridge. A lot of canthus approach, uh, more of a middle um, uh, cranial fossa exposure. Uh, but when we do this um, uh, modified uh, orbital zygomatic approach through an eyelid and lateral canthus incision, we really have a beautiful view, both of the anterocranial fossa as well as the middle cranial fossa. Um, and uh, then finally, when we have the medial eyelid incision and transfrontal in the anterocranial fossa, these are some of the results of these approaches from an eyebrow approach. And I would argue that it's really hard to see uh, and discern which side the surgery uh, was done on. An example of this, sometimes we do use uh, skull-based approaches for uh, intraaxial tumors. This is an unusual case of an ependymoma where we uh, went from inferior to superior as opposed to transfrontally uh, to resect this uh, posterior inferior frontal um, ependymoma. And using endoscopy often helps um, as well. This is the resection cavity. Um, and it was a nice cosmetic result. I jumped through it there. Lateral canthus approaches with lateral orbitotomy, both for sphenoid middle sphenoid wing meningiomas or lateral sphenoid wing meningiomas. Even in triaxial tumors such as this epidermoid, this uh, is a very powerful approach for it. And when combining it uh, with this eyelid incision, can really provide a very good view even uh, in the anterocranial fossa or the orbital roof. Uh, these are more extensive um, example of this tumor. Uh, and this is the uh, incision that we would use. Mapping the frontalis nerve. Here's an example of the exposure. Uh, and then uh, the, the piece that we would use is, um, is essentially almost like an orbital, mini orbital zygomatic approach that goes down to the inferior orbital fissure. Uh, so it, it's a uh, quite a more extensive approach and it gives a really beautiful visualization and pretty similar exposure to what you would get from a, a formal orbital zygomatic approach, peeling the lateral wall of the cavernous and then uh, opening the sylvian fissure and slowly methodically working to remove the tumor uh, all the way up to the anteropetroclonal fold and uh, the superior uh, roof of the camera sinus and then reconstruction. Um, and these, these are the kind of uh, cosmetic results that you get from that such an approach. This blends nicely into uh, the lateral canthus and um, uh, without much of the muscle atrophy. Uh, this is an example of a frontal acephalus here with a medial approach. Uh, you see there, this, I, that would require uh, normally a bicoronal craniotomy to get there, uh, but using, using this lateral, uh, this medial canthus or this medial eye uh, lid incision, uh, going through the outer table and then uh, getting access into um, the frontal sinus, reducing the encephalocele. 
and then with a, a small um, inferior uh, wall um, mucosal flap um, close this and this heals very nicely because it blends into um, this natural crease that we have in the eye so it does lead to a nice result uh, keyhole approaches for MVDs for trigeminal neuralgia. I'm not going to belabor this here. Uh, many times um, using the endoscope, particularly for genicular neuralgia and section of the nervous intermedius, uh, can provide like a, a better visualization, uh, such as here, giving a little bit more of an inferior to superior view. Um, so, in conclusion, the definition of minimally invasive uh, shouldn't be confused with just a smaller incision. It's just choosing the right approach from based on the epicenter of the tumor that dictates where the arachnoidal planes and where the neurovasculature is displaced. Um, and both the ventral and, mini and lateral approaches can be um, essentially modified uh, to decrease the footprint of, of what we do. Um, and hopefully we'll continue to evolve in that uh, in both. So thank you again. And um, sorry, I went over a little bit of time. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Professor Zenonos, for a very, very nice lecture for those approach and, and very nice picture and the scopic view. It's completely clear and nice technique. Uh, is there any question from Professor Zenonos from Pittsburgh? I thank you very much. So can I? Yeah, uh, please. Uh, 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 it was an excellent lecture. And uh, just I want to know, because uh, you can do every type of the tumor through the very small corridor, this is kind of the, the minimally invasive uh, treatment. So if you have any uh, suggestion to do the open, uh, the large deprivatomy for the lesion, just can you tell us, please? Yeah, again, uh, I, I think the, the main driving point was that you know, if if in the back of your mind, you think that like a smaller approach would limit the safety of the procedure, either because of limited ergonomics or um, limited vascular control, um, or if that uh, approach will get you to the wrong side uh, of the neurovasculature, that is the wrong approach. Uh, and we should only use approaches that we feel they're safe. Now, we can minimize that to some extent with some transorbital approaches or using, you know, um, uh, instrumentation that allows us to work through a keyhole approach. But at the same time, um, the the whole, I guess my my point was that the term minimally invasive is never related to just the incision. It's always about choosing the right corridor for the right approach, following the epicenter of the tumor, respecting our coronal planes. And uh, sometimes, as the, some of the cases that we show in the beginning, um, a, a formal lateral approach that you need the full exposure, that's, that's the best and potentially more minimally invasive approach that you can take for that, uh, that disease. Um, so choosing the right thing for the right uh, pathology, I think, is key. I, 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 I hope I, I answered that, what you tried. Yes, yes. Uh, thank, thank yeah. you so much. But anyway, and thank you so much for having me here. Thank you very much. Thank you. I have I have one question more. If if you are ready, uh, agreed to, yeah. to answer, maybe for me personally, and also for the young guys. Uh, as we see, for example, when you're using the transphenoidal approach and you you, you make a, a pretty uh, large opening of the skull base, uh, clivus or paracellular space and so on. And you, uh, when you are closing those, you remove the tumor and this is very nice technique. But when you are closing and you mentioned that it's very important to, to prevent the CSF leakage and you mentioned that you had already these few cases, one of them. So I saw that you put the lyodura or something like that, or the fascial dura and then something like fascia lata. Yes. And, so uh, in general, um, for the the highest um, uh, risk for a leak are either posterior fossa defects uh, or large craniofacial defects. For example, after removing like a, an esthesial neuroblastoma or you know something that's pretty extensive, particularly olfactory grooming geomas, actually. Uh, so the 
we would usually use an inlay of uh, um, uh, a substitute or dual substitute or dual matrix or durogen as an inlay. Then we would use uh, fascial ADA. If it's a posterior fossa defect, we would also use a small fat graft that would go in the clival recess. And that serves two purposes. It prevents pontine herniation. Sometimes before when the uh, initial uh, cases were done, uh, you would see herniation of the of the pons into that clival defect. So it prevents that. And also creates a little bit more of a flat surface for uh, the flap to lay on. Uh, many of these cases will require an extended flap. Um, and uh, we're lucky to work with experienced skull base uh, ENT surgeons where they would go and extend the flap into uh, the origin of the inferior turbinate. So get all that inferior wall as well. So to create like a very nice and extended flap. Um, we also try to generally try to confirm that there's vascularity within the flap uh, in, uh, in the, at least on the pedicle of it. So we would do an ICG, uh, ICG run to make sure that that's viable. And obviously if it's not, we will potentially alter some of these things, but uh, for posterior fossa defects and large craniofacial defects, we will use a lumbar drain as well. And even with all of that, you know, um, the uh, leak rate for posterior fossa defect, lab posterior fossa defects, uh, it's, it's somewhere in between 10 and 15%. So it's not insignificant. Um, so so uh, there's still room for improvement there. There's no question. We, we, we can, so we cannot be too much prepared and careful with the CSF. Always exactly. prepare the lumbar drainage, exactly. fat tissue, fascia lata, fibrin glue, everything prepared. And again, again, we can expect the same problems. That's, that's, right. that's good to know. And it, it's good to know that we have to be prepared also for the young guys, not, not trying to solve the problem after three days, but before the surgery, yeah, I think, prepare I everything. I I don't think it's just the young guys. I think it's everyone. I think we're uh, we're all struggling with that, and it's something that we need to work on further. Maybe the young guys uh, would, would figure out better than than everyone else. So there's hope. <laughs> yeah, Thank yeah, so yeah. I, I I mean in the, that the the skull base surgery is not just the removing the tumor, but the story is uh, a little bit uh, bigger than that. We should prepare be prepared for everything. Thank you. Could Any I other comments more? or questions for Dr. Gregorias? No. Thank you. Thank you very much. I know that it's a very early Saturday morning in Pittsburgh, and we are uh, happy to have you with us. Have a nice day. It's an honor. Thank you so much again. Thanks. So our next speaker is uh, Professor Kenichi Oyama. He is director and professor of the Department of Neurosurgery International University in the Tokyo, Japan. So I would like to invite Professor Oyama to talk about the tips for hemostasis during the endoscopic endonasal cranial base surgery. Uh, Professor Oyama, are you here with us? Yes, you are, please. We can't hear you if you are talking. We can't hear you. We have we see the slides, but not all. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Now. Yes. Thank you. Can you see my presentation? Not now. It was earlier. Now. Uh, uh, yes. We see the slides now. Okay. Okay. Now Hello, everybody. That's good. Hello, everybody. I'm Kenichiro Emma from Tokyo. But actually, today. I'm in the United States, uh, very close to the uh, Professor Zenono. Ah, uh, hi. Slide show. Yes. That's fine. That's fine. Thank fine. you. Okay. So first of all, I'd like to introduce my university, uh, my university, International University of Health and Welfare, is uh, unique because we have a lot of foreign medical students in our medical school. 
they are actually they are really smart and very hardworking students. So I'm sure they are going to be a great doctor in the near future. My hospital, Mita Hospital, is one of the branch hospitals of the IUHW. It is located in the in the in the center of Tokyo, very close to the Tokyo Tower. So you can visit our hospital to enjoy the uh, surgical theater as well as the beautiful scenery of the Tokyo. Today, I'm going to talk about the uh, hemostasis dur during the endoscopic endonasal approach. First, I'm going to show the uh, tips for the uh, hemostasis during the nasal phase. After that, talking about the uh, hemostasis for venous breathing and the hemostasis for arterial breathing. So this slide summarizing the, the, the uh, tips for the less invasive nasal manipulation during the endoscopic endonasal approach. First thing you have to do is the decongestate the uh, mucosa using the epinephrine gurse. Warm cell indication is effective to some extent to control the, the uh, mucosal or bony bleeding. You have to gently lateralize the uh, uh, nasal structures to avoiding the uh, minor bleeding from the mucosa. In the many pituitary cases, we perform the paraceptal -sep approach to, the, to get to the sphenoid sinus. At that time, submucopericondrial dissection of the septal mucosa is really effective to, to reduce the bleeding from the mucosa. And also, you have to always think about the uh, sphenoid, sphenoparty artery because it's, it's, it is located just beside the sphenoid sinus. So you, you may injure those, those vessels during the operation. So you have to think about sphenoparotene arteries and to, to, to keep intact those arteries. This video showing the, the, uh, our technique to get to the sphenoid sinus by a single nostril. Firstly, we gently lateralize the uh, middle turbinate as well as the uh, inferior turbinate. After that, we usually cut the mucosa uh, vertically, just in front of the uh, middle turbinate to preserve the uh, uh, mucosa of the olfactory, olfactory function, to preserve the uh, olfactory function. After that, performing the submucopericondrial dissection to get to the sphenoid sinus. So now I'm talking about the uh, hemostasis for the venous breathing. The, to control the venous breathing during the endoscopic endonasal approach, the first thing you have to do is to elevate the patient's head to reduce the venous pressure. Actually, we have several conventional hemostatic agents like a uh, abitin, sargicel, gel form, et cetera. Of course, those conventional hemostatic agent is useful to control the venous breathing, but it is a little bit difficult those, those agents to, to, to use the inside the, inside the nose because usually that those uh, conventional agents stuck to, uh, uh, tends to stuck to the uh, mucosa. So the many years ago, Professor Kassam reported the uh, good, great technique uh, to use those such kind of uh, hemostatic agent. It is called as a, 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 a abitin sandwich. Actually, this technique is still effective to use such kind of materials. Also, I usually use this technique to, to press the uh, 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 bone wax to, to cover the bony bleeding during the operation. And actually, nowadays, we can use a much more or better uh, hemostatic agents, flowable materials, like a, a surge flow, flow feed, and et cetera. I'm going to show the one case using the flowable materials. This is a case of the prolaxinoma. You can see the uh, microadenoma in the right side of the pituitary gland. So this is a flow sealed uh, surge flow. It has a, a flexible tip like this. So you can mobilize the tip of the uh, of this uh, 
agents. And uh, it has a good consistency that the flowable material stays over there. After that, you can put a uh, cottonoid over the materials. So to the uh, functional tumors, we usually try to remove the tumor extra capsule to perform the uh, uh, complete endocrinological remission. Actually, in this case, tumor was invaded to the uh, medial cavernous sinus. So we, we also removed the medial cavernous sinus valve to complete to, to perform the complete endocrinological remission like this. After that, we apply the uh, flowable materials to the uh, cavernous sinus to control the bleeding through the cavernous sinus and uh, put the cotonoid over it. That's it. It is a uh, really a uh, useful uh, venous bleeding controlling technique during the endoscopic endonasal approach. Also, operative MRI show the uh, complete removal of the tumor. And you can see that the protein level reduced below the normal levels. It means that we could perform the complete removal of the tumor during the operation. Finally, I'm going to talk about the arterial bleeding during the endoscopic endonasal approach. The most important things to, to control arterial bleeding during the endoscopic endonasal approach is to know the anatomy well. One good instrument to, to, to use during the endoscopic endonasal approach is such kind of uh, 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 bipolar instruments. It has a single shaft, and so you can apply this, this instrument deep in the no nose. And uh, this picture shows you the uh, anatomy inside the sphenoid sinus. One of the key structure in this in in this picture in the uh, is the uh, lateral OCR. The 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 lateral OCR OCR lateral OCR located between the optic canal and the ICA. So you can you can know the uh, important anatomical structures using those bony landmarks before before starting the uh, the reading of the sphenoid sinus. When you want to go to the uh, uh, frontal base, you have to manage those tiny vessels, uh, anterior ethmoidal artery and the uh, posterior ethmoidal arteries. Those arteries are coming from the uh, ophthalmic artery. You can control those arteries to, 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 to re reduce the bleeding from the uh, frontal base tumor. This slide shows you the anatomy using your catabar dissection. You can see that the, uh, in the left side, they are still have a, a bony structures over the ethmoidal arteries. In the right side, we, we remove the uh, bony structures over the uh, anterior ethmoidal artery and the posterior ethmoidal artery. You can see that the, uh, those bony protrusion in the uh, frontal base, and you can find the, uh, those arteries and, the, and the control the bleeding from the tumor. And uh, one of the, another technique is to push the orbital contents to laterally to find those, those boundaries of the ethmoidal arteries. This is a case of the uh, recurrent ethmo, neuroblastoma. During the operation, you find the, uh, we find the uh, ethmoidal arteries and, and, and coagulate them and then cut. After that, we can leave in a tumor uh, without uh, massive bleeding from the tumor. This is a case of the uh, of group meningioma. So in such kind of cases, you have to find the ethmoidal, ethmoidal arteries first to control the bleeding from the tumor. Now I'm drilling of the, the ethmoidal arteries you can find the uh, bundles of the ethmoidal arteries here. After that, you can coagulate the artery and cut. After that, you can remove the manage omer with that uh, massive bleeding during the operation. One of the good approaches to the uh, supracellular area is the uh, transplantable approach. During the transplantable approach, after opening the dura, you can find 
those tiny best cells from the ICAs. It is called as the uh, su superior hypophysial arteries. Usually you can find the two SHAs during the uh, transplanar approach. Those are arising from the ICA. Those are called as the primary and the secondary SHAs. And the primary SHAs are uh, two thirds of primary SHAs are originated from the cranial segment of ICA. And the one third of SHAs are originated from opsalamic segment of ICAs. Those vessels supply the incredible and chiasm and optic nerve. So, you, uh, so if you sacrificing the those SHAs, you can you can you can encounter the uh, visual deficit after the operation. On the contrary, sacrifice, sacrificing SHA is less likely to cause the uh, pituitary dysfunction after the operation. This is a case of the cranial pharyngeoma. The tumor was mainly located in the third ventricle. So we perform the transplantum approach in this case. So now I'm drilling of the bone in the frontal base, performing the, the craniectomy like this. After that, we usually cut the dura in the frontal base as well as the uh, pituitary fossa. After that, you have to control in the uh, 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 breathing from the uh, inter, uh, intercavernous sinus. You can see that we can use the uh, bipolar, uh, bipolar to, to, to coagulate and cut the uh, uh, cavernous sinus. So firstly, we try to preserve those the uh, SHAs but it was difficult. So we, we cut a little bit and mobilized those arteries laterally. After that, we could make a, a surgical corridor to get to the tumor inside the third ventricle. After that, you can see the uh, stroke just below and behind the tumor. First, we, we, we perform the uh, internal debulking of the tumor using the uh, forceps and the uh, ultrasonic aspirator. After that, we, we could dissect the tumor using the scissors from the optic nerve and the hypothalamus, etc. And we also try to keep the stroke intact in this case, but sometimes it is really hard to keep the stroke during the operation. Now I'm dissecting the tumor from the frontal lobe. This is in the final phase. We could cut the arachnoid between the tumor and the optic nerve using scissors. Finally, we could perform the complete removable tumor from, from the nose. You can see the, the anatomy inside the third ventricle. You can see the uh, flamen monglo over there. So Professor Zenonus already talked about the uh, transcarbonous posterior perinidectomy. During such kind of procedure, you have to control the uh, inferior hypophysial arteries. It is coming from the ICA like this. The inferior hypophysial arteries are origi originate from the cavernous segment of ICA, directly or a branch off of the uh, MHETs. Those arteries supply the posterior lobe of the pituitary gland, and there are uh, anastomosis between the, uh, uh, their counterparts, and also the uh, transverse anastomosis, an anastomosis between the SHAs. So the uh, bilateral sacrificing of ICA does not cause the pituitary dysfunction. So you can, you can coagulate and cut those, cut those arteries during the procedure. 
This is a case of the uh, uh, petrochemical meningioma. So in this case, we perform the uh, uh, transcarbonous posterior crinoidectomy. Now I'm opening the uh, medial cavernous sinus. You can see the tiny inferior hypophysial artery. We can coagulate and cut the uh, inferior hypophysial artery. After that, we can apply uh, flowable materials to control the bleeding from the cavernous sinus. After that, we could remove the uh, posterior clinoid, create a space for remove for so perform the, the tumor removal. After that, we could open the dura and we could perform the complete removal of the tumor in this case. This is another case, huge cranial pharyngioma. You can see that the tumor was located in the third ventricle as well as the in the positive fossa. So in this case, we perform the transparent approach for the, uh, for the third ventricular tumor. And also we combine the uh, transcriber approach to remove the tumor in the posterior fossa. It's the same technique, craniectomy using the high-speed drill. Also, we perform the craniectomy of the clivaral area. After that, open the dura and remove the posterior clinoid in this case also. After that, we could mobilize the pituitary a little bit to a laterally. And then we can make a huge surgical corridor to get to the tumor in the third ventricle as well as the posterior fossa. Firstly, we, we dissect the tumor from the brain stem. You can see the vaginal artery, SCAs, PCAs, third nerve, and the mammary bodies over there. After that, we remove the tumor from the third ventricle, remove the tumor sharply from the optic nerve and the vital structures on the tumor. Finally, we could remove the tumor completely, in this case also. See this. This is the final view. Also, operative MRI also confirmed the complete removal of the tumor. In this case, we could preserve the partial pituitary function of the patient. Actually, one of the critical complications during the EEA is the ICA injury. The, the Pittsburgh group reported their, their experience of the ICA injuries. They reported the several injuries in the 2000 endoscopic endonasal approach cases. And they reported their uh, 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 transcriber and transtable approaches has a much higher incidence of the ICA because during such kind of procedure, you have to manage the ICA during the operation. Actually, they sacrificed the uh, four, four ICAs during the operation, and uh, they, they experienced the one pseudo aneurysm of the, of the cases with the pre dubbed ICAs. When you encounter the uh, ICA during the endoscopic endonasal process, first thing you have to do is to ask, ask the assistant to complete the uh, cervical ICEAs. After that, surgeon try to keep the lens screen to see the uh, breathing point clear. And then you can, you can apply the uh, bipolar coagulation to the breathing point. Of course, it's sometimes sometimes effective, but usually it's not. It's, it, 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 it's very difficult to control breathing using a bipolar. One of the basic techniques to stop the bleeding from the ICA is uh, using a clashed mask graft, muscle graft. You can, you can apply the uh, muscle, muscle graft, graft over the uh, bleeding point of the ICA. After that, you have to go to the uh, angiography suite to, to check the uh, 
uh, condition of the uh, of the ICA. And also the uh, Pittsburgh group reported the uh, unique technique harvesting the uh, uh, mussel patch. Usually we use, uh, uh, we, we harvest the uh, mussel patch from the Thai, but they reported the uh, uh, unique technique to harvest the uh, mussel patch from the nasal pharynx. It, it is uh, one of the, the option to get a uh, mussel patch during the endoscopic endonasal approach. And uh, after, after the IC injury, nowadays we can apply the uh, endovascular reconstruction. Actually, we can use the uh, cupboard st stent or uh, we can use the uh, flow diverter to, 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 to reconstruct the uh, ICA. And, uh, and this report, this, this, this paper reported a good clinical outcome using the uh, both flow diverters and the covered stent to control the, to, 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 to perform the reconstruction of the ICA injuries. I did uh, clinical uh, research fellowship many years ago in the Ohio State. At that time, we, we, we developed the, the uh, training model for control of the uh, ICA injuries during the endoscopic endonasal approach. This, this model is manufactured by the uh, Japan Medical Company. It is commercially available. You can see that the, uh, this 3D model has the uh, uh, artificial uh, uh, artery tube inside the model. So you can drill over the uh, artificial artery using this, this model during the uh, uh, training. We perform the, uh, 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 we used those models during the end of Barcelona in 2018 to show the, to show the technique to control the uh, ICA injury during this procedure. You can see that the uh, surgeon now drilling over the bone of the paracrinoidal ICA after that, you can encounter such kind of uh, disaster. First thing you have to do to is to clean the lens. And after that, you have to find the breeding point. And then you have to apply the uh, muscle patch to control the breeding from the ICA. After that, you have to go to the Andio suite to check the uh, condition of the ICA. It is unique. You can use those kind of model to, 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 to experience the uh, ICA injury during the operation. This is a final slide. Effective management of breathing is critical for performing endoscopic endonasal approach in the narrow, narrow and deep surgical field. You have to know uh, various hemostatic techniques in order to perform EEA safely. Understanding of surgical anatomy is, is mandatory for treating scarves regions via EEA. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Oyama. <laughs> that was a lecture which I hope most of us will never have to use. <laughs> I mean, uh, nobody, nobody likes to, to have this kind of experience, yeah. uh, uh, you know, bleeding from the carotid during the transenoidal approach. However, uh, we have it uh, not only by endoscopic, but also microscopic approach. Sometimes it could happen, especially if you are going, if you are going to laterally to the cover on sinus and trying to, 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 to remove the tumor off, or if there is very fibrous meningioma and skull base or hordoma or even craniopharyngioma sometimes they are adherence to the carotid and it's it's really really a, a unusual situation if the bleeding is there from the carotid but thank you for sharing with us this experience and how to control the bleeding maybe professor zenonos have the comment for this because his it's it's his area also well, Dr. Oyama, I, I, uh, I truthfully enjoyed your presentation. Thank Beautiful you very much. technique. And, um, Actually, I'm I in Tampa. I'm in Tampa. 
Oh, you are in Sao Paulo. That's right. Yeah, yeah. So, very close. As well. <laughs> I am. I'm the same. We're on the same time. Uh, but I really much enjoyed your presentation. I, I, um, I guess I, I kind of wanted to reemphasize, uh, and I commend you for creating the model. Uh, I think every team that uh, does endoscopy and nasal surgery should seek and try and and uh, simulate, you know, like a carotid injury. Um, you very nicely stated all the steps that you have to go through, notify the team, maybe even heparinize the patient, you know, all this, all these steps that sometimes can be even counterintuitive. But once this happens, when the, when, if the, when the blood sort of fills the, the cavity of the nose, you know, you kind of sort of have a brain fog and having, you know, gone through the steps, it just is almost like a, you know, the, the airline pilots of going through like the, this chaotic situation and, it's it's sort of it's just so important to go through the steps you know beforehand before this happens so again congratulations very very nice as talk i really enjoyed it uh hopefully thank we'll catch much. up a little bit later <laughs> <laughs> thank you any other comment I, i'm really a bit uh jealous to both of you because last time <laughs> when i've been on, on tampa it was 15 years ago on skull base course with the oh, really? professor Rotor. And Van Lover and, and some years for those guys. Have a nice time in Tampa. Thank you both of you Thank for you very, much. A very nice lecture today. And I hope see you again on some maybe in, in, in uh, on live lectures. Thank you very much. Enjoy. Thank you very much. Uh, so the last, the last but not least speaker today is uh, from Bosnia Herzegovina. Or senior professor Skomorac, uh, former president of Bosnian Society, and I'm happy to have him here. And he will talk about the lecture of prevention of epidural fibros fibrosis after lumbar disc surgery. Technical note: Professor Skomorac, welcome. First of all, I'd like to to say hello to organizers and to, to give me a chance to, to present uh, this uh, presentation. And uh, it uh, really was a pleasure to, to hear a great presentation from our professors, uh, from the presenters. And uh, it was nice to see some dear friends and dear colleagues. Uh, today, I would like to talk about something uh, uh, different than than uh, in previous talks. Uh, it's uh, something that we, uh, all of us do a lot, most of us do a lot during the, our career. So it's uh, prevention of epidural fibrosis after lumbar disc, disc surgery. As you all know, failed back surgery syndrome was definitely defined by, by Norton Campbell in 1991 as persistent or, or recurring low back pain with or without sciatica following one or more lumbar spine operations. Few men colleagues consider uh, failure back surgery, surgery to be severe, long lasting, disabling, and relatively frequent, five to 10% complication of uh, lumbar sacral spine surgery. Uh, in 1979, Finesson and Cooper made the statement that no matter, no matter how severe or inter interactable the pain, it can always be, be made worse by surgery. You know, causes are multifactorial, of course. Uh, uh, studies indicate that only one to 2% actually uh, suffer from disc herniation and require surgery of all patients with acute back and leg pain. Uh, most of surgeries uh, involve laminectomy or disectomy and 50% are spinal fusions. fusions and successful surgeries ranged from 80 to 98%. Uh, success rate uh, actually drops during the time. Uh, in, uh, as you can see, uh, etiologically, as I said, it, was, it has various, various, various causes. You feel classification is according to the clinical presentation. So there is uh, failure surgery is no improvement. It's a uh, recurrence of the period of improvement, persistent low, low back pain. And, uh, and the Van Gorten and colleagues subdivided causes of, of 
maybe the surgery according to mechanism and diagnosis and surgical approach. And uh, epidural fibrosis come to uh, group for information. There can be uh, other uh, causes like mechanical, diagnostic, or surgical induced. Epidural fibrosis is one of the major causes of failure back surgery syndrome, and the incidence ranges from 10 to 75%. Exact pathogenesis, pathogenesis of epidural, epidural fibrosis is not well established. Uh, scar tissue that forms uh, the surgical side doesn't seem to correlate with the extensiveness of the surgical procedures. Regardless of the cause, the pathology involves collagenous fibers that encapsulate nerve tissues, resulting in a lateral spinal stenosis, which could impair arterial tissue perfusion, perfusion and the venous return. This anoxic phenomenon is one of, one of explanation for pain at rest. It's also been shown that there is no correlation between the amount of scar tissue and severity of symptoms. Postoperative fibrosis is usually associated with a distinctive pattern of pain, and pain-free intervals last weeks to several months, approximately six weeks to six months. Pain usually is set in grad gradually. Distribution is not confined to that of the initial <laughs> compromised nerve root, but extends to multiple level nerve roots. It is commonly described as burning sensation with occasional lacination. Epidural fibrosis causes ad causing adhesions may restrict nerve root mobility, leading to increased incidence of lateral herniated disc symptom with, uh, with increased tension, decreased blood flow, or additional trauma. Scar tissue is generally found in three components of the epidural space, those are ventral or lateral. Diagnostic uh, diagnosis MRI should be the first imaging procedure because many of the most common and important imaging findings in these patients are seen best on MRI. And MRI with gadolinium is considered the gold standard modality for consistent in diagnosing and enhancing the scar tissue and recurrent disc herniation or retain disc fragments. Enhancement remains constant regardless of the time since surgery. Uh, however, Kaskan and colleagues, like many others, have found no relationships between severity of epidural fibrosis and pain following surgery. Uh, prevention of uh, epidural fibrosis is always initiated by invasion of the epidural space by laminectomy or discectomy. Uh, it's attributed to main, three main factors, destruction of epidural fat, formation of epidural hematoma, and the migration of fibroblasts from the perivertebral muscles into laminectomy defect. Therefore, any available materials that can eliminate the aforementioned factors uh, and not impair tissue healing could reduce extent of epidural scaring and to limit the epidural adhesion effectively. Prevention of epidural fibrosis is important and then solve the problem in, sp in spine surgery. Prevention can be done in, in a perioperative, intraoperative, or postoperative period. There are methods of preventing epidural fibrosis development by creating barriers with use of, of autologous tissue like adipose, those of lumbar fascia, and yellow ligaments. The disadvantage of those uh, outer grafts is the biodegradation due to the atrophy of necrosis and often with the formation of seroma. So they didn't impede uh, the epidural fibrosis development. One of the measures of interoperative prevention of epidural fibrosis is the development of barriers in the form of natural or synthetic, synthetic polymer materials that impede the epidural fibrosis formation after laminectomy. In the past few decades, numerous reagents uh, and materials have been used to prevent or limit the formation of uh, epidural fibrosis in animal models and in human cases. Uh, prevention of or inhibition uh, of postoperative adhesions is a significant goal for surgeons undertaking successful lumbar discectomy. Uh, and preservation of natural barriers is the safest and most effective way to reduce extent of peridural fibrosis. Prevention of inhi or inhibition of the invasion of fibroblasts from the muscle layer is an important factor in reducing the extent of scar formation. Uh, minimally invasion uh, to the spinal canal is considered as, as the primary measure to reduce the epidural fibrosis. Although microsurgical techniques are in the pulmons uh, and bipolar coagulation are introduced, both of which reduce the incidence of tissue trauma, epidural fibrosis or after spinal surgery, surgery still occur. 
There is no ap absolutely effective technique that is currently available. Uh, uh, we believe that preservation of ligament of flower not only reduces the scar formation, but also helps the surgeon to locate uh, anatomical plane at a reoperation. And the concept of ligament aspiring is not, no, not new. Many uh, neurosurgeons uh, uh, previously published the, the techniques and we independently developed our own technique with a tiny of the ligament and the longitudinal slip with the minimal removal of the flower ligament. At the end of the surgery, we locally applied corticosteroid solution, fibrillar collagen, and to subcutaneous fat tissue without suction damage. We don't have uh, experience with the use of other measuring materials, firstly due to the price, but we are trying to, with meticulous technique, and autologous materials to reduce formation of epidural fibrosis and improve surgical outcome. Since it's too expensive to follow surgically treated patients with MRI in order to see extent of post-operative epidural fibrosis, we are glad to see that available studies show rational in our approach. Uh, let me address this. Uh, As you can see, first uh, we do uh, a bit of thinning of the uh, flower ligament with the sector and the uh, Harris Orange. We we don't see the video. You don't you don't see it? Okay. No. Uh, uh, new share, maybe. Okay. Okay now. Yes, now we see. Yeah. So as you can see, first we do the thinning, thinning of the uh, flavon ligament with the uh, with the dissector and with the with the, the carries on and uh, Then we do longitudinal uh, opening of the flower ligament with the dissector. And uh, then we, we can uh, approach to the dura and the uh, roof. But sometimes it's uh, possible uh, only, with, especially with the younger, younger patients, only with this maneuver to, to approach to, to and do the uh, complete surgery with this this scatomy. And sometimes you have to, to remove a small amount of uh, of uh, flower ligament. As you can see, it's uh, opening less than one and then uh, and less than uh, half of the centimeters. After in the, I will show it a bit faster now. So uh, after classical surgery that we do uh, uh, removal of micro dissector like uh, it like it is does by everyone else. You can see that we can uh, achieve uh, satisfactory microdisectomy and the compression of the uh, root and uh, uh, keep uh, at least some epidural fat around to, to minimize possibility for uh, scar formation and epidural fibrosis. And at, at, at the end of surgery, you can see that uh, every, uh, that root is completely uh, compressed.
and there is final situation. We don't we didn't have to to do any more uh, uh, widening of the opening of of uh, organization of the flower ligament. And uh, as I said, at the end of surgery, we put some corticosteroid solution and solution uh, and fibroblasts, and that that is that is it. Thank you very much. Uh, of course, thank you. Uh, is there any, thank you, Professor Skomorats. Is there any comment for this video? It was actually about the spine. Uh, yes. However, it's useful and uh, good to see. Any comment or question for Dr. Skomorats? So, thank you. Thank you, Professor Skumarat. Thank you, everybody. Uh, before we conclude the, today's session, I would like I would like to, to uh, invite you and the uh, uh, announce the next to the next uh, webinar, which will happen, which is scheduled for the June uh, 17, 2023, this year. So it will be fifth ASEAN Congress of Neurosurgery and Bosnia and Herzegovina Neurosurgical Society and Neighborhood webinar organized by the same team, the Professor Kato team in Japan, Tokyo, and our team in Bosnia, Sarajevo, and surrounding countries, Southeast Europe countries. So I would like all of you invite for the next webinar. Also, for some of you who want to eventually uh, look at, again, today's the lectures, you can see it on the uh, YouTube. And uh, once again, thank you, Professor Kato. Do you want to, to say some words at the end of today's a very nice uh, webinar, please? Uh, yes, thank you very much, your Hume, and uh, the, your entire team. Uh, I think uh, the quite a long uh, the webinars, but uh, we learned a lot, uh, especially the, such as uh, the new image and techniques, and uh, uh, so many uh, uh, high res resolution and also uh, the techniques. So I, I think uh, in, in future, so in Japan. We need more and more less invasive, such as endovascular or uh, endoscope, or maybe I, I think uh, uh, AI or some other techniques will uh, combine uh, for our future uh, medicine. So I, I think it, that means uh, that this uh, webinar uh, was very fruitful for especially the young doctors, uh, especially from the, the Balkan region. And maybe the next time, of course, uh, we can invite more, such as Africa or some other continent as well. Thank you very much, and all participants. Uh, Japan is almost 11 p.m., so time to go to bed. <laughs> so, but I think uh, all Japanese and also the uh, overseas uh, the, uh, speakers, yes, really, thank you very much for your support, especially the Dr. Ibrahim. Uh, thank you. Thank part you, part everybody. Thank you, all professors from Japan and Asia, also professors from other countries, United States, Germany, Italy, and others who enjoy with us today. I'm especially thankful to those people from Japan who are still uh, awake in the late uh, Saturday night. Uh, thank you for supporting our region and we learn from the Japanese neurosurgeons uh, and we are very happy to see the different environment, different techniques and standards and this encourage our guys in the region to, to be better. Uh, uh, Professor Kako, to all of you, if there is any comments at the end. No, this is fine, okay, thanks. Thank, thank you, thank from, you, from, have a nice. From, yes, the guy from Tampa, uh, enjoy. You stay in, in US. Yes, Thank you. Kenichi. Thank okay. you, everybody. Kenichi. Good night. Okay. Good night. Good night. Keep Good in night. touch, See please. Goodbye. Thank you. 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 Thank you